need for selenium web testing has become one of the most integral parts of many businesses. When there is a discussion about web testing tools, selenium is surely one of the best in the field to help developers with automation testing. Hello everyone and welcome to this session. You are currently watching an Edureka Selenium full course video. By the end of this video, you will have a thorough understanding about selenium from the theory to the practical applications that are required to master. Now, if you love watching videos like these, then subscribe to Edureka's YouTube channel and click the bell button to never miss out any updates from us. Also, if you want to learn more about selenium after watching this session and wish to obtain Edureka's selenium certification course, then please see the link in the description below. Now, let's begin with our agenda where we'll have a brief overview of what we will cover in this Selenium full course video. We will start with the Selenium fundamentals, where we will cover the very basics that you must and should know about Selenium. Then, we will move ahead and understand why should we learn Selenium. After which, we will see some Selenium core concepts like Web Element, Locators, Selector, XPath, Weights, Alerts, and Listeners. Now it's time to delve deep into the technical concepts of Selenium. We will start with the cross-browser testing using Selenium WebDriver. Next, we will learn page object model in Selenium WebDriver. After this, we will get our hands dirty with some Selenium projects. Once this is done, we will then compare Selenium with other testing tools. Well, we hope that this session assists you in getting jobs in the industry. In order to accomplish this, we will look at how to start a career in automation testing. At last, we will also cover some of the best practices in Selenium before heading over to the Selenium interview questions and answers. So stick till the end. Now it's time to get started with our first topic that is Selenium Fundamentals. What do you think is the history behind it? What do you think are the major reasons that affected the growth of Selenium? Let's have a look guys. So this Selenium was originally developed by Jason Huggins in the year 2004 as an internal tool while he was working at ThoughtWorks. So Huggins later joined the programmers or the testers at ThoughtWorks and tried to develop Selenium RC. So this tool was developed in the year 2004 by uh, two developers, namely Jason Huggins and Paul Hammond. So it was open sourced in the same year, guys. So Selenium RC was the first one to be found among the web driver, Grid and Selenium ID. In 2005, Dan Fabulich and Nelson Sproul made an offer to accept the series of patches that would transform Selenium RC into what it is known for today. So in these days, we call it a Selenium web driver, right? So Dan Fabulish and Nelson Sproul are the major reason for giving us the idea about how RC works. Now, correspondingly in the year 2007, Huggins joined Google and also he helped in developing the stabilization process of RC. And at the same time, Simon Stewart at ThoughtWorks developed a superior browser automation tool called the web driver. Okay, so this is the tool which we currently use and also the current version of Selenium that we're using is 3. But recently in 2009, September or October, I think they had a meeting or a conference related to the version release and they actually kind of spoke about the new version that is Selenium 4. I don't think it is releasing anytime soon, but yeah, they gave us a hint of that. So yeah, we'll be looking forward to work on Selenium 4 as well. So the current version in the market is Selenium 3. Also in the year 2009, there was a conference that is a test automation conference where people tried to merge two products that is Selenium RC and Selenium WebDriver to call it as a new project called Selenium 2.0. So this is the second version which was used between 2005 to 2010, I believe. Don't remember the exact time span. But yeah, Selenium 2 was released by then. And in 2008, Selenium Grid was developed by Pat Lightbody. So this was about the history behind the growth of Selenium. As you can see that uh, the growth began in 2004 itself, but to be officially released and to be officially available to people, 
by the name selenium web driver it took close to five to six years right so this is exactly how selenium came into the mainframe now moving ahead let's take a look at what exactly is selenium like i mentioned selenium is an open source tool which is used for automating the tests that are carried out on the web browsers also it can be reframed in this way it is an open source portable framework for automating applications that is mainly web based applications and it can be tested across different browsers namely chrome firefox safari and just not the traditional ones it, the tests can also be carried out in different OS platforms that is Windows, Mac and Linux. And the Selenium test scripts can be integrated with the tools such as TestNG, JUnit and so on for managing test cases and generating reports. It can also be integrated with Maven, Jenkins and Docker to achieve continuous testing. So why exactly software testing or automation testing is required? Today's world of technology is completely dominated by machines and their behavior is controlled by the software empowering it. Will the machines behave exactly as we want them to? The answer to this is what we call software testing or automation testing. At the end of the day, it is the application success rate which is going to control your business growth. The same thing can be said even for web applications because most of our businesses today are completely dominated on the internet or it completely belongs to the internet. So this is exactly what is Selenium. Now moving on, let's take a look at why exactly Selenium is required. Why not any other tool? So some major uses I would say or benefits of using Selenium is it is easy to automate testing across web applications. Suppose you're working on or testing any of the software application that is web based application I say and you find a bug and you don't know how to resolve it until and unless you've come across Selenium. So Selenium is one such tool which acts like a key to our success rate. So automating testing across web applications is like a really tedious task which can be fulfilled by using Selenium. And also it has a wide variety of language support. If you're comfortable using C, C++ or C Sharp, these are considered as a basic languages, right? Okay, not C Sharp, but still C, C++, Java, Python. Right. So these four languages are like the basic languages which can be supported by any of the software. So apart from these four standard languages, Selenium also proudly supports Ruby, C Sharp, Spark, Perl and many more. All right. Now talking about implementing the test cases, like I mentioned, automating the testing cases across different web applications or browser is not an easy task. But by using Selenium, you can implement those test cases very easily. And also you can perform or write the test scripts on different platforms like Mac, Windows, Linux and so on. Also, one major reason why you should go for Selenium is it is easy to understand and is open source. Open source as in you don't have to pay for this version. It is not a paid version easy to understand as in it is explained in simple terms where any normal human being can understand. Now this was about why we need Selenium. Now moving on let's understand what are the major features of Selenium. So I think you guys have understood what exactly Selenium is and how it supports testing across different platforms right. So these are also considered as features but apart from that we'll talk about some notable information related to Selenium. So Selenium can be considered as a leading cloud based testing platform which helps testers to record their actions and export them as a reusable script and easy to use interface. And like you already know that it supports operating systems, browsers and different programming languages, right? Also, apart from this, it also supports parallel test execution which reduces time and increases the efficiency of the test cases. Also, Selenium requires fewer resources as compared to other automation testing tools. You don't have to have a different plugin for each and every uh, test cases that you were working on, right? Apart from this, we also have something called the Selenium commands, which are categorized in terms of different classes, which makes it easier to understand and implement. Also, Selenium web driver does not require the server installation as the test scripts interact directly with the browser. Also, so these were some notable features of Selenium. Now moving on, let's understand the components. 
So we have namely four components guys. We have something called Selenium IDE, Selenium RC, Selenium Web Driver and Selenium Grid. Now let's understand them in detail. So talking about Selenium IDE, Selenium IDE or Integrated Development Environment is primarily a record run tool that a test case developer uses to develop Selenium test cases. Selenium IDE is a simple record and playback kind of tool which comes as an add-on for Firefox only. But now I think it is also used for a Chrome driver as well. It is used for prototype testing and the test cases written in IDE can be exported in many programming languages like Ruby, Java, C Sharp, Python and so on. Edit and debug options along with the record are also available in the IDE. Also guys, this is an excellent tool for beginners to understand the syntax of a Selenium web driver. It is also considered as a simplest framework in the Selenium suite and is the easiest to learn guys. It is like I mentioned a Firefox plugin and you can easily install it on your system. This is exactly why a Selenium IDE was used. Now talking about Selenium RC. Selenium RC or Selenium Remote Control was the first tool of the Selenium suite. Earlier it was known as the JavaScript executor and RC was a tool which made Selenium famous in the market. All the credits to Selenium being a masterpiece or Selenium being very famous around the globe is because of Selenium RC. It was the first tool that provided the support for multiple programming languages. Also this supported almost all major vendors of browsers like Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer and so on. So the first version was called Selenium 1 followed by which we have Selenium 2, 3 and now I think we're expecting 4 as well in the market. Also using RC you can perform cross browser testing. All right, so this was about Selenium RC. Now moving ahead, let's understand what exactly is Selenium web driver. Okay, so talking about Selenium web drivers, Selenium web driver was the first cross platform testing framework that could control the browser from the OS level. In contrast to IDE, Selenium web driver provides a programming interface to create and execute test cases. So these test cases can be written in such a way that the web elements on the web page can be identified and then perform actions on those elements. Also Selenium web driver is an upgrade to RC because it is much faster and it is faster because it makes direct calls to the browser and it does not need a server between the client and the server. RC on the other hand needs a RC server to interact with the web browser. So each browser has its own driver on which the application runs. So different kinds of web drivers are Firefox driver which is popularly called as Geeko driver, Chrome driver, Internet Explorer driver, HTM, unit driver, Safari driver and so on. Also this supports uh, programming languages like Java, C Sharp, PHP, Perl, Ruby, .NET and so on. Also it supports testing across different platforms like Firefox, Chrome and so on. Also cross browsing was introduced in this version. Also guys Selenium RC and Selenium web driver together was combined to make it called as Selenium 2. So like I mentioned this I just wanted to remind you guys of it again. Now talking about Selenium grid. So what exactly is Selenium grid? Selenium grid was developed by Patrick Lightbody and initially called it Post-it QA which is a part of the version 1 of Selenium. And also it was used in the combination with RC to run test cases on remote machines. In fact, with Grid, multiple test scripts can be executed at the same time on different machines. Parallel execution can be achieved easily with the help of a hub node architecture and one machine will assume the role of hub and whereas the others will be the nodes. Okay, so this is still in use guys. Grid is used by most of the companies as well and it works both with Selenium WebDriver and RC. However, Maintaining a grid with all required browsers and operating system is a tedious task. For this, there are multiple online platforms that provide an online Selenium grid access to run your Selenium automation script. So this is about the suite of tools or the Selenium components. Now moving ahead with this session, let's take a look at a simple demo. So in order to work with the practical part of this session, the first thing you should do is check for the latest version of Java in your system. So I'm going to go to command prompt. 
and I'm going to type Java hyphen version. I think most of my videos have this command written to check if Java is running properly in the system or not. So after this is done, I'm going to open Eclipse. So in this session, we are going to be automating a web page called Facebook. I think most of you are very familiar with it. So let's see. This is going to be a very basic demo guys. So you can hop on to our playlist which is put up and you can check for demos or videos which has demos in it. Okay, I'm going to close a lot of things over here. Okay, I'm going to create a new project. Go to new. Java project. And I'm going to name Selenium. All right, finish. Okay, so these are the Java libraries which has been added. And uh, if you want to add the Selenium jar files into the system, just right click on this folder which you've created and go to build path and configure build path. So I'm going to add external library. Okay, not this. Yep. So control A, open and Go back, open, and go back. And uh, you need to add the Selenium standalone server. So I'm going to add it and close. You can see another folder which has been created over here. It has all the jar files. It has all the Selenium jar files which I added. I've already created a class, guys. This is a class that we'll be dealing with. I think this would be of good help for you. I'm setting the system property to webdriver.chrome.driver. This means that I'm selecting Chrome driver as my browser driver and I'm going to be giving my path to it as well. Followed by which the extension is Chrome driver dot exe that is the executable file. After this I'm instantiating the web driver instance that is driver and I'm going to be instantiating with the new Chrome driver. So it is going to create an instance of the Chrome driver. After this I'm going to be getting the URL of the web page which I want to work on or test so I'll be using Facebook in this case. So driver dot get specify the URL in the form of string. And after that, I'm going to be maximizing the screen. So consider using this command, which says driver dot manage dot windows dot maximize. So this helps in maximizing the current window that you're working on. After that, I'm going to be creating a web element called day D. Okay, so you can change it if I want to change it as day one. Okay, you have to change it over here as well. I'm going to be creating a web element. It will show an error saying all the packages are not included. So include the packages or import the packages and create a web element called day one. You can give it any other name that you want. And I'm going to be finding this element by ID. Let's go to Facebook. Yeah, over here, I'm going to be inspecting this. Okay. So you can see select class name is given ID is given. So I'm going to be considering ID because ID is easier to locate. So Selenium makes use of these locators which are called ID name class name CSS selectors link text and so on. So there are close to six to seven locators which are used and also we are making use of these to locate any elements on the web page. So Go back to the project and find the element by ID. You can see that the day is present. Now I'm going to be selecting O class. This is the object I'm going to be creating of the select class and I'm going to instantiate it with the day one. After you do that, I'm going to pause this execution for three seconds. That is 3000 milliseconds and followed by which I'm going to give the index value as six. So here you can see that the value six is given. Okay, which selects the bird day as six followed by which the next one would be for month. I'm going to create a web element called month. I'm going to change it as months and here also I'm going to change it as months. All right. So the same manner we are supposed to find the element by uh, corresponding element locators. I'm going to be instantiating them uh, with the new month which I give here with the new object. After that pause the execution and I'm going to be selecting the location by the help of this variable which is select by visible text. So the visible text for this would be you can see that it is July or J U L will be displayed followed by which the same follows for the year as well. So let's have a look guys. So if we want to change any of the month or I'm going to give this as 30 and here I'm going to say September 
and the year would be 2024. So I'm going to save it and I'm going to run this. You can see that it is mentioned here the Chrome is controlled by automated test software that is Selenium. Now it will maximize the screen. And now it checks for the birthday. First it selects 30 and then it goes to September that is SEP. Okay, it did not happen. So let's see why it is. Okay, it says a uh, documentation error cannot locate the element September. Okay, let's go back to our page. Okay, so I made a mistake guys. It is SEPT. So I should be mentioning SEPT over here and I'm going to run it again. Opens Facebook.com. And it selects or searches for birthday selects 30 and for the month it selects the September and for the year it selects 2024. I think it's not there on the list which is present over there. So let's see. Okay. Yeah, 2024 was not visible guys. Let's see what all are visible and let's select accordingly. Yeah, you can see that the year option is available only till 2020. So I'm going to be selecting 1977. Okay. All right. So let's run this again. Zoomed in and now changes the date month and the year. All right. Okay. It's done guys. So this is exactly how Selenium works. So this was an example or a basic example for locating elements using Selenium web driver. So now that you've understood each and every concept that has been discussed in this video, you can take a look at the playlist on uh, YouTube guys. Uh, there's a lot of things that you need to learn about Selenium. Like this was just a basic concept or a basic understanding of how Selenium works. So here we will be installing the latest version of Java. So here you must keep in mind that the Java version must be 8 or above. After that, we will be installing the Java from the official website that is Oracle. Once after the installation, we will also configure Java by setting the path in the system. After that, we will check whether the Java is installed successfully or not. Now let's do the demo. So install Java. We must go to a official website of Oracle. So here as you can see we have Java downloads Oracle. So just click on that and you can see here Java 18 and Java 17 are available now. So we have to download the software according to our operating system. So I am using Windows. So let me go to Windows here. So I'll install here the 64 installer. So let me click on this. One of our folk has asked me a question. Let's see. Okay, Kitty have asked me that whether we can install other sizes too. Yes, according to your system's compatibility, you can install whichever the feasible size is. So you can install 84 installer too. I hope you understood Kitty. Once it get downloads, just click on the executable file and it asks you for the setup procedure. Now here it is asking for the installation process. So let's click on next. And this is the path where the Java JDK is installed. So until and unless if you have a good reason to change it, then you can change it or else I'll suggest you to keep as a default folder. So let's click on next. As you can see here, the Java is successfully installed. Let's close this window. Now let us configure this Java. Now let's go to the file explorer. Let us find where the Java is installed. So go to C folder, program files. And you can see here the Java folder. So double click on that. You can see the version. 18.0.2 have been installed. So that is the latest and stable version that is available today. Now double click on this too. So you will find the bin folder here. So this is the main folder. So double click on this too. 
you can see many files has been installed here so let us copy the path from this folder so copy this path now go to settings find for environment variables so you can see here edit the system environment variables okay let's click on this as you can see here we have the environment variables so click on that you have the system variables so you have to change the path over here so it will be edited in the whole system now you can see the path over here so just click on that and add a new and paste the copied path over here now just click on ok ok now let's check whether java is installed properly or not so let's go to comment prompt now let's type java space hyphen version to check which version has been installed yeah you can see here 18.0.2 has been installed now let's check for java c so you can see here the java has been installed successfully we have all the java packages here so now we have successfully installed java now let's install the second prerequisite that is eclipse editor here as you can see first we have to install or download the eclipse from the official website after that we will get a zip file that has been installed after that we have to extract from the zipper file then we will be running the application now let's see the demo now for eclipse download we have to go to a official website that is www.eclipse.org now let's click on this link you can see the Eclipse IDE 2022. So I'll download this. This is the last button download. This might take you a few minutes. So once this executable file is downloaded, just click on this. Okay, now you can see here the Eclipse installer has been installed, and this will give you some of the options to click on. So if you want to work on the Java codes or you want to become a Java developer and work on some codes, then you can click on this or you have many other options. You can use C, C++ or it will be feasible for PHP too. So in this session, I will be using the Java developers. So I'll click on this to install. I'll click on install. So let's wait till it gets installed. So in between installation, it might also ask you for the agreement. So you can also agree the policies and make sure you have checked all these buttons also. So it is very important. So to create a shortcut in your desktop. So you, if you want to create a shortcut in your desktop, then you can click on this or you can uncheck this. Okay, as you can see the installation completed successfully. Let's launch this. Now it is asking you for the workspace. Now if you want to keep the default then you can keep it until and unless you have a good reason to change it. So in my case I will keep it as it is. I will launch it. So as you can see here the editor has been opened. So if you want to create a new Java project you can click on a create new Java project and you can fill the name the project name and you can create some packages classes etc and that will be shown in this session too so don't worry stay tuned so now we have successfully installed both of the prerequisite that is java and eclipse now the main concept is selenium web driver come let's see how to install that the first and the main thing you have to see is the latest stable version so at this point of time we have the stable version has 4.3.0 so you can see the latest version whenever you install and the next thing you have to see is the browser driver 
if you are working on selenium you have to have a browser drivers to execute some of the code or the selenium scripts so that you need some of the browser drivers and finally we will also see the configuration of the selenium on our eclipse so let's see the demo so go to browser and type selenium org and you will get a selenium's official website so click on the selenium and you can see the home page of selenium and click on downloads you can see here the latest stable version is 4.3.0 so just click on this so this is a jar file that will be downloaded the next thing that we have to download is the java client and if you scroll down you will get the java client over here that is also the version 4.3.0 just click on that too now after downloading these both now go to file explorer go to downloads and i am creating a folder in c drive called as selenium web driver and now i will move this both jar file as well as the java client over here now as you can see here the java client is a zipped file so let's unzip this and extract all the files over here as you can see we have downloaded the selenium server jar file as well as the java client too now java client is a zipper file so now i have extracted also now what will i do is i'll go to c folder now i have created a selenium web driver folder inside the c folder now i will copy both of the files over here so let's copy this and i will go to c folder now you can see here i have created a selenium web driver folder so i'll paste it over here now copy the jar file too okay now once we have installed both the files over here now let's go and install the browser driver too as i am using chrome here as a browser so i will install a chrome driver so let's write chrome driver so click on the first link here to check which version are you using just go to this menu click on help and google chrome and you can see the version over here that is 103.0.5060 we have to install the same chrome driver version so that is the reason we checked now now let's go to the official website and let's click on this version and the latest stable version over here is this so let's click on this version or click on the version which you need minus windows and if your operating system is under linux or mac then you can install according to it so i'll install the win as i said you the chrome driver is a zip file so let's extract this over here and copy the extracted file and go to the folder where our selenium files are located so let's create a folder over here called chrome driver now paste this chrome files inside this folder okay now all set now this is how we install the selenium web driver now let's see the demo with a small example so now let us go to our eclipse and start coding with the small example okay now let's start a new java project so click on create new java project so let's write a project name has selenium demo 1 so here just make sure the java sc is minimum of 1.8 so let's finish so we have created a java project name now let's create a package over here right click on this click on new and you can see here the package over here right so click on that let's write package name as edureka you can write whichever name you wish to 
now has we created the package here let's create a class over here so i'll click on new here class so i will give the class name as selenium script and don't forget to click this public static void main because it is very important yeah and you can see here the package name is edureka and the class name is selenium script and the public static void main and now let's start writing the code now we want the chrome driver to be installed over here and yeah before that we just include the selenium files over here so just right click over here and you can see the build path over here right just click on this and configure build path and you can see the library over here just click on that and add external jar files because we have not added the selenium jar files till now so let's click on this the jar file and open then apply and close it now we have included the referenced libraries over here now let's start writing the code so first we want the selenium drivers to be included so let's write system dot set property you can see here set properties just write set property inside the quotes just write web driver dot chrome dot driver and after this just give a comma and include the chrome driver path over here so for that let's go to the file explorer and go to the selenium web driver folder and you can see the chrome driver folder here just double click on this and you can see the files over here just copy the path and go to the editor again and paste it over here and please don't forget to write this chrome driver dot exe let's close this now just write web driver space driver which is equals to new chrome drive close this too and as you can see we have an error over here just hover on the chrome driver and you will get a quick fixes over here just import the chrome driver and do the same for the web driver too and import the web driver now we expect the output to be shown as a website so i will give www.edureka.co as a output website now i want to get a edureka.co as a output website so that just write driver dot get and write the website whichever you want to be executed i will give the edureka link over here and next i have to print the title whichever comes over the tab so i will just print the title over here for that system dot out dot print ln driver dot get title just close this too for automatically quitting of the browser we just write the driver to quit just driver dot quit and let's run this and see just run select the folder to be saved as you can see the edureka page has been opened here you can see the courses over here too and the browser got exited automatically and also you can see the title over here that just got printed from the tab so this is the final output that we just got now i will just take out this code and just run as you can see here i just took out the code from that script and the browser will stay for long time and until and unless you close that window the browser does not close 
so that is why i took out the code over there and you see here the website is staying for a long time that is the reason and you can see the title again printed over here So now that the prerequisites have all been installed and Selenium has been configured for Eclipse IDE, how about we automate and test Gmail using Google Chrome? Well, okay. So this is the test script for it. Let me anyways go and write it down so that we can run out first test script. What will we do? We'll go ahead and first create a package just like Java goes. So let's say selenium demo, right? So let's click on finish. Go ahead and create a class. Let's say I'll name my class demo as well. And I'll make sure there's a main method in it and click on finish. So here we have our class. Let's go ahead and write the test case. So while I write the code, I'll also be walking you through it. So don't you worry if you don't understand something, we'll all be covering that. So now we have our Java files here and our jar files for Selenium here. But what about the drivers that we added? So these drivers are really important things. They are the ones that can instantiate your browser, which means drivers are necessary if you want to automate your web browsers. So we'll have to type in a command so that our drivers are connected to our program. So the command for it is set property under which we'll have to tell the command about what driver we are talking about first. So we're talking about the web driver that is of Google Chrome. Okay. So once I've done that, let me also go ahead and tell the command where to find it. So I'll have to go and find my Google Chrome driver, which is Chrome driver. Copy the location for it. So this is the location of the folder that it is in, but we need the location of the file. So we'll be adding that. So now that we've done that, let us add the name of the file as well, which is Chrome driver. And what is the type of file it is? It is an exe file. So that's it. We've gone ahead and we have successfully connected the driver to our programs. So let us go ahead and create a reference variable for the interface web driver. So I'll name my reference variable driver and assign it an object of the class Chrome driver. Now these interfaces and classes have been provided to us by the Selenium jar files that we added we just have to import it to our program so i use a constructor to initialize the reference variable with an object so now you can see an error here that's because we have not imported our interface and our classes so if you hover your mouse over it you can see an option to import the interface first and then let's go and import the class as well we've imported the class as well now so now let's use our driver to call some methods that will that let's say open a website for me first so what website do we want to open we want to open gmail so i'll have to type in that dot gmail.com right so that is our web page now once it has opened the web page for me i'll ask it to maximize the window that i'm viewing my browser in we can do that by the commands driver dot manage dot window dot maximize okay so let's use our driver and find a web element. Now, what is a web element? Well, any component, anything on a web page is a web element, okay? So in this case, let's say this is the placeholder where I will want my email ID to be. So this is my web element. So let me inspect it. So once I've done that, I can see this web element to have a few attributes here. So that is how we're going to find that web element and send some text to it, which is in my case, my email ID. So find element once you've done that we'll also have to tell it how to find the element. So we'll be using the ID name to find the element which is identifier ID. So let's say by ID we'll have to tell it the name of the ID as well. And we just saw the name of the ID to be identifier and ID right. Okay. So once we've done that we'll also have to tell it what to do once it finds the web element for us it will send some text to it which can be done by the command send keys so what keys do we want to send it i want to send an email id let's say right i've sent an email id to it now once i've entered my email id i will like to click on the next button let's go and inspect it all right so 
I can see the class name to be CWAK9. So let me go ahead and find the element by the class name. And the command would be by dot class name. And we'll have to give it the class name as well, which in our case was CWAK9, right? Let's put that into. Now we've done that. So what does it do once it finds it? It'll click on the button, right? So let's tell it to click. We've done that. So all of this should happen automatically. That's the entire purpose of writing the script. So now that I've gone ahead and I have automated some of my browser features, how about I also build a small test case? So let's say I declare a variable of the string type and I name it AT for my reference to actual title and ask my driver to get me the title of the web page that it automatically opened. So get title. So what should our title be actually? I mean, since we are opening Gmail, the title should be Gmail, right? So let me go ahead and create another string variable, name it ET for expected title, and we're expecting it to be Gmail, right? So let me also go ahead and close the browser that I've opened with the driver.close command. Now, after that, let me go ahead and use the string variables to establish a test condition. So that can be done best with the if statement. So let's say at dot equals. I want to ignore cases. I just want the names to be same. So I'll tell it to ignore cases. And so if this happens, if they match, we'll know that our test is successful. So we'll print the same test successful and if that does not happen we'd know that something went wrong and our test was unsuccessful so let's print out the same print ln and what do we write we wanted to display test failure right so we've successfully built a test case so let me go ahead and execute it so my browser opened automatically it also navigated to Gmail, entered my ID and closed the window. But it happened really fast, so you people must not have seen everything. But it says test successful, which means our titles also match. But I would still like to slow the automation down so that you people can actually see everything that happened. So that is also possible. We can do it by thread dot sleep. Let's say I'll ask it to sleep for 2000 milliseconds. Similarly, I'll have one more sleep command after we have clicked on the next button so this is not necessary i mean normally testing would require you to do it really fast so that in a matter of second maybe a thousand cases can be done or more but i'm doing this so that you people can see everything that happened okay thread requires us to throw an exception so we did that let me now go ahead and run it okay so my browser is open and i have gmail and my ID typed in with the screen got maximized. I'm in the window and that's it. We also closed the browser and it says test was successful. So congratulations, we just ran our first Selenium test case. Let us go back to the slide. So this was the code that we just ran and our test was a success. Now, before I tell you who is a software test automation engineer, let us first know what is software testing. So software testing is basically a process of evaluating the functionality of a software application to find any software bugs. So it checks whether the developed software met these specified requirements and identifies any defect in the software in order to produce a quality product. It is also stated as the process of verifying and validating a software product. So it checks whether the software product meets the business and technical requirements that guided its design and development. It works as per the requirement and can be implemented with the same characteristics. So now that you know what is software testing, let's see who is a testing automation engineer. So the role of the test automation engineer is to design, build, test and deploy effective test automation solutions. Now to fulfill this role, the automation engineer applies appropriate automation technologies to meet the short and long term goals of the testing organization. 
So now what does automation engineer actually do? An automation engineer basically utilizes technology to improve, streamline and automate a manufacturing process. They are responsible for planning, implementation and monitoring of such technology. So now let's move ahead and have a look at the roadmap that will lead you to become a successful test automation engineer. So first of all, in order to become an automation engineer, you need to have a bachelor's degree. You will likely need to earn a bachelor's of engineering degree related to the field in which you want to work. For example, if you want to become a software testing engineer, you will need a bachelor's degree in software engineering. Now to work in this field, you must be comfortable working closely with other professionals. You also need mathematics and science and also a little bit of computers and electronics. Now next up, we will need to know about the basic principles of software testing such as finding the presence of any sort of defects, how to determine the risk without exhaustive testing, early testing, defect clustering and how to make a product fulfill business requirements without any error. Now, if you are new to the testing industry, one needs to have knowledge of programming languages such as C, C++, Java, SQL, Python, HTML. Now, along with this, if you also have a master's degree in computer science, machine learning, statistics or any such certifications related to automation testing, it is just an added advantage. Now some of the best certifications for a test automation engineer are CAST that is the Certified Associate in Software Testing, CSTE that is the Certified Software Test Engineer and there are many more such certifications. So now let's move ahead and have a look at the job roles for a test automation engineer. Now some of the most common job profiles include test automation, performance tester, test analyst and QA engineer. So let's have a look at some of the statistics provided by LinkedIn on these top profiles. So here you can see the graph for the top companies in test automation and some of the big names are Accenture, Cognizant, IBM, TCS and Infosys. Now the top skills that are required to become a test automation engineer include the knowledge of testing, agile methodologies, SQL, test planning and also you need to be well acquainted with manual testing. Now apart from these, you need to be well acquainted with programming languages like Python, Golang and JavaScript. You also need to be well versed with AWS, microservices, Docker and Selenium. Now these skills will basically help you move to a higher position as a test automation engineer and also add up to your appraisal. Okay now talking about appraisals and hike, Edureka has released a small video just a few hours back on hike and appraisal during this season of the year which is essentially the appraisal season. So do check out our latest video named Apna Hike Aiga. I'll leave the link in the live chat and also in the description box. Hope you guys will enjoy it. Now moving on, next up is the performance tester profile. So some of the top companies for this job role are IBM, Accenture, TCS, Cognizant and Capgemini. Now some of the top industries for performance tester are the IT services, computer software, telecommunications, financial services as well as banking. Now United States is considered to be the best preferred location for a performance tester followed by India, UK, Canada and Australia. Now some of the must have skills to become a performance tester include the knowledge of Selenium, Cucumber, Java API, Apium, Jira, Python and also you must be profound with automation tools. So next we will talk about the test analyst job profile. Now for this particular role, Bangalore is one of the top most preferred locations after US, UK and Australia. And similarly companies like Accenture, Cognizant TCS are one of the top recruiters. 
Now talking about some of these skills, you must be well versed with SQL, Jira, UAT, TDD, Confluence and some of the scripting languages like Python, JavaScript. Also you would need some of the automation tools. So now that you know about the different job profiles, let's have a look at the roles and responsibilities of a testing automation engineer. Now in case of software testing, every company defines its own level of hierarchy, roles and responsibilities. But on a broader level, if you take a look, you'll always find two levels in a software testing team. The first one is the test lead or manager. Now a test lead is responsible for defining the testing activities for subordinates, testers or test engineers all responsibilities of test planning to check if the team has all the necessary resources to execute the testing activities to check if testing is going hand in hand with the software development in all phases and also prepare the status report of testing activities he is also responsible for required interactions with customers and updating project manager regularly about the progress of testing activities Next up we have the test engineers or the QA testers. Now they are responsible to read all the documents and understand what needs to be tested. Now based on the information procured in the above step decide how it is to be tested and inform the test lead about what all resources will be required for software testing then develop test cases and prioritize testing activities. Then we finally execute all the test case and report defects, define severity and priority for each defect and carry out regression testing every time when changes are made to the code to fix defects. Now how a software application shapes up during the development process entirely depends on how the software engineering team organizes work and implements various methodologies. Now test automation engineers can save you from the world full of codes. Enterprises completely agree with this statement and this is the reason why you see a lot of job opportunities in automation testing industry. So here I am going to explain in detail the 7 most important steps to becoming a test automation engineer. It will also help you if you are planning to switch your career to automated testing. Now the first one is manual testing. Now while I understand that companies are moving towards codeless automated testing tools to reach an expert level and to keep up with the competition of automation test engineers in the industry, it is highly important to focus on manual testing concepts initially. Now manual testing is basically a process of finding out the defects or bugs in a software program. In this method, the tester plays an important role of end user and verifies that all the features of the application are working correctly. Now this makes a point very clear that automation testing is for experienced manual testers. The next skill is the programming skills. Now it is very important to possess excellent technical programming skills. Now most newcomers ask that if they need programming skills for automated testing. Now most of the people who come up with the idea of shifting to automated testing wish to skip the coding part. Either they don't have programming knowledge or they hate coding. However, that one needs to be very proficient with manual testing skills to become a great automation testing engineer for a long lasting career in the software testing industry. And if you are new to the testing industry, you need the following programming languages such as C, C++, Java, SQL, Python, Perl, XML, HTML and CSS. Now there are also a few technical skills a manual tester should master to become a brilliant automation testing engineer such as the test architecture, test design, performance testing, configuration management, manual testing agility and interaction, communication between the teams, troubleshooting, agile devops and continuous de delivery. Now the combination of all the above mentioned skills can help you transit to automated testing easily and smoothly. Now next up is understand the application. Now the common application details that every automation tester needs to take care of are which programming languages have been used while developing the application, on what platform is the application built, which databases are involved, are there any web services or APIs connected to different parts of the system and how and many more such questions. 
Now these are just few points and it may vary based on the complexity of the applications. So make sure you are completely thorough with the application that you are going to test via automation testing. Now next up we have the automation testing tools. Now when learning to become a smart automation testing engineer, if we don't talk about the test automation tools, then we are doing an injustice to the industry. A major part of the companies have already started using automation testing tools. Now the main reason behind using them is their benefits to the enterprises. Some of the famous testing tools are Selenium, Testing Wiz, Ranorex, Sahi, Water and Test Complete. Now next up is the ATLC methodology. Now ATLC stands for Automation Testing Lifecycle. Now the way we follow the life cycle of software development and testing, same is the way for automation testing as well. To understand and follow the ATLC, one needs to have experience of the following such as the decision making in automated testing, then the test automation tools, automation testing process, then test planning, design and development, test script execution and management and finally review and assessment of test programs. Now for each test automation requirements, a test automation engineer follows the life cycle and to be a successful automation test engineer, you need to understand the ATLC methodology and execute it in your each test automation project. Now moving on, the next one is the test automation strategy. So once you are through with the ATLC methodology and the automated testing tools, you are well prepared to create your test automation strategy for your clients or employer. Now to become a great automation test engineer, you would be the right person to initiate with preparing the test automation strategy, finalizing the tools, overall cost and ROI calculation. Now automation strategy creation is considered to be a very crucial part as you would need to define and develop the path that will help you to reduce the manual testing hours and offer justice on the ROI of the clients. Now let's move on to the final skill which is the testing trends. Now for this you have to stay updated with the testing strengths and this is the most important part of this industry. The most trending best practices, tools, techniques, tips and tricks will help you and your team to achieve the success in optimizing your test automation strategies and methodology. Now this generation is moving towards automation everywhere. However, there has been a lot of debate around test automation tools replacing the manual testers. But remember, the creators of test automation tools are the testers like you. So, to become a smart automation testing engineer and to be successful in this industry, you would need to really work hard with passion and dedication. So, once you have mastered these skill skills, you are now on your way to become a successful software test automation engineer. Now, let's see some of the topmost companies that are hiring for a test automation engineer. Now these companies are Accenture, IBM, Cognizant, Infosys, TCS and Capgemini. So do keep an eye for an opportunity and utilize your skills to grab the offer. So that was all about today's session and I hope this will help you in the long run to prepare yourself and get well versed with all the skills in order to become a successful test automation engineer. Now if you want to learn more about software testing, Edureka is launching a new master's program on software testing that will include courses like Fundamentals of Software Testing, Selenium, Continuous testing using DevOps, mobile automation testing using Epium and performance testing using JMeter. The number one reason why you should learn Selenium is because Selenium is an open source tool which means anybody can use it for free. It is powered by Apache which means any organization can use Selenium to test their website or even independent programmers can implement and practice Selenium without having to pay for it. Most of all, remember that Selenium is backed by Google which has a huge developer community. The problem with other testing tools are that they are either licensed tools or their functionality is just not as good as Selenium. HP is QTP, IBM's RFT, TestComplete, RanRx are all proprietary tools. And feature-wise, Selenium is a clear winner. 
no second thoughts the second reason why you should learn selenium is because there are no operating system or browser or hardware demands you don't need a system with 16 gb ram or a system with a lot of free hard disk space neither do you need to house a windows operating system or a mac operating system or a linux operating system the operating system you use for home purpose is good enough for testing with selenium the problem however with other tools is that majority of them run only on windows operating system with selenium you can also test your website or even web application on any browser be it chrome or firefox or safari or internet explorer or even opera for that matter of fact the simplicity needed to work with selenium can be related to how easy it is to plug in usb drives into your system for transferring data this is the next reason why you should launch selenium and this must be the single most important factor for any programmer to get into the automation testing domain most tools in the market need you to be specialized in the particular programming language languages such as vb script java c sharp are among the most common scripting languages required by various tools but with selenium you will not face any such restrictions even if you are familiar with one of the programming languages such as java or python or perl or php or ruby c sharp or dot net then you can start your selenium career right away the next reason why you should learn selenium is because of the availability of frameworks frameworks are very similar to templates you can make slight modifications to the code as per your requirement for different conditions instead of making wholesale changes in selenium there are various frameworks like data driven testing keyword driven testing hybrid testing module driven testing and many more using these frameworks you will reduce your time to code and time to test and because of this a lot of companies are adopting selenium and looking for professionals skilled in selenium the next reason why you should learn selenium is because of its strong presence in the devops life cycle selenium forms an integral part of the continuous testing phase in the devops life cycle and today most companies are replacing agile or waterfall approaches with the devops approach very few testing tools qualify as a devops tool because DevOps emphasizes on using open source tools and also because most of the software products developed nowadays are delivered on the cloud web based testing tools are the ones that are extensively used and this is where selenium fits perfectly the sixth reason why you should learn selenium is because it can be easily integrated with a lot of open source tools some of those tools are jenkins testng maven junit sicoli and auto it and when these tools are integrated with selenium we can achieve automation this is where other tools lag behind the next reason is parallel and distributed testing executing multiple test cases at the same time is called parallel testing and executing them in remote machines is called distributed testing selenium grid is used for this purpose by performing parallel and distributed testing you save time to run the tests you do not need extra machines to perform the tests and you can also execute the same test cases on different web servers the next reason why you should launch selenium is because selenium does not depend on any gui based systems since selenium tests can be executed without a gui the tests can be carried out on web servers and automation can be achieved by scheduling the execution of test cases and since the gui is not involved there will be no system overhead and the performance of your machine will drastically improve the benefit over other tools is that most tools need a gui for scripting and those scripts can only be executed through the gui provided by the tool the ninth reason why you should launch selenium is because of the flexibility that you get while designing your test case for designing test cases you have the flexibility to design it either via programming logic using web driver or via the record and playback feature provided by ide if you are a technical person and prefer writing with the programming logic you can use web driver if you are a non technical person then you can use ide to record your tests and export that programming logic to an equivalent programming language of your choice the last reason but not the least important reason is that there's an increasing demand for selenium testers believe me when i say that among all the tools in the market selenium has the greatest demand and you can visibly see it on the screen right the one on the left shows how the selenium job vacancies have grown since 2008 and 2018 is not going to be any different the demand is still going to rise and even the pay is pretty good So my advice to you is launch selenium when it's still the right time Let's move further and know selenium architecture in depth Before I jump into the architecture let me tell you what is an API API termed as 
application programming interface works as an interface between various software components and selenium also provides one such api that is web driver api let's understand what is web driver api so selenium web driver api helps in communication between languages and browsers and as i have already told that selenium supports many programming languages and also multiple browsers so every browser has a different logic of performing actions like loading a page closing a browser performing actions etc so now talking about the architecture this is a selenium architecture which comprises of four main components that is selenium client library json via protocol over http browser drivers and browsers that is the real browsers so first talking about selenium client libraries are also termed as selenium language bindings so selenium supports multiple libraries like java ruby python and many more and selenium developers have developed the language bindings to allow selenium to support multiple languages so that is the reason this is nothing but a client library so in the client library it also comes up with apis that is java comes with the jar file and for all these programming languages they have their own set of apis and jar files next talking about the json via protocol over http client i'll explain you the linking of all these four components in a later part now let me tell you what is json via protocol over http client json stands for javascript object notation it is used to transfer the data between a server and a client on the web json via protocol is a rest api that transfers the information between http server each browser driver like you have firefox like chrome driver has its own http server on which it communicates with the client now talking about the browser driver each browser contains separate browser driver that is you can see for firefox browser there is firefox driver for chrome browser there is chrome driver for edge browser there is edge driver and like that and browser driver communicate with respective browser without revealing the internal logic of browser's functionality this is the main point because it does not reveal the internal functionality at all when a browser driver receives any command then that command will be executed on the respective browser and the response will go back in the form of http response but the internal logic behind that will never be revealed to anyone and the last component is browsers that is a real browser like you know you have many kind of browsers and that's what i'm talking about so selenium supports multiple browsers like firefox chrome safari opera edge internet explorer and many more now let's see how selenium web driver works internally the main working usually occurs between browsers and browser drivers as you all know selenium provides libraries that is it has its own set of libraries and that comes with apis so you can say java has a own jar files for all these programming languages they have their own jar own set of apis and jar files so say you write a command for selenium or when you create a browser instance like web driver driver is equal to new chrome driver or new firefox driver and what you will do using driver.get command you will pass the url that is say you want to navigate to google.com or you want to navigate to yahoo mail anything so what happens internally so what did you do here you did two steps first you created a instance of a browser and then you are passing the url of the website that you want to navigate through with the help of driver.get command so this is what you are doing by writing a code but what actually happens internally so selenium internally is creating a json payload for one post call that is whenever you create a instance or whenever you do any actions every time selenium creates a javascript object notation protocol so this json collects all the capabilities all the information about the browser and browser drivers like it will know on what browser you are executing which browser driver which version of the browser on which machine what information everything will be there in the json via protocol so selenium client library will send the request to json via protocol over http so json via protocol is a server so when you create an instance and launch a website internally the entire process will take over the http call based on the language that is based on the client language maybe java ruby python anything it will communicate with the language and then from these languages a request is sent to json via protocol 
and from there it goes to the browser drivers browser driver will instantiate the browsers and the response will be sent back as the http response back to the browser drivers so basically for whatever actions you perform on the web element selenium communicates with the client library creates json payload and creates an instance internally it does not matter what language we are using because it is just a client library but what matters is over the http protocol we are sending the request to the drivers in the form of a json and then this request will be performed on real browsers and then sent to the browser drivers so this is how it works internally over the protocol or over the grid if you want to execute your program you need a selenium server okay now let's see a demo wherein you will understand how to create a instance or how to create a session and also you will get to know what is json via protocol and what are the information and what are the capabilities that you will understand and that will be present in the json via protocol etc now let's see a small demo to understand how internal working of selenium architecture happens okay so you need a selenium standalone server to execute the program if you want to run remote selenium web driver and also over the protocol or over the grid if you want to execute your program you need a selenium standalone server so here you can see there's a download version for 3.141 of selenium standalone server just click on the download and it will start downloading as i have already downloaded the file i have saved it in this next one more important point is as i have already told you there is selenium client and web driver language bindings so this is all about the language bindings where it supports java c sharp ruby python javascript etc and also there is third party drivers bindings and plugins so i told you about the browser drivers for mozilla firefox there's a gecko driver for google chrome there's a chrome driver for opera for internet explorer for microsoft edge and many more so from here you can download your browser drivers i have already downloaded even that as well you can see i have a standalone server and i have a gecko driver as well okay so now what i will do i'll open my terminal in the downloads page why because i have saved my gecko driver and my selenium standalone server which is a jar file over there i want to list what all are there so i will open my terminal here and the very first thing that i want to do is i want to run my selenium server that is the selenium standalone server and i want to execute and create a session let's see how to do that so what i'll do i'll just list the commands so you can see there's a gecko driver and there's selenium so i want to execute my selenium standalone server so i will give the command like this java hyphen jar selenium server standalone so i will execute my jar file by using this command so you can see it is launching a standalone server on port number 4444 you can see it is initializing the web driver servlet and you can see the selenium server is up and running on port 4444 okay So now I want to cross check whether the Selenium standalone server is up and running or not. So what I will do? I'll go back to my Mozilla Firefox. I'll open local host 4444. Yes. So because that's where in my terminal it said the Selenium standalone server is working on this port number. So I will click alone the console. In this console is nothing but the web driver hub. So when you get this page or the previous page that is a Selenium standalone console, repeat that is Selenium standalone home page. It means your Selenium standalone server is up and running in a proper way. Now I want to create a session and say I want to create a session for Firefox because I have my Firefox web browser directly installed on my CentOS virtual box. So I'll give OK. As you all know, I have saved. my selenium standalone server and gecko driver in one folder that is the reason now it will create a session and create a browser instance also basically what should happen it should launch mozilla firefox browser and it should create a session and it should give the capabilities everything now let's see you can see that it launched mozilla firefox browser which means it created a browser instance because i have a gecko driver 
saved and the directory where I have saved my standalone server. Very simple, right? Just create an instance. Nothing much I'm going to do here. Just save the driver and the server in the same folder and it is done. Very simple. So now you can see here it is running a Mozilla Firefox driver instance. Yes. It's telling it's launching Gecko driver. You can see that here. Firefox Gecko driver service. And you can see in the web driver hub it created the session and this is the session ID for that. So you can load the script. You can delete the session. You can take the screenshot and these are the capabilities. That is the JavaScript object notation capabilities. So as I have told you it contains some capabilities some information like it contains browser name that is Firefox browser version that is 60.6.1 accessibility checks is false gecko driver version 0.24 Mozilla about the process ID. This is a process ID for that profile. The platform name is Linux platform version is this web driver remote session ID is the one which you got it from here. The timeouts the page load the script the implicit timeouts everything and the page load strategy is normal and the web driver click is true. Now there are some commands for JSON. So you just have to Google JSON via protocol Selenium and click on the first link. And you will get all the basic terms and concepts about the web element about the capabilities about the cookies about entry about log levels proxy JSON and these are the commands you have exceptions also error handling invalid request and this is the command request. So there is like get post methods to know the status you can query the current status you can create a new session by using this part. You can return a list of the currently available sessions. You can retrieve the session ID. You can delete the session. You can set the timeouts for the session IDs. You can get the session ID that is retrieve the URL of the current page. You can navigate to new URL. And these are nothing but the get post methods. And you can use the postman for executing all these commands as well. You can take a screenshot. Basically, all the actions that you perform on WebDriver can be done by using the JSON wireless protocol. Okay, so now here you can come here. You can take the screenshot. You can delete the session. You can load the script. Now suppose say I will try to create a Chrome driver instance. What will happen? I don't have my Chrome driver set in the file. I neither have my Chrome browser. So obviously it will say unable to create a new session. If you have your Chrome browser and your compatible matching Chrome driver, then obviously it will create a session like it did with Mozilla Firefox. Make sure that your browser and the browser driver is compatible with each other like if you have a older browser version then please try to download the older driver itself or else just update your browser and then you can use the latest driver. Okay, very simple. So I hope you understood how to create a session how to launch a server and how to check the capabilities of the JSON payload. So this is nothing but the JSON script and this is how you need to do that and you can also check over here. Okay. But if you close the terminal then the instance will be closed. Now let's see how to create a script and how to launch a driver instance. How to assign all the page timeouts how to navigate through a URL perform actions send keys click and many more. So this is a program where I have first created a Java class file and inside the main method I am using system dot set property. To set the properties of the gecko driver that is a Firefox driver. Okay, so once when I set the system properties and create an object of the Firefox driver, it should basically launch the Firefox driver with these two commands. But then what I'm doing, I'm maximizing the windows, I'm deleting all the cookies, I'm giving the timeouts for implicitly wait and page timeout, and then using driver.get, I'm navigating to twitter.com. I have told you before, right? If you navigate, so what it will do, it will first launch Firefox driver and navigate to twitter.com. And then using link text, I'm clicking on the sign up link and I'm finding the element using XPath locator. If you want to know about the locators and weights and about the basics of Selenium, Selenium web driver, everything, you can check out the videos in our YouTube playlist and you can get hands on on that as well. So I'm using XPath and I'm locating the element and sending the key again. I'm also trying to find 
the phone number with the help of a name locator and I'm sending the keys assigning thread dot sleep for one millisecond because I just want to know what actually actions are performing on the web element or not and then I'm clicking on the next button. So this is what I am doing in my code, but so once you execute this program what will happen internally after you click on the run till it launched the Firefox browser. So once you click on the run that is this button every statement in your script will be converted as an URL with the help of JSON via protocol over HTTP. The URLs will be passed to the browser drivers and the above code what I took I took Firefox driver here in our case the client library Java will convert the statements to the script of JSON format and communicates with the Firefox and every browser driver uses HTTP server to receive HTTP requests. Once a URL reaches the browser driver, then the browser driver will pass that request to the real browser over HTTP. Then the commands in your Selenium script will be executed on the browser. If the request is post request, then there will be an action on the browser. If the request is a get request, then the corresponding response will be generated at the browser end and it will be sent over HTTP to the browser driver and the browser driver over JSON via protocol and sends it to the UI that is Eclipse. So this is all what is happening at the back end. Now let's run and check for the output. So what should happen? It should launch Firefox navigate to twitter.com and perform the actions on the web elements. Let's see what happens. You can see that Mozilla Firefox driver instantiated it launched Gecko driver launched Firefox navigated to Twitter hit on the sign up enter name and phone number hit on the next button. Yes, so this is what you can see in the front end, but in the back end in action JSON protocol page is created and the requests are being sent to the client and depending on the get and post the response is sent back. So that's how the internal working of Selenium architecture happens. Say if you want to create an instance of the Chrome driver, you have to just download the Chrome driver, specify the path, create an object of new Chrome driver, and that's all. Very simple. Again, if you want to do it on Edge, you can know about it. If you should know about how you can create an instance of all the drivers and perform cross browser testing, you can check out the cross browser testing using Selenium in our YouTube playlist, and you can actually know how it works. What are web elements? Anything present on the web page is a web element, such as a text box, a button, link, etc. But before performing any action in Selenium, we should identify the web element using its characteristics given by the application developer with the help of an HTML code. Now, what are the basic components of a web element? A web element comprises of an HTML tag, attribute, and the text field. Now let's understand these components in detail. What is an HTML tag? It is an individual component of an HTML document or a web page. Now, what are the attributes? HTML attributes are special words used inside the opening tag to control the element's behavior. Now, what is a text field? A text field is placed on the web page using the input tag with the type attribute set with the value of text. So basically the web element represents an HTML element. Generally all operations interacting with the page will be performed through this interface. Selenium WebDriver encapsulates a simple form of element as an object of the web element. So this gives you a proper introduction to what are the web elements in Selenium. Now let's move on and understand the different types of web elements. As I mentioned earlier, everything that is present on a web page is considered as a web element. So we have these types of web elements starting with the edit box, which is a basic text control that enables a user to type a small amount of text. And then we have the link, which allows the user to click their way from page to page. Moving further, we have the button, which represents a clickable button which can be used in forms or anywhere in document that needs a simple standard button functionality. And then we have the image image link and the image button which performs actions similar to the other fields but with the images. We have the text area where we can enter the text 
and then we have the check box which is a selection box or the tick box which is a small interactive box that can be toggled by the user to indicate the affirmative or the negative choice moving further we also have a radio button or the option button which is a graphical control element that allows the user to choose only one of the predefined set of mutually exclusive options and then we have the drop down box which is a graphical control element similar to the list box that allows the user to choose one value from the list when a drop down is inactive it displays a single value but when it is activated it displays a list of values from which the user may select one and then we have the list box which contains a list of options and only one can be selected out of it and then we have the combo box which contains a mixture of the drop down box as well as the list box so this is everything you need to know about the types of web elements in selenium now let's move on and understand what are the operations that are performed on these web elements i can say that there are a lot of operations that can be performed on the web elements starting with performing operations on the browser such as launching the browser navigating to a particular web page closing the focused browser and also close the driver functionality for the browser and you can also perform actions like navigating from one web page to another navigating back to the previous web page navigating forward to another web page refreshing the browser and maximizing the browser screen so this is about the operations that can be performed on the browser now let's take a look at the operations that can be performed on the web page you can perform actions like getting the title of the current web page and also get the url of the current web page and you can also perform actions on the edit box like entering a particular value clearing that value and check the enable status and also check the edit box existence we can also perform actions on the link by clicking on the link check the link existence check the link enable status and return the link name and many more and we can also perform actions on the buttons like clicking the button checking the enable status for the button and the display status of the button and when it comes to performing actions on the images we have basically three types of image elements in the web environment that is the general image which has no functionalities image button which helps in submitting the image and the image link which redirects to the another web page or location So this is about performing actions on the image guys now let's take a look at the operations that can be performed on a text area that is return or capture of the text area displaying the error message and so on now let's take a look at the operations that can be performed on the checkbox it helps in checking if the checkbox is displayed or not and also has it been enabled or not helps in selecting the checkbox and unselecting the checkbox Now let's take a look at the operations that can be performed on the radio button. Selects the radio button, verifies if the radio button is displayed or enabled or not, and also checks if it is selected or not. Moving further, we'll take a look at the operations performed on the drop-down box. It checks if the drop-down box is present or not or has it been enabled. Selects an item out of the drop-down box and gets the item count. Now coming to the operations performed on the list box it selects the particular list and helps in deselecting it as well and performing actions on the combo box contains the operations performed on the drop down box and the list box moving further we have the operations to be performed on the web table or the html table which basically helps in getting the cell value the row count or the cell count etc And finally we can perform actions on the frames switching from the top window to a particular frame in the web page and switching from a frame to the top window and many more so these are the operations that can be performed on the web element guys now the question is how to locate these elements on the web page selenium uses element locators which helps in locating these web elements on the web page so let's see how this can be done Selenium makes use of the locator that can be termed as an address that identifies a web element uniquely within the web page. 
Locators are the HTML properties of a web element which tells Selenium about the web element it needs to perform the actions on. There is a diverse range of web elements like the text box, ID, radio button, etc. And identifying these elements is a tricky approach. So Selenium uses these locators to interact with the web elements on the web page. So let's see what are the different types of locators in Selenium. First off, we have the ID. The ID strategy looks for an element in the page having an ID attribute corresponding to a specified pattern. And then we have the name. Locating elements by name are very similar to locating it by ID, except that we use the prefix in name. And then we have the class, which searches for the class name of a particular web element. And then we have the link text. This type of locator applies to the hyperlink text. We access the link by prefixing our target with link is equal to and then followed by the hyperlink text and then locating it by CSS selector. CSS selector is a combination of an element selector and a selector value which identifies the web element within a web page and then we have partial link text. In some cases, we may need to find links by a portion of a text in the link text element. In such situations, we use the partial link text to locate the elements. And then we have the XPath, which is designed to allow the navigation of XML documents with the purpose of selecting individual elements, attributes, or some other part of an XML document for specific processing. So, this is about the different types of element locators in Selenium. So let me give you a quick demonstration of how element locators work in Selenium guys. So let's work on the operations. So first we need the Java libraries in order to run the test scripts and also we require an IDE where we can perform the actions. So I have the latest Eclipse IDE installed in my system. So I'm just going to click on it. Launch the workspace. Okay, so this is the Eclipse workspace guys. So I'll first create a new Java project. And name it web elements. And finish. You can see that the project is being created. And now we need to add the Selenium jar files. So I'm going to go to build path. Configure build path. And add external jars. Apply and close. You can see that another folder is being created by the name referenced libraries, which holds all the Selenium jar files. Now I'm going to create a package in order to write the code. Code.eureka. Click on finish. And now I'm going to create a class. And give this the name Selenium Web Element. And add the main function. And click on finish. So you can see that the program comes under the package code.edureka and I've created a class of the name Selenium Web Element under which our main class resides. So let's start writing the piece of code from here. So first in order to work on Selenium, you need to set the browser driver. So in my case, I'm going to consider working on the Chrome driver. So I'm going to set the system property system dot set property. I'm going to set the system property to Chrome dot driver and specify the path in which it is located. In my case, it is located in the C drive. So I'm going to copy this path and go back to my project and paste it. And always note that the extension should be given as the Chrome driver dot exe which specifies that it is an executable file. And after this, I'm going to instantiate the browser driver to the new Chrome driver. So I'm going to create an object of the web driver and 
instantiate it with the new Chrome driver. Okay, you can see that it throws an error. Just import the web driver packages and also the Chrome driver packages. So after you finish instantiating the browser driver, we are going to get the URL of the web page that we want to search for. So I'm going to consider the object of the web driver that is driver dot get URL and paste the URL over here. Okay, so once you get the URL of the web page, we need to find the elements on the web page that are basically the web elements. So let's go to our web page. Okay, so this is Amazon.in. So let's say if you want to search for this particular search box here. So you can do that using the element locators in Selenium. So I'm just going to right click on it and go to inspect. And uh, you can see that this particular piece of code corresponds to that element location. So the ID is present, which is one of the element locator in Selenium. So I'm just going to copy this ID and go back to my project and write the corresponding code. So it's driver dot find element by ID and specify the ID. And I'm going to send keys to that particular location. That is the search box. So I'm going to send keys. So I'm going to search for Poco F1. So I'm going to search for this particular element that is Poco F1. And now say you want to click the search icon. Let's go back to our web page. So say you want to click this particular web element that is the search icon or the search button. You can do that by inspecting it. You can find the class present here guys. So I'm going to copy this class and go back to my project and write the corresponding code. So it is driver dot find element by class name and also specify the name that is a class name and click the search button. I think this was clear to you guys. So let's execute this piece of code first. Okay, opens Amazon dot in. Well, that was quick. So let's try adding the thread commands in between. So this thread command helps in pausing the execution for a few seconds. Four seconds. Four seconds. So now let's run this program. It first opens the Amazon dot in page. searches for POCO F1 and clicks on the button. All right, guys, I hope you guys understood this. Let's go back to our web page. Now I'm going to manually enter this. Click on the button. You can see that the checkbox is present here, which is another web element in Selenium. So I'm going to consider the second checkbox here and click on inspect. You can see that the class is present, but let's check if this is the only class present in this code. So I'm just going to copy this and click Control F so that the text box pops up. So you can see that this is not the only class present. There are 27 matches to this class. So you cannot consider this class because there is an ambiguity problem. So let's consider the link text. So copy the link text and go back to the project and write the code to locate the checkbox. Find element by link text and paste the link text here and click. As it is a checkbox, we need to click the checkbox. Save it and run the program. Okay, you can see it first it navigates to Amazon dot in searches for POCO F1 and clicks on the search button. 
and clicks on the checkbox. Now let's add on a few more commands here. Now say you want to perform actions on the screen that is maximizing the web page. So you can do that using driver dot manage dot windows dot maximize. So this command helps in maximizing the current web page and after this say you want to navigate to another web page. So driver dot navigate to I'm going to consider the web page edureka.co slash block. Okay, so I'm going to consider navigating it to this page and pause the execution for a few seconds. Okay, so I'm going to pause the execution for four seconds. Now say you want to navigate back to the current web page that is the Amazon page. So I'm going to consider driver dot navigate back. So this command helps in navigating back to the web page and after this I'm going to exit the driver execution that is we'll quit the driver execution. Okay. Save this and run it. Opens Amazon.in. Maximizes the web page. Pauses the execution and searches for Poco F1. Pauses the execution and again clicks on the search button. After this, checkbox and navigates to the Edureka blog page. And pauses the execution for four seconds and then navigates back and closes the execution. So, I think you guys understood how web elements in Selenium works. So, you target an element using these web elements, and these web elements can be found using the element locators in Selenium. So, I hope you guys understood what are web elements and how to target a web element in Selenium. Locators can be termed as an address that identifies a web element uniquely within the web page. They are the HTML properties of a web element which tells Selenium about what action it needs to perform on the particular web element. And Selenium uses locators to interact with the web elements on the web page. Using the right locator ensures that the tests are faster, more reliable or has lower maintenance over releases. If you're fortunate enough to be working with unique IDs and classes, then you're usually all set. But there will be times when choosing a right locator will become a nightmare. It can be a real challenge to verify that you have the right locators to accomplish whatever task you want to. There is a diverse range of web elements like you have text box, ID, radio button, etc. And identifying these elements have always been a very tricky subject and thus it requires an accurate and effective approach. And thereby, we can assert that more effective the locator is, more stable will be the automation script. Essentially, every Selenium command requires locators to find the web elements, and thus to identify these web elements accurately and precisely, we have different types of locators like you have ID, name, link text, CSS selector, partial link text, and XPath. Now, Let's begin and understand how ID locators is being used. ID is the best and most popular method to identify web element. The ID of each element is alleged to be unique. IDs are the safest and fastest locator option and should always be the first choice even when there are multiple choices. It's like an employee number or account number which will be unique. So this is a target format that is ID is equal to ID of the element. Now let's see how to locate a web element using ID locator. Now I will open my Google Chrome and navigate to gmail.com and here you can see there is an email or phone. I'll right click on this and choose inspect. So when I mouse over on this particular script, 
you can see here your email or phone text box is getting highlighted which implies this is the script for this particular email or phone text box now you can see here it has a id attribute whose value is identifier id correct so now we will use this in our eclipse and try to locate email or phone text box and send keys using id locator now i will open my eclipse and write a program so as you can see here i have created a class called locators and inside main method i have launched my chrome driver chrome driver is very important because it will help us to launch google chrome and navigate to the output so this is the location where i have saved my chrome driver and next using driver.manage i'm deleting all the cookies and maximizing the window and i'm using some timeouts for page load timeout and i'm using implicit wait here as well and next using driver.get i have to give the link of gmail.com so i'll copy this link and paste it over here next let's use id locator to locate it now i'll create a web element called username and i will use a method that is driver dot find element by id so here by is a class name and id is a locator so if you inspect this what was the value of your id it is identifier id so just copy this and inside the double quotes paste it over here okay so what's next so now let's perform some action on it now i want to send some values that is i want to enter a username or a email address something let's see how to do that so as i have created a web element called username i'll use that and i'll just say send keys and here i will write email address something like edureka@gmail.com okay save this now let's run the program and check the output as you can see it got navigated through your gmail.com and entered your email as edureka@gmail.com correct if you click on next it will ask you to enter password sounds simple that is you are just launching your gmail.com and using driver.find element by id i'm trying to locate the email or phone text box and i'm sending values called edureka@gmail.com So this can be done using ID if ID is present as a web element or as an attribute on the particular web page. So one important thing to note here, it is not necessary to create a web element and then send keys and perform action. Instead of using web element, you can just use this. I'll show you how. I'll just comment these two lines. Okay? So you can simply use driver dot find element by ID and your ID value, and you can send the keys. But if you create a web element, you can use it anywhere in the code. It is not restricted to any element as such. Now, if I run this program again, you'll get the same output. So as you can see, again it launched gmail dot com and it entered the value whatever you have sent. Correct. So this is all about using IDs. Next, let's see name locator. This is also an efficient way to locate element with name attribute. After IDs, you can give your second preference to name. Name attributes don't have to be unique in the page, but IDs are always unique in the web page. So what happens here? The first element that has the name attribute with value that has a matching to the particular location will be returned. If there is no such element that consists of a name attribute, then a no such element exception will be raised. Let's demonstrate and check how it works. So I'll open my google.com and click on the search bar and choose inspect. So again if I mouse over on this, the search bar is getting highlighted. So as you can see here, it has a name attribute whose value is q. So copy this. And as you also can see here, there is no id or there is no any other name attribute as well. Correct? Now let's try to locate the search box and perform some action on the search box using name attribute. There's no much difference here. instead of by id you will make it as name and i will paste the value that will be q and say i want to search selenium okay and here what i have to do i have to copy the google link so i'll change this to google.com and now if i run the program in the search box selenium will be entered okay so let's run the program and check the output So Chrome driver launched google.com and it entered the value called selenium. Now you can choose whatever you want. 
but if you wish to have the search automatically then you have to carry out one more step that is click on google search button and choose inspect as you can see here it also has a name attribute whose value is btnk so copy that and here you can open the eclipse and change the value that will be btnk dot as it is a search box you have to use click because you cannot send any values to that because it is a button and not the text box so by doing this it will give an automated search let's see how i'll save this program let's run and check the output so as you can see it entered selenium and the search happened automatically okay but now i want to do something that is i want to give a wait time that is i want to use thread dot sleep for 2 seconds okay now what happens first it will launch google chrome and enter selenium keys and then it will wait for 2 seconds and then give your search correct so now let's see whether it happens accordingly or not so it entered selenium it waited for 2 seconds and then it gave your search correct so this is how you can use thread dot sleep method to wait for 2 seconds and then give the output so basically this is how you can use your name locator now let's see what's next next we have link text this type of locator applies only to hyperlinks and all the hyperlinks on the web page can be identified using link text the links on the web page can be determined with the help of an anchor tag the anchor tag is used to create the hyperlinks on the web page and the text between the opening and closing of a anchor tag constitutes the link text now let's see how to use this bored of using google.com right so let's use something different now we'll open yahoo mail so here it comprises of trouble signing in it has signed in it has sign up links so let's investigate trouble signing in as i have already mentioned it starts with an anchor tag followed by the href that is the hyperlink okay so here it consists of a link text called trouble signing in correct but if there is no id or name attribute in the web element in such cases you can use a method called link text let's see how to use that so instead of name i will change it to link text okay so here you can see it comprises of a link text okay so i'll copy this and i will paste it over here now save this and run the program let's check the output so chrome driver launched this and you can see here the trouble signing in link got changed to difficulty signing in so let's inspect this and put the same thing over there so i'll copy this text only and i'll change it over here and here i will use link text locator and click it because it is a link and not a text box so save this and run the program so now you can see here that is it is asking you for sign in email address or mobile number your recovery phone number or your email address correct so this is how you can use link text if there is no id or name attribute in the web page and it is only used for hyperlinks now let's move further and understand the css locator css is mainly used to provide style rules for the web pages and not only that we can also use for identifying one or more elements in the web page using css if you start using css selectors you will love the speed when compared with xpath and we can also use css selectors to make scripts to run with the same speed in the internet explorer browser as well and css selector is the best possible way to locate complex elements in the web page now let's navigate through yahoo login page and use css selectors so i will inspect the same element only as i have told you id is a unique locator correct and it is unique to the whole web page so here it comprises of a value called login username so if i have to locate the text box that is enter your email using css locator here only then i'll click on elements press control f and i will write a css selector over here so remember one thing css selector always starts with hash and you have the value of your id as login username so as soon as i write login username you can see here it was able to locate the element that is it has highlighted the element and it was able to locate this enter your email box as well so just copy this value 
and open your Eclipse and here instead of by link text give it as CSS selector. I'll paste the value of CSS selector that is login username and I will use it over here. And as it is a text box I have to change it to send keys because I will be sending an email address. Okay, save this and now I want to do one more thing over here that is I want to click on next button automatically. Let's see how I will inspect this again and again this has an ID attribute which is unique to the web page that is login sign in. I will copy this and paste it over here. It was login sign in correct. Just cross verify it. Yeah, it's login sign in and as next is a button. I have to use click and I will use thread dot sleep because after entering a username I wanted to wait for two seconds and then click on next. Let's see how it works. Run the program. As you can see it entered adureka at the rate yahoo.com waited for two seconds and then clicked on next. Here you can enter your password and you can sign in correct. Sounds much easier right. So basically this is how you can use CSS selectors. Now let's move further and see how to locate elements using partial link text. In some situations we have to find the links by the portion of the text that is present in the link text element. In such situations we use partial link text to locate the elements. Let's take same example and try to locate it. So here it contains of difficulty signing in. So I will inspect that and I will just copy this text. Instead of giving the whole difficulty signing in text I'll just give it as difficulty. Okay and I'll change here it to partial link text. Okay save this. Let's see what will be the output. Let's see whether it will be able to redirect to difficulty signing in page by using the partial link text method. Yes, it was able to correct. So this is how you can use partial link text to locate a particular link using a partial value or a partial text in the web page or a partial text in the web page. Correct. Now let's move to the last locator that is XPath. This is my favorite locator. XPath also called as XML path is a language to query XML documents. It consists of a path expression along with some conditions. So let's use Yahoo login page and try to locate it using XPath. So I'll just inspect the same element. In case of XPath there are two types one is absolute and one is relative. In case of absolute it starts from the root of the document that is from the HTML that where the document has started. But in case of relative XPath we have to simply use double forward slash and it applies anywhere in the document we can find an element. So let's see how. So as I told I'm going to inspect this. I'll start with double forward slash which implies anywhere in the document and you can see here it has an input. So I'll write input. So this is my tag name that is input and now I'll use square brackets and in that I'll use a select attribute that will be my ID. Okay. So ID is my attribute and I have a value for ID that is login username. Correct. So I'll just paste it over here and I have to enclose this login username within single quotes. So on writing this X path it was able to locate the particular element. Correct. So now I'll copy the same X path and paste it over here. And I have to send keys as well. So I'll send keys called edureka at the rate yahoo.com and also I will do one more thing that is I'll be using this next button. I will inspect this as well again here it has a ID attribute whose value is login sign in. So if I change it over here you can see it was able to locate the next button. So again I'll copy this X path and I will paste it in my Eclipse. Save it. Now let's run the program and check the output. So you can see here it entered edureka at the rate yahoo.com, waited for two seconds and then redirected to your login page. Correct. So this is how you can use XPath. And this is all about the types of locators. Now, what is the preference for the locators? ID is given the first preference because it is unique. Even name as well because it is also considered as a unique locator. So second preference will be for CSS selectors and XPath and next comes link text. 
it is useful only for links so you can give third preference and partial link text is my fourth preference now let's see some best practices for locators locators are simple and small as possible because you have just a simple locator names like id name text link text css selectors xpath etc and the locators will still work even after you change the properties of the user interface elements and also they work even after you change the properties of the ui elements around the element you target so sounds very simple right so it works even if you change the properties of the user interface elements that you target as well sounds much simple right what are element locators as selenium is an open source portable framework we can easily inspect the element on the web page and link it using proper codes this element locators in selenium make it easy to find an element on the web page it can also be termed as an address that identifies a web element uniquely within that web page these element locators are basically the html properties of a web element which tells the tool that is selenium about the action it needs to perform on the web element so this is the proper introduction to what are element locators in selenium now let's take a look at the different types of element locators that exist the locators are of six types we can locate any element on the web page using their id name class xpath css selector partial text and link text we'll understand these one by one okay so first we'll start with the id this is the most common way of locating elements since the ids are supposed to be unique for each element this locator looks for an element in the web page having an id attribute the target format will be something like this id is equal to id of the element okay guys so this is about the id locator next we'll move on to the name say if there is no id present in the html code how would you locate the element we use the name locator when there is no id to use the next worth seeing if the desired element has a name attribute or not but it is for sure that the name cannot be unique all times if there are multiple names selenium always performs actions on the first matching element locating element by name is very similar to locating by id except that we use the name as a prefix instead so this is about the name locator now let's understand what is a link text finding an element with link text is very simple but make sure there is only one unique link on the web page if there are multiple links with the same link text such as the repeated header or a footer and menu links in such cases selenium will perform action on the first matching element with this link this type of locator applies only to hyperlink text we can access the link by prefixing our target with the link and followed by the hyperlink text so this is about the link text now what is a css selector this whole session is mainly concentrated on this particular element locator guys now let's understand what does it mean css is mainly used to provide style rules for the web pages and we can use it for identifying one or more elements in the web page once you start using css selector to locate an element you will love the speed when it is compared to xpath we can use the css selectors to make sure that the scripts run with the same speed in the internet explorer browser as well css selector is always the best possible way to locate complex elements in the web page this type of locator mainly uses some unique symbols in order to find an element we'll learn more about it when we get to the introduction section now let's discuss about partial link text in some situations say you may need to find the links by the portion of the text in the link text element in such situations we use the partial link text to locate an element okay the syntax goes something like this find element by partial link text where you provide the partial link text of the element so this is about the partial link text now let's move on to another important element locator in selenium that is the xpath xpath is a standard navigation tool for xml and an html document is also an xml document that is xhtml 
This XPath is used everywhere where there is XML. It is designed to allow the navigation of XML documents with the purpose of selecting the individual elements, attribute, or some other part of an XML document. The syntax goes something like this. It always starts with two consecutive slashes, that is two backslashes, followed by the tag name and square bracket where you have to select the attribute at specifies the select function and specify the attribute and also provide the value of the attribute so that you can locate the element on the web page. So this is everything you need to know about the different types of locators in Selenium guys. Now let's move on to our key point of this session that is the CSS selector and also understand what is the importance of this locator and why is it used. CSS Cascading Spreadsheets is a style sheet language used to describe the presentation of a document written in a markup language like HTML. You might think what does CSS have to do with Selenium? Well, we locate a web element by using the corresponding HTML code. This method is very fast compared to XPath, which is one of the most popularly used element locators. Then why does it have more importance than other locators? Well, to answer this, I would say this method is very simple as it uses certain symbols for locating an element on the web page. So this is about the CSS selector. Now let's take a look at the syntax and a few basic commands that are used. The syntax of the CSS selector goes something like this. The HTML tag followed by the unique symbol used to locate the element and the value of the attribute that is present. This syntax follows when the ID attribute is present. Now, what if there is no ID present? How would you locate an element without an ID? Say if the class attribute is present or the name. Again, we use the unique symbol to identify the element on the web page. Say if the class attribute is present, we are going to use the dot between the HTML tag and the value of the attribute. Now, say if there is no ID specified nor the class, how do you find the element using CSS in this case? We use different symbols that helps us in locating the elements. As you can see, there are three different commands here. For partial values, say if you want to search for a partial value of the target element, you can do it using CSS selector by using the command HTML tag followed by the locator and asterisk specifies that it is a partial value. Now say if you want to match a prefix of a particular element on the web page, you can do it using the CSS selector by using this command HTML tag followed by the attribute and a caret symbol and also specify the prefix of the string. This caret is the symbolic notation to match a string using the prefix. Now if you want to match the particular element with the matching suffix, how would you do that? We use a dollar symbol in order to find the suffix of an element on the web page. Now say if you want to find an element which is nested below. Say if there is a header, say if there is immediate child and there is the ancestors and so on. How would you find the grandchild of an element? Using CSS selector, we can use the inner text to do the job. Inner text helps us identify and create the CSS selector using a string pattern that the HTML tag manifests on the web page. The syntax goes something like this. HTML tag followed by colon contains and the text that you want to search for. This colon sign symbolizes the contains method. What is a contains method? Contains method is a value of a class attribute which is being accessed. And the text is a particular element on the web page that you want to search. Okay, so these are the basic syntax and commands that you need to know when you're working on the CSS selector. However, in the end, CSS covers almost every element on the web page and makes the process of finding the element easy. Now, let's move on to the most interesting part of this session where I will show you how CSS selector works. In this demo section, we'll try automating a very famous e-commerce website, ebay.com. So to do that, we require the Java libraries present in our system and also an IDE where we can write our code. As you can see that I already have the Eclipse IDE present here. We consider using the Eclipse IDE because it is user friendly and provides various functionalities. 
Now, if you want to check if the Java libraries are present, just go to the command prompt and type Java version. This specifies the version of Java installed in your system. Okay, now let's click on our latest Eclipse ID. Launch the process. This is the Eclipse workspace, guys. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be automating a website called eBay.com. So to do that, we require a project under which we'll write our code to automate the web page. So first we'll create a new project. So to do that, go to file, go to new. You can't see a Java project here. Okay, so just go to other and type Java. You can find that there is a Java project here. Just click on it. It asks for a name. So I'm going to give this as CSS selectors. Selenium. Okay, just click on finish. No. You can see that the folder by the name of your project is being created. And you can also find the Java libraries present here. And the source field is where we'll write our piece of code. So first let's link the Selenium libraries to our project. So to do that right click on your project. Just go to build path and configure build path and add external jars. So we require the Selenium libraries now. So these libraries can be easily downloaded using Selenium's official website. So now I'm just going to click on this copy this. Okay, go to the lip control A and open and we require Selenium standalone server. Okay, so these are the Selenium libraries which we require in our project. So you can see that there is another folder being created of the name reference libraries where all our Selenium libraries are present. Now in order to write the piece of code, we are going to create a package under which we'll write our class. Just create a package. Package always starts in the reverse order. So I'm just going to write edureka code.edureka and finish. Okay, you can see that the package is being created. Now right click on the package and go to class. It creates a class. So I'm going to name this as demo class and select the main function and click on finish. So you can see that the project comes under the package code.edureka under which the demo class resides and we are going to write our piece of code under the main function. So first we need to set the driver to a particular browser driver. So in order to do that, I'm going to set the system property to the driver that we prefer. So I'm going to prefer working on Chrome driver in this case. So I'm just going to write web driver dot Chrome dot driver and and this argument specifies the path in which it resides. So let's see where this Chrome driver resides. You can see that there is a folder here which says Chrome and just copy this Chrome driver path and go back to our project and paste the location over here. One thing you need to know when you're writing the path is you have to specify if it is an executable file or not. Without that you cannot execute any project on Chrome. So I'm just going to specify the extension that is Chrome driver dot exe. This is the executable file. Okay. Now we need to link the web driver instance to the new Chrome driver. So to do that, I'm going to create an object of the web driver and call it the driver and instantiate it with the new Chrome driver. You can see that it is throwing an error on the web driver as well as the Chrome driver. So I'm just going to click on this. It says import web driver, which means we are going to import the web driver packages to our project. The same goes with the Chrome driver as well. Import it. Okay. And after this, we need to get the URL of the web page that we want to perform actions on. So I'm going to consider the object of the web driver that is driver dot get, which is of the form string and specify the URL of the web page. So in this case, it is the eBay.com. So HTTP eBay.com. Okay. Specify the URL. Now we need to find the element on the web page. So first let's Google search it. We'll search for eBay.com. So this is our web application guys. We are going to perform all our operations on this web page. So now say if you want to search for this particular element on the web page. 
each element in this page is considered as a web element. So say if you want to search for this particular element, I'm going to inspect this by right clicking. You can see that the corresponding HTML code for this location is present here and the ID is present, which is the CSS locator. One good thing about Selenium is that it allows the plugins to work with them. So Selenium also supports a plugin called Crowpath where you can easily find the XPath and the CSS selector of the location. So to get more information about this Crowpath, how it works and how elements can be located using Crowpath, just check out the link that is put up in the description of this video. So you can see that the CSS selector of this element location is present. So I'm just going to copy this and go back to my project. And now I'm going to write a corresponding code to that location. So considering the object of the web element driver dot find element by I'm going to consider this by the CSS selector and also specify the CSS selector within quotes. So hash will be the string selector of the web element and I'm going to send keys to that particular location to send keys. Say if I want to search for one of the trending phones one plus 60. Okay, now we've found the search box on the web page and then we've sent keys to that particular location and now we need to search for the search icon on the web page. Let's close this. Now I'm going to inspect the search button here. Inspect it. You can see that the ID is present here too. So just go to the crow path. Relative path is present. Absolute path is also specified and the CSS selector of this particular location is also present because ID is present. So copy this location and go back to our project and write the corresponding code. It is driver dot find element by CSS selector. And I'm going to specify the location of the CSS selector and click because it's a button. OK, so let's see what happens while we execute this program. So I'm just going to save this program and run it. OK, it opened the website. It checks for one plus 60 and clicks the search button. I think you guys have understood how this works. Now say if you want to modify this particular process, how would you do that? Let's take a look. Now say if you want to perform scrolling through a web page and also try using the different element locators like the dollars, the caret and so on. So we can do that using this command here. So first let's maximize the web page. So it is driver dot manage dot window dot maximize. So this particular command helps in maximizing the web page. Now say if you want to perform actions like scrolling down through a page and so on. We can do that using the JavaScript executor. This JavaScript executor is an interface between the Selenium web driver and the UI interface. So now I'm going to add the JavaScript executor here. And also create an object of the same and call it JS is equal to JavaScript executor and we'll also link this JavaScript executor to the driver. Okay, you can see that the JavaScript executor is throwing an error. So I'm just going to import the JavaScript executor functions and packages into a project. So now let's crawl down through the web page using the JavaScript executor. So I'm going to consider the object of the JavaScript executor JS dot execute script. We'll consider only one argument in this case and specify the function window dot scroll by by specifying the axis in which I want it to scroll through. So I'm going to specify 300. I'm going to delete the argument here. OK, now let's save this and run it. Maximizes the page. So just for one plus 60 and scrolls down. OK, so this is a very simple program guys. Now say I search it manually one plus 60 and click on the search button and scrolling through it. Now say if you want to search for this particular element on the web page, I'm going to inspect it. 
and you can see that the class is present here which is an element locator in selenium again so this span that is the html tag of the particular element is span okay so we'll write our code click control f where the code comes up so i'm going to consider the span use the dot okay you can see that this particular element has been located here using this particular command okay so the dot operator helps in specifying the class of the particular element. Now say if you want to search for the immediate child class after the parent class. So you can see that the division tag is a parent tag of this span. So I'm going to consider the parent tag first that is div greater than. Now talking about the other commands that we use in order to locate the elements, we can use the partial text link. So I'm going to consider this class here. I'm going to copy this class and click control F where you can get the search box. So I'm going to specify the tag associated with it, which is span followed by the locator class and an asterisk and specify this element location. Now say if you don't want to write the entire code, so I'm just going to write item price. So I'm going to take off this S. So even in this case, you can see that it is locating to the same position. So this is how we use the star operator in the CSS selector guys. So now if you want to search the element by its prefix or the suffix, you can use caret or the dollar symbol. So what is XPath? XPath also called as XML path is a language to query XML documents. It consists of a path expression along with some conditions and as I have already mentioned it is an important strategy to locate elements in selenium. Now let's see how a XML document looks like. So this is an example of XML document where you have different tags and attributes. As you can see here bookstore node has a child notebook and it is further followed by attribute called category and its value is cooking. And this book node in turn has two child nodes that is title and author. Now let's try to visualize this document in a tree like structure. So bookstore is a root node. It has two children. Both are book category for first is cooking and second is children and below that both has two tags that is title and author. Now let's take an example and try to locate author of a book for category children. So we will start with the root node bookstore. Then we will go down to book. Then we have two books here that has category of children. Once we are on the right node, we will go down and pick the node that has the author tag. So this is an expert to locate author of a book for which category is children. So this is how you have to write the expert. That is your root node and your child node that is book followed by tag name that is category whose value is children and the tag will be author. Basically, every web page is a document that consists of tags and attributes. And by using XPath, we can query the page document might be your XML, HTML, etc. And also to locate a particular element, we can write an XPath query that could use elements tag name as well as its attributes. And the query would return the matching element in XML. Every modern browser has a built in XPath engine. So this is all about the XML document and XML tree. Now. Let's see some benefits of XPath. XPath queries are compact and easily parsed and syntax is very simple for simple and common use cases and XPath queries are easy to read and type and they do not return repeated notes and also you can uniquely identify any node in XML document and query strings are easily embedded in program script and XML documents. So these are few benefits of XPath. I think you're bored of theories, right? Now let's take a real world example and understand XPath. So before that, let's see a syntax and terminologies of XPath. So this is how a syntax of your XPath looks like. As you can see, front slash indicates select current node and tag name will be your tag name like input, div, img, etc. And your ampersand indicates to select the attributes and attribute will be your attribute name and value implies the value of an attribute. Got it? So this is very simple syntax of your XPath query. 
Now let's see some practicals. So what I will do, I will launch Google Chrome and navigate to google.com. So here I will try to locate search bar using XPath. So I'll right click on the search bar and choose inspect. As you can see, it has an input tag and some attributes, correct? So you can see here it has some input tag and it has some attributes, okay? Now we will use this tag name and these attributes to construct X path that can locate this element. So now let's see how to do that. I'll click on elements and click control F and now I will write my X path query. So as you can see here, I can write X path. I can write string selector and it will try to search based on the criteria. So as it has an input tag, I'll start with double slash. That is a double front slash. I will use my tag name as input. Okay, and next I will use my attribute. So I have to use ampersand for select attributes and I can see here it has an ID. So that will be my attribute name and within single quotes. What is the value of ID Q close it as you can see here on writing X path. It has highlighted that element which implies it was able to locate that element using this X path. Correct. So what is that X part doing? It says to find an input tag anywhere in the document. Double front slash implies anywhere in the document. OK, but it says it should have a property called ID and its value should be Q. So here we are not starting with the root of the document. That is the start point, but we are typing double front slash and it says anywhere in the document to find an input tag. So we must be having multiple input tags in the document. Remember I had told you in the beginning that X path consists of a path expression. So this is a path expression and here we are interested in the input tag that has the ID attribute whose value is Q. So by using this we are able to uniquely identify this element. So single front slash at the start of the X path instructs X path engine to look for an element starting from the root node like you know you can write it in this way. I'll show you how. So here if you have to write from the start, then you have to write from HTML, then your body. It is the immediate class, so you have to choose it as one. And next you have to write your div. That will be one, two and three div of three. Correct. And again from there you have to jump into your next div. That will be your immediate div. That will be your div of two. So you have to go on writing this in this way and then you will be arriving at this output. It will be too lengthier and as well it will be very complex to write. So that's why we use a double front slash followed by your input. That will be your tag name and followed by whatever your attribute and the value of attribute. Very simple, correct? So I believe that you was now able to make out the difference between single front slash and double front slash. So now let me reiterate it. So single front slash at the start of X path instructs X path engine to look for an element starting from the root node and double front slash at the start of X path instructs X path engine to search for matching element anywhere in the XML document. So that's nothing but your types of X path. That is your absolute and relative X path. Absolute X path is a direct way to find an element, but the disadvantage of the absolute X path is that if there are any changes made in the X path of the element, then that X path gets failed. Correct? So this is your absolute X path syntax example. I just showed you how and relative X path starts from the middle of the HTML DOM structure. It starts with a double forward slash, which means it can search the element anywhere at the web page. Correct? So what does a single slash means if it is used inside the X path? So let's see that now. So let's take an example. Now I will open Amazon.com website and navigate through the search box to locate it. Again, right click on the search box, click inspect. So this search box has input tag and it also has different attributes like type, class, placeholder name, etc. So we will use one of these attributes along with the tag name to locate this element. Again, click on the elements, choose Control F. And now we will start writing the X path. I'll give double front slash input. OK, now I have used double forward slash, which means anywhere in this page. So now I need an input tag, so I have used input. But you can also think there might be many input tags in the document, correct? 
Okay, I understand we have many input tags in the document, but I'll type some condition. So I want a class attribute that will be your ID whose value is this. So now let's see how to do that. At your attribute name will be your ID and this will be your value of the attribute. So as you can see it has highlighted the element meaning it was able to find the element. Now let me traverse this document differently. I'll write using absolute xpath HTML. As you can see here on writing the absolute xpath it was able to locate the element. So now let me tell you how I have traversed it. First HTML of one. Okay one indicates the first node. So next this is the immediate body tag. So I have given it as one that is the first child and next it has a div tag that will be your div of one and after the div of one it has header. So this will be your header even this is the immediate first child. So I have named it as header of one again. It has the immediate div that will be your this div and again that div again consists of its immediate div that will be your this one which has a ID value of nav belt. And after that you have div of three which implies the third child of that div one two and three. Okay again this div has a immediate child that will be your div of one and that has a form and as you can see here it is the immediate child of this div which implies it is the first element correct and after this form of one you have a div again. So one two three this will be your div. So this will be your div of one again. And after that you have an input tag correct sounds very complex right to write an xpath using absolute xpath query. So that's why we use relative xpath to locate elements in the web page. I hope you understood this. Basically this is all about absolute and relative xpath. Now let's move further and understand xpath functions. Automation using selenium is a great experience. It provides many way to identify an object or an element on the web page. But sometimes we do face the problems in identifying objects on a page which has same attributes. So when we get more than one element which have same attribute name like multiple checkboxes with same name and same ID or more than one button having the same name and same IDs. In these cases there is no way to distinguish between those elements and in such cases we face problem to instruct selenium to identify a particular object on a web page and that's where xpath functions comes into picture. Now let's see what are the different types of functions that are supported by xpath and how they are used. As you can see here I have listed down three functions but in actual there are many. So now I will explain you few important functions that are widely used in selenium. So first let's start with contains. Contains is a method which is used in an xpath expression when the value of an attribute changes dynamically for example login information this method comes into use. So here it can locate the web element with the available partial text. So let's see how again I will open amazon.com and choose some image say this one and I'll give inspect. So what's next as you can see here in the source code snippet for this particular image it has an image tag followed by its attributes. Okay. Now say I want to locate the source attribute using this value in my xpath query. So how do I do that? I will start with double forward slash and I will use my tag name as img because it contains of image and then I'll use my select attribute and I'll write src and I will paste this value that will be my value of the attribute. Okay as you can see here it was able to locate this element correct. Now you all might think this xpath is too long. Well yes this is one of the reason for constructing partial xpath query as src attribute contains URL in its value. So there are chances that value may change or some part of the URL may change. So let's take another example. Suppose say we open login page of the website say xyz.com and it has a button and its attribute has some value like 987 submit 1 to 3 and on refreshing the page its value may change to something like 9987 submit etc. So the bottom line is part of the attribute value is static while the rest is dynamic. In such cases we would go for partial xpath query. Now let's reconstruct the query and here we will use partial values. For example say 
sprites. We'll use the sprites and see how to write a XPath query using functions that is contains. Okay, I'll use tag name as IMG and I'll use contains function. And here I'll use my select attribute. And this SRC should contain value called as sprites. So within single quotes, I'll write sprites. So as you can see here, it located the element which contains the value sprites. Correct. So this is how you can use partial value and use contains function to search that value. Sounds simple. Now let's move further and understand one more XPath function that is starts with. This function is used to find a web element whose value of attribute changes on the refresh or on any dynamic operation on the web page. In this, we match the starting text of the attribute that is used to locate an element whose attribute has changed dynamically. For example, on the web page, ID of a particular element changes dynamically, like ID1, ID2, ID3, but the text remains same. Now, Let's demonstrate starts with function using the same object and here instead of contains we'll have to change it to starts with. And here I will use alt attribute as you can see it has a value called shop men's athletic shoes. So what I'll do I'll copy and paste this value. So here it will locate the element that starts with this value that is this one. So if I keep only shop and discard the rest, it will show me four more choices that starts with shop. Correct. And if I give the full name, it shows me only one unique element. So this is how starts with function is used to locate particular element that starts with so and so value. Now let's see one more function text. So this expression is used with the text function to locate an element with the exact text. Let's demonstrate and see how. Now see I want to inspect this order tab. So here is my condition. What it says go anywhere in this document. I don't care what tag it is, but what my condition is it should have a text whose value is orders. So basically it is asking me to locate this element. Correct. So now let's see how. So as you can see here, I'm starting it with asterisk which implies any tag simple. So now I'll write my text function. And I'm assigning the value as orders. So now it has highlighted the element which contains the text called orders. Simple. So basically, this is a usage of text function. Now we will see an example to use two functions together. For example, say I want to use contains and text together in one XPath. So let's see how to do that. I'll keep this same and I'll use contains function here. Okay. So basically this is how you can use two functions together in one single XPath. I'm telling go anywhere in this document and it should contain a text called orders. So as you can see here it was able to locate five elements. So this is one your script is one a href again you have one more here and you have one more here but it was not able to uniquely find because I have used this asterisk. Now if I want to make it as unique, I'll give it as a. So if it starts with a it was able to locate only one element which has orders. Now if I start with span again, it will locate three elements which has element that is starting with span. So basically what I did here was I used contains and then passed first argument as text function and I gave its value as orders. I did that because we can have a partial search. As you might notice here, we have not used ampersand because text is a function and not an attribute. So this is how you can use two XPath functions together. Now we will see how to locate elements using OR operation. Say you have two input tags whose attributes are different. So here I'll show you how to do that. Bored of using Amazon website, right? Close it. So now I will open Yahoo Mail. So let's inspect this element now. As you can see here, it has input as its tag name and it has name called username and ID called login username. So using all operation, let's locate it. I'll start with my input that is my tag name and I'll give my name is equal to username. Close it. I'll use or operation in between pipe indicates your or operation and then again I'll start with the input tag name and give ID is equal to login username. Correct. 
so you can see it was able to locate the element. So this is how you can use or operation as well. Sound simple. So this is all about your XPath functions, your or operation using two XPath functions in the same XPath query, and that's all. Now we will see how to register the drivers for Chrome and Mozilla and how to send the keys to search the element using Eclipse. Okay, so I'll open my Eclipse. First, we'll see how to do it for Mozilla. So I have used class called custom XPath. And inside the main method, I have set my system property and I have a Geeko driver, which is for Mozilla. And I have mentioned the path of the Geeko driver where I have saved this. And I'm creating a new web driver called driver, and that will be my Firefox driver. And using driver.manage, I'm maximizing the window and deleting all the cookies, and as well passing the timeouts as well. And now driver.get, I'm trying to pass the URL of eBay.com. Okay, and here by using find element by X path, I'm passing the search box value and I'm sending the keys called guitar. I'll show you from where I got this X path. So in this eBay.com, I'll right click over here and click on inspect. As you can see here for ID attribute, it has a value called GH and hyphen AC. So that's where I got this value and I have written a relative X path. And I'm trying to send the keys called guitar, which implies it should redirect to the eBay website and search for guitar. Correct. And for search icon, I'm again using driver or find element by XPath and trying to search this one. Click over here, inspect. So ID will be your GH button. Correct. So this is how I got my XPath and I have registered my drivers and I'm using search icon dot click to search it. Okay. Save this program. Run it and see how it works. So it got redirected to Mozilla and it entered the value called guitar and you can see it searched guitar on your Mozilla Firefox browser. Cool. Sounds very interesting, right? So this is how using the set property you can register your Geeko drivers that is your web drivers and then using driver.get you can pass the URL of the particular website and then find the elements and click on search. Cool. Now let's see the same thing with Chrome. So here you have Chrome driver instead of Firefox. I will make it as Chrome driver. Okay, that's the only change I'll be doing here. I'll come in rest of the Mozilla part and I'll just run the Chrome part. Again, run it. Now the same thing will happen, but it will open in Chrome. So again, it launched your Chrome browser, type guitar, and it searched. So you can see here you have various brands of guitar with various prices, everything. For Chrome driver, you should install your Chrome driver, and for Mozilla, you need to install Geeko driver. Simple. Now I hope you got a clear idea as how it works. So now, do you wish to learn a trick to find X path of a particular element? Very simple in Google Chrome. You just have to type Chrome path. Click on the very first link and here you'll be having an option called add to Chrome. So you have to just add it when you open your inspect and click on Chrome path. You can see absolute X path and relative X path as well for your particular element or your particular tag. So again, even if I click on here and inspect, I'll get my Chrome path. So this is my relative. And this is my absolute crow path. So when you inspect any element here, you can see the crow path, which gives you both relative and absolute crow path of that particular element. Sounds much easier, right? What are Selenium weights? Weights help the user to troubleshoot issues while redirecting to different web pages. And this is achieved by refreshing the entire web page and reloading the new web elements. At times, there can be Ajax calls as well. Thus, a time lag can be seen while reloading the web pages and reflecting the web elements. And users are often found navigating through various web pages back and forth. Thus, navigate methods or command provided by the web driver helps the user to simulate the real time scenarios by navigating between the web pages with reference to the web browser's history. So here you can see implicit and explicit weights are the type of the weights and in case of implicit weight we can use driver.manage.timeouts and under explicit weights it will be web driver weight and thread.sleep as well. So why do we need weights in Selenium? 
Most of the web applications are developed using Ajax and JavaScript. When a page is loaded by the browser, the elements which we want to interact with may load at different time intervals. Not only it makes this difficult to identify the elements, but also if the element is not located, it will throw an element not visible exception. And using weights, we can resolve this problem. So let's consider a scenario where we must use both implicit and explicit weights in our test. Assume that implicit wait time is set to 20 seconds and explicit wait time is set to 10 seconds. Suppose we are trying to find an element which has some expected conditions, that is your explicit wait. If the element is not located within the time frame defined by the explicit wait, it will use the time frame defined by the implicit wait before throwing an element not visible exception. So these are the situations where weights are essential in automation testing. Now, Let's move further and understand different types of weights. The most widely used weights are implicit and explicit weights. Fluent weight is also a type of a weight, but it is not preferable for real-time projects. First, let's understand what are implicit weights. The implicit weight will tell to the web driver to wait for a certain amount of time before it throws a no such element exception. And here, the default setting is zero. Once we set the time, Web driver will wait for that time before throwing an exception. So on the screen you can see the syntax that is driver.manage.timeouts followed by implicitly wait and you will be passing timeout that is in seconds. For example, say you declare an implicit wait with the time frame of 10 seconds. So it implies that if the element is not located on the web page within the time frame, it will throw an exception. So let's see how. I will launch my Eclipse and create a class. Very first step is to launch Chrome driver or Geekko driver based on the type of your web browser. I'm going to use Chrome driver because I'll be using Google Chrome throughout my demo. So that's the reason I'll first launch my Chrome driver. I'll give like system.set property. So this is how I will launch my Chrome driver and create the object of a new Chrome driver. Next, let's write the weights for the program. As I have already mentioned, page timeout is a type of an implicit weight. So I will be using that to write my implicit weight now. So using driver.manage, I'll maximize the window and delete all the cookies first. And now using driver.manage.timeout, I'm using a page load timeout for 40 seconds. Okay, you can see here I have given the timeout as 40 seconds, which implies the maximum wait time is 40 seconds for the particular element to load or to arrive at the output. For example, it gives a particular web element at least 40 seconds to load and then perform some action on it. One important thing to note here, all types of weights, whether implicit, explicit or fluent weights, they are all dynamic weights. So what are dynamic weights? Consider the situation where you have given timeout as 40 seconds, which is the maximum time allocated. If the element will get loaded in 5 seconds, then the rest of 35 seconds will be ignored. It won't wait till 40 seconds and that's why all weights are set to be dynamic weights. One more syntax here. I will use driver.manage.timeouts.implicitly wait. Okay. And again here, I'll pass timeout for 20 seconds and this will be time unit.seconds. So I will copy and paste this over here. So when I write this syntax, it says driver, please manage the timeouts of implicitly wait for 20 seconds. Implicitly wait is applied globally. It means it is available for all the web elements throughout the driver instance, which implies if the driver is interacting with 100 elements, then implicitly wait is applicable to all the 100 elements. So let's consider the example of locators and let's try to locate a web element by XPath. First, what I will do is I will navigate through yahoo.com and I will inspect this. So you can see here it has a ID whose value is login username. So if I want to write a XPath over here, I'll just say input because it starts with my input and then I will write my XPath. Then I will use select attribute and say id is equal to login username, correct? So on writing this x path, it has highlighted the element which implies it was able to locate this particular text box that is enter your email. 
Now, I will write this X path in Eclipse and try to perform some action on this box. Let's see how. So first I'll use driver.get and give link of Yahoo mail. I will use one more method that is element by X path. And this is the X path. And after this, I am sending the keys that is edureka at the rate yahoo.com. Okay. Now, after I send keys over here, I want to wait for 3 to 4 seconds and then press the next button. Okay. So, how I will do that? Here, I will use thread.sleep of 3 seconds. That will be 3000. Okay. Now, I will inspect on this next button. And you can see here it has login sign in as its ID. So I'll just replace it over here. See again, writing this X path, it highlighted the element, which means it was able to locate this next button. I'll copy this. And again, I will write element by X path. And as it is a button, I'll use click. Because for buttons, we cannot send any values. So I will use click, but if it is a text box, we can send the keys and perform action. Simple. Now save this program. So you can see here, I have declared implicitly wait of 20 seconds. Okay. So it means unless and until the X path will locate the particular text box and send the keys, it will wait for 20 seconds. But after 20 seconds, if it is not able to locate, it will throw exception like element not found exception. Correct. So let's see what happens. Save this and run the program. So as you can see, it entered edureka at the rate yahoo.com, waited for three seconds, and then pressed on next button. Correct? So now what happened, even if you have declared implicitly wait for 20 seconds, the element was loaded within three or four seconds, and it ignored the rest of 16 or 17 seconds. So that is why it is called as dynamic wait. Sounds simple? So this is how you can use implicitly weights. Now let's move further and understand what are explicitly weights and when they are used. To understand the explicit weights in Selenium Web Driver, you should know the requirement why we use weight statement in programs. So I will give you a couple of examples in which you can get a complete idea why weights are important. So condition is like I have a web page which has some login form. And after login, it takes a lot of time to load account page or home page. This page is dynamic. It means sometimes it takes 10 seconds to load the home page and sometimes it takes 15 seconds and so on. In this situation, explicit wait will wait until the specific title or page is not present. So one more condition. Assume you are working on travel application and you have filled the web form and clicked on the submit button. Now you have to wait until complete data is not loaded or specific data is not loaded. In this case, again we can use explicit wait in which we can give wait till specific or set of elements are not loaded. So these are some of the scenarios where explicitly wait is more essential. So explicit wait is a concept of dynamic wait which will wait dynamically for specific conditions. It can be implemented by the web driver class. So let's consider an example and see how to use explicitly weights. So instead of this, I will use facebook.com. Okay. So I'll copy this link and replace it over here. First, I will create all the elements that is your first name, surname, your mobile number, everything, and then we'll perform some action on that. So I'll give web element first name is equal to driver or find element by name, and this will be my first name because here, if I inspect this text box, you can see it has a name attribute whose value is first name. And similarly for this one as well, it has a name attribute whose value is last name. So that's the reason I'm using a name locator and locating first name and last name. Okay. Now I will not perform any actions like send keys or click. Instead, I will create a utility or have one generic function. That is one function which is available for all the elements to provide explicitly weight. So here I'll write my function. Here I have written my own send keys method. This method will enter the value in a particular text field, but internally it is providing explicit weight also. Now let's check the syntax of explicit weights. In explicit weight, we don't have any keyword as such, but for implicit weight, you can see here you have a 
keyword like implicitly wait. So explicit wait is always provided by web driver wait. So web driver wait is actually an explicit wait. Here I am creating an object of web driver wait in which I am passing driver and timeout. Here timeout is of integer type. And then in this particular object, we have a method called until and the condition is visibility of the element. Means until the visibility of the element or locator, it should wait. That will be declared within a class called expected conditions. That is this. Here I am asking the driver to wait for some particular timeout of 20 seconds until expected condition visibility of the element. Means if the condition is satisfied, only then you can apply send keys to the method. Here in the send keys method, I am passing driver, web element, timeout, and string value. Now say I want to enter my first name and last name. Let's see how. So I'll come here. So now I will use the send keys method and pass driver, first name, timeout, that will be 10 seconds for first name and the value that is Eddie breaker and next for last name. I have set the timeout that is 20 seconds and I've specified my last name. Now let's run the program and check the output. As you can see it launched Google Chrome and navigated through Facebook.com and entered first name and last name. Correct. So here it is not mandatory to set the explicit wait timeout to one particular value based on your requirement. You can change. This is the major advantage of explicit wait. But for implicit wait, once you have defined 10 seconds, it will be applicable to all the elements on the web page and you cannot change it. So again, if you want for mobile number and password, you can just click on this element, write the X path or locate it by name or ID and then proceed. Simple. Now, same thing for click also. So now I want to click on forgotten account. So I'll inspect this. You can see it is a link. That is the reason it starts with anchor tag followed by H reference and it has a text called forgotten account. So I'll copy this and paste it for a reference over here. Same like send keys. I will create one more method called click on which will be applicable for all the buttons. So I'll show you how to do that. Same thing here. Also we can pass web driver locator or your web element and timeout. As it is a button, we are not passing the value because we will click on the particular element and not send any values. So here I have an expected condition that is element to be clickable. So when this condition is satisfied, only then I have to perform some action. It's up to you as what kind of expected condition you wish to perform. So these are some of the expected conditions that is title contains URL to be URL contains element to be selected element to be clickable visibility of all elements etc. Now let's see how to use this click as I have shown. I want to paste this link text. So I will use this link text and use link text locator to locate the element. Okay, and I will set the timeout accordingly. So I will create one more web element called forgot account and use driver dot find element by link text and pass this value. So here I have created a web element called forgot account and using link text locator I'm passing this value and then I'm using this click on method and passing my driver my element and timeout. Okay, save it. Let's run the program and check the output. So you can see here it is redirecting you to find your account page which implies it was able to locate this forgotten account link and navigate it through the next page. Simple. So this is how it works. When you refresh the web page, some or the other part of the web element will change. That is, part of the web element in the web page is static and the rest is dynamic. That is, nothing but your AJAX, that is, asynchronous Java components. In such cases, you can use partial values to locate the elements on the web page. So when you want to write an explicit weight, you can use these two methods that is send keys and click on and automatically it will apply explicit weights on the action that you want to perform. And if you don't create these two methods, then for every element you need to write these lines and that makes your code lengthier. So it's better to use these methods and then perform some action on it. Now one more question arises. Do we need to use implicit and explicit weights together? No. Why? Because implicit weight is a global weight. 
Although it is a dynamic weight, it is not a good practice to use it. So you might think why? Because here you have implicit weight and you have given the time out as 20 seconds, correct? And again using explicit weight, you have given a time out for your first name that is 10 seconds. So it implies that for the particular web element, it will first wait for 20 seconds, that is your implicit weight. And then it will again wait for additional 10 seconds, that will be your explicit weight. As implicit weight is a global weight, it will be applied first and will be running in the background. Along with that, explicit weight will also be considered. If the element is found within 15 seconds, the rest 5 seconds will be ignored. But after that, again it has got an explicitly weight of 5 seconds. So as it leads to ambiguity, it is not recommended to use both the weights. Implicit weight is useful for small applications and not suitable for large applications. One more important thing here is you can override implicit weight means it will consider the latest value. Say you want to copy this and paste this after this web element and you want to give it 40 seconds. Simple. So when you change the value of implicit weight to 40 seconds, it will take the new value and it will ignore the old one. So that's what I meant by overriding. And in your program, you can change the implicit weight anywhere, anytime as it is a global weight. So this is how it works. Now let's understand difference between implicit and explicit weights. Implicit weight is applied to all the elements in the script. Explicit wait time is applied only to those elements which are intended by us. In case of implicit wait, we need not specify any expected condition on the element to be located. On the other hand, in explicit weights, we need to specify expected conditions on the elements to be located. And it is recommended to use implicit wait when the elements are located within the time frame that is specified in implicit wait. On the other hand, it is recommended to use Explicit weight when the elements are taking long time to load and also for verifying the property of the element like visibility of the element located, element to be clickable, element to be selected, etc. So these are the differences between implicit and explicit weights. Next, what are fluent weights? Fluent weight is used to tell the web driver to wait for a condition as well as the frequency with which we want to check the condition before throwing an element not visible exception. When using the fluent weight instance, we can specify the frequency with which fluent weight has to check the conditions defined and ignore the specific types of exception waiting like no such element exceptions while searching for an element on the web page and the maximum amount of time to wait for a condition. This is rarely used as it always forces the browser to wait for a specific time. As you can see in the syntax, Fluent weight uses two parameters that is timeout and polling frequency. So let's check an example. So in this, you can see here it has two parameters that is timeout and polling frequency. Okay. And in this syntax, we have taken timeout value as 30 seconds and polling frequency as one second. It implies the maximum amount of time that is 30 seconds to wait for a condition and the frequency one second to check the success or failure of a specific condition. If the element is located within this time frame, it will perform operations, else it will throw an element not visible exception. So in this program, I have used some Internet Hero KU app and dynamic loading. You can get it on the Google and using element by xpath i have written my text function and the value of the text function and use click method and i have created a object of fluent weight and gave timeout as 30 seconds and polling frequency as one and i'm ignoring no such element exception class so automatically what we'll do if it is present it will return hello world and using system.out.println i'm just trying to get the text okay save this program and run it I have to run it as test ng so that you'll get to know whether it was success or failure. So your test ng started and it launched Google Chrome and navigated through this. So it's loading the page that is hidden and it displayed hello world. Okay. As you can see here, it forced to wait until and unless it got loaded and displayed hello world. And that's the reason it is not preferable to use this fluent weights. As you can see here, test two that was run was one and the failures was also there. Okay, 
So again, it depends on the way how you use it. So this is how it works and that was all about fluent weights. What are alerts in Selenium? Alerts are basically an interface between the current web page and the user interface. It can also be defined as a small message box which displays on screen notification to give the user some information or ask his permission to perform some kind of operation. It may also be used for warning purpose. For example, while testing an application, you might get a pop up or a notification, but you may not know how to handle it when you're testing the web page. So this video is everything you need to know about handling alerts in Selenium. So let's move on and understand what are the different types of alerts. There are a few common types of alerts that you might get while testing an application. They are basically a simple alert, a prompt alert and a confirmation alert. Let's understand them in detail. First, we'll see what is a simple alert. This simple alert displays some information or a warning on the screen. For example, you get an alert while testing warning you to fill the particular section and the button which helps in closing the alert message. OK, so this is how a simple alert looks like. Now let's see what is a prompt alert. A prompt alert asks for some input from the user and you can enter the text using the function called send keys. So this is how a prompt alert looks like. It asks for your input and it provides two options saying accept that is OK or cancel. So this is about the prompt alert. Now let's move ahead and understand what is a confirmation alert. This confirmation alert asks for your permission to perform some kind of operation. That is, for example, like I mentioned in the prompt alert that provides with two options or buttons, namely OK and cancel. After you enter the message in the text box provided, you can either click on the OK button or the cancel button. So this alert basically gets you confirmation about the action to be performed. This is everything you need to know about the different types of alerts guys moving ahead with this module. We'll understand how to handle window pop ups and the alerts by taking a look at a real time example. Alerts are basically the pop up boxes that take your focus away from the current browser and it forces you to read the alert message. So you need to perform some actions like accepting the alert or dismissing the alert box to resume back to the browser. So to handle these alerts in Selenium, we have a few methods, so we'll discuss them one by one. While running the web driver script, the driver control will be on the browser even after the alert is generated, which means that the driver control will be behind the alert pop up. In order to switch to the alert pop up, we use the command driver dot switch to alert. So once we switch the control from the browser to the alert window, we can use the alert interface methods. So we'll discuss these alert interface methods now. First, we have the dismiss method, which helps in clicking the cancel button of the alert. So you can do that using this command driver dot switch to alert, which helps in switching to the alert box and dismisses the alert function. Next, we have the accept method, which helps in clicking the OK button of the alert. So this can be done adding the accept at the end of the command. And then we have the get text method which helps in capturing the alert message. So this can be done using this command driver dot switch to alert dot get text. The last method is the send keys. This is used to send some data to the alert box. That is you can manually enter the text to the alert box. So this can be done using driver dot switch to alert dot send keys and specify the text that you want to add. So now let's understand the working of alerts in Selenium. For that, we require certain prerequisites like the latest version of Java installed in our system, the IDE on which we can perform some actions. So in this case, I'm going to be considering working on the Eclipse IDE because it is user friendly and it is easy to implement the Java projects. So first I'll check if the Java libraries are present. So I'm going to click on the command prompt and type Java hyphen version. OK, so this is the version of Java installed in my system and now let's take a look at the Eclipse IDE. I have the latest Eclipse IDE guys, so just going to click on it. Launch the workspace. 
Okay, so this is the Eclipse workspace guys. So first we need to create a new Java project. So for that I'm going to click on file. Click on new and Java project. I'm going to name this as selenium alerts. Click on finish. So you can see that the folder is being created by the name selenium alerts. I'm just going to click on the drop down. You can find the Java libraries present and a source field. So now we need to add the selenium jar files to this project. So for that I'm going to right click on my project. And go to build path and configure build path. Selenium jar files can be easily downloaded online. So I already have the jar files. So I'm just going to. Add it. Okay, apply and close. You can see that another folder by the name reference libraries is created, which holds all the Selenium jar files. In this project, I'm going to be testing a web page that is designed by Edureka. Okay, so it's an HTML page. So I'm just going to click on this. So this is the web page that we're going to test. So you can see that it is a customized web page where you can find Edureka courses, YouTube channel, Edureka blog, community, display alert function, pop up. So we'll be discussing how to handle alert or a pop up while testing any application. So first, let's go back to our project. I'm going to create a new class and call it alerts. And click on finish. The first thing you need to do when you're working on Selenium is to set the browser driver. In this case, I'm going to be considering working on the Chrome driver. So I'm going to set the system property to the Chrome driver. That is web driver dot Chrome dot driver. And the second argument holds the path in which it is located. Let's see where it is located. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this path, go back to my project. And do note that you need to add the extension Chrome driver dot exe to specify that it's an executable file. Now we need to instantiate the browser driver with the new Chrome driver. So for that, I'm going to create an object of the web driver and call it a driver and instantiate it with the new Chrome driver. As you can see, it throws an error here. So just mouse over it. And import the web driver instances. The same goes with the Chrome driver as well. And once we are done with this, we need to get the URL of the web page that we want to search for. So I'm going to try driver.get. In our case, the URL is this. So I'm just going to copy this URL and go back to my project and paste it. So once we get the URL of the web page, we need to find the boxes that is the display alert box and the pop up box. So let's go to our web page. We need to click this alert box in order to get this alert. So it says this is a selenium alert box. So this is the text message that we want to print and also accept the alert. Okay. And the pop up which says this is a selenium pop up and close it. How to perform these actions using Selenium? So first we need to inspect this display alert box to inspect. Okay, you can see that the ID is present, which is one of the element locators in Selenium. So I'm just going to copy this ID and go back to my project and write the corresponding code. Just driver dot. Find element by. I'm going to find it by the ID. And specify the ID over here. As it is a button, we need to click the button. So once I click the alert box, I'm going to pause the execution for a few seconds so that you can see that the alert was clicked. Sleep. As it is in milliseconds, I'm going to consider it as 3000. And you can see that it throws an error. So add throws declaration. Okay. And now we need to give the control to the alert window. Let me show you how. So once you click on this button, 
this particular web page becomes inactive. As you can see, it can't click any of the links here until and unless this alert box is clear. See, this is clickable now. In order to switch the control to this alert box, I'm going to create an object of this alert and link it to the driver to switch to the alert window. So you can see that it throws an error here. So just import the alert packages. So once you're done with this, now say if you want to get the text that is there in the alert window. So to do that, I'm going to consider the string function here and call it alert message and driver dot switch to the alert and get the text. So this command helps in getting the text that is present in the alert window. Now say you want to print this text message. So to do that, I'm going to print this system dot out dot print ln. I'm going to print this and pause the execution for a few seconds. So first let's run this program. OK, you can see that this was quick and I'm going to close this. This is going to print. This is a selenium alert box. So this was quick, right guys? So in order to pause the execution for a few seconds, I'm going to add the thread command after the page is loaded. Sleep. For three seconds. Now say you want to maximize the screen. So first I'm going to type the object of the web driver manage the window and maximize so this command helps in maximizing the window so let's execute this program maximizes it after three seconds it is going to click now let's take a look at the output it says this is a selenium alert box now say you want to click on the OK button that is present. How do you do that using Selenium? So I'm going to consider the object of the alert that is alert dot accept. So this method is helping us to click the OK button on the alert window. Now I'm going to save this program and run it. Maximizes it after three seconds clicks on the display alert. And after three seconds, it clicks on the accept button. Hope this was clear to you guys. Now, how do you handle the pop up button? Let's take a look at our web page. Now, let's see how you can handle a pop up while testing an application. So, I'm just going to click on this. So, you can see another window is being embedded within the current window. So, how to handle this while testing an application? So, let's inspect this pop up button first. OK, you can see that the ID is present, which is one of the element locators in Selenium. So I'm just going to copy this ID and go back to my project and write the corresponding code. So first I'm going to add the thread command so that it pauses the execution for a few seconds before the other function starts. And next I'm going to find. The element. By its ID and specify the ID over here and it is a button. So I'm going to click the button. OK, so let's go back to our web page. So once you click this button, the window pops up to handle this window. I'm going to use the mouse hover function so that you can cancel this. I'm going to create the object of the robot class. I think most of you are familiar with the robot class. A robot class mainly helps in handling the mouse and the keyboard functions. So in this case, I'm going to be considering the mouse functions like the mouse press mouse move and mouse release functions. So first I'm going to create a robot class and then instantiate it with the new robot. So we need to import the robot packages and it throws declaration. OK, the AWT exceptions. Now we need to move to the particular location on the web page. When you click this, you need to move the mouse button here. 
mouse move function works with the axis that is X and Y axis. So I'm going to specify the Y axis as 5 or 10 and the X axis as 500 or a 400. So let's see how this can be done. Robot dot mouse move. So I'm going to be considering the X axis as a 400 and Y axis as a 5. Let's see where this comes up. Run this program. Maximizes it, clicks on the alert, clicks on accept, and clicks on the pop up button. The axis is correct, so I'm going to just perform the mouse press and mouse release functions now. Considering the object of the robot, that is robot dot mouse press. Okay, it's input event dot button one down mask. After this, I'm going to pause the execution for two seconds and I'm going to release the mouse. That is mouse release input event dot button dot mask. And after this, I'm going to pause the execution for the same two seconds and I'm going to quit the driver execution. So let's see how this is going to work. Maximizes the page, clicks on the display alert, handle goes to the display alert function and clicks on OK and then pauses for a few seconds and then clicks on the pop up. I hope this was clear to you guys. So this is how you handle an alert or a pop up in Selenium. So let's move ahead and understand the final topic, the application areas where the alerts can be used. Like I mentioned earlier, alerts are the commands that display certain warning messages. These alerts do not pop up in all the web applications. To be precise, the alert functions are used mainly in the field of banking and the e-commerce websites like Amazon, Flipkart, Snapdeal and so on. Let's understand what is exception. An exception is an event which occurs during the execution of the program that disrupts the normal flow of the program's instructions or in simple words any issue which makes your test case stop in the course of execution is known as an exception. When an exception occurs the normal flow of program halts and the exception object is created. The program then tries to find someone that can handle the race exception. The exception object contains a lot of debugging information such as method hierarchy, the line number where the exception occurred, the type of the exception, etc. So when you start working with Selenium Web Driver, you will come across different exceptions based on the code you write. The same code sometimes work properly and sometimes it will not. You will see some or the other exceptions when you execute your scripts. So whenever you develop any scripts, you will try to give the best quality of the code that works perfectly fine. But unfortunately, sometimes exceptions come as side effects to the scripts that we are developing and that fails. And that's why handling an exception is very important. So you can see here the flow of the exception handling wherein first problem occurs, then it creates an exception, throw an exception and finally handle it. Simple. Having understood this, Let's move further and look at the exceptions hierarchy. All exceptions and error types are subclasses of class throwable, which is the base class of the hierarchy. One branch is heeded by exception. This class is used for exceptional conditions that user programs should catch. Another branch that is error are used by the Java runtime systems to indicate the errors that are associated with. So basically under exceptions there are two types. One is checked and the other one is unchecked. So let's see the difference between these two exceptions that is checked versus unchecked exception. So a checked exception means it is the exception that is checked by the compiler at the time of compilation and an unchecked exception occurs at the time of execution. So basically checked exceptions are called as compile time exceptions and unchecked exceptions are called as runtime exceptions. So talking about the checked exceptions. These exceptions cannot be simply ignored. The programmer should handle these exceptions in order to maintain the normal flow of execution. Whereas runtime exceptions can be ignored and there won't be any much difference in the flow of execution of the program. 
So this is the main difference between the checked and unchecked exceptions. Now let's move further and understand the basic example of a selenium exception. So this is how the structure of an exception looks like. You will create a class and inside the main method you will write a try block wherein you will write the code that can raise exception and inside the catch block what you will do you will write the code that has to execute that is the code that raise an exception will be included in the try block that is in the try block the code throws an exception and later to continue with the normal execution flow it will be handled in the catch block simple I'll demonstrate the exact working and how the try and catch block works in the next few minutes. For now, let's move further and see the different types of exceptions. So these are some of the types of exceptions. First one, web driver exception. This exception comes when we try to perform any action on the non-existing driver. Say you have a Chrome driver, but you are trying to perform action on a Mozilla Firefox driver that is Geeko driver, then this exception will be raised. Next, no such element exception. This exception is thrown when the web driver does not find the element in the DOM structure. That is, if you are not able to locate a particular element, then it will say no such element exception. That is, that element is not present. That is the reason it will throw no such element exception. Next, no such frame exception. So, say you want to perform an action that is switching between the frames, and you are not able to do that because the child frame is not present or Parent frame is not able to navigate to the child frame. In such cases, frame exception will be raised. That is, no such frame exception will be raised. Next, we have no alert present exception. So, this exception is basically when we try to perform an action that is either accept or dismiss, which is not required at a required place, it throws an exception. Next, we have timeout exception. So, this exception is thrown when a command does not complete or it does not complete the task in a given amount of time. Say you have declared implicitly wait for 10 seconds and also you have given explicitly wait for 5 seconds and if the page is not able to load within that particular time frame, then it says timeout exception. Now let's move further and understand how an exception is thrown and how to handle all these different five types of exceptions with the help of an example. So first I have created a class called exception handling. And inside my main method, I have first launched my Chrome driver. That is a Chrome driver because I want the Chrome driver to launch my Google Chrome and navigate through a particular given website link. So that is the reason the very first step that I do is I launch my Chrome driver. And this is the path where I have saved my Chrome driver. And next, I'm simply navigating through Google.com. And I'm using thread.sleep to sleep for 2000, that is 2 milliseconds. And now I'm finding an element by name that is something like fake dot click now this element is not present so what it will do it will throw an exception called as no such element exception obviously because this thing is nowhere present in the google.com so that is a reason it will throw now let's see how it will throw the exception you can see chrome driver launched google chrome navigated through google.com and nothing is happening why because exception is being raised here so you can see it throwed an exception telling no such element that is unable to locate the element. Yes, exactly. It's telling method name the name that is my name is my identifier that is my method and selector is fake. So it's not able to find any element over here. Now say I want to handle it. How will I do that? Okay. Now say I want to handle the exception that it throwed. So what I'll do. I'll use the try block and catch block. So in the try block, I'll write the code that will throw an exception. So you remember this code itself throwed an exception telling it's not able to find a method called name and a selector called fake. So I will write it inside my try block. So I will catch an exception called no such element exception E and inside that I will print element is not found and hello also. And again outside the try block. I want to check whether the normal flow of the execution is being carried or not. So that is the reason what I am doing. I'm again printing a statement here even outside the try catch block simple. Now let's run and check the output. So again Chrome driver launched Google Chrome navigated through Google.com and now we'll see what happened. 
Did it throw the exception? No, it just said whatever is there in the catch block that is element is not found and it printed hello two times because first time inside the catch block and the second time outside try catch to ensure that the normal flow of the execution is not interrupted. Yes, this is how you can handle the exceptions. So now we learned about the no such element exception. Now let's move further and see the other exceptions as well. Before that, let me tell you how to handle an exception. That is, what are the various methods to handle exceptions? So we have try, catch, throw, throws, and finally. So these are the five different methods to handle an exception. So talking about the try, as you already saw, it is used to specify a block where we should place an exception code. Simple, just now you saw how we did that. Next, catch. This block is mainly used to handle the exception. So whatever exception is thrown by the try block will be handled in this catch block. Simple. Next we have throws. This is used to throw an exception. I'll show you how this will work as well. So basically throws is used to throw the exception. So even after handling an exception in the catch block, if you try to throw the particular exception, it will obviously throw. No matter whether catch has handled it or not, it will throw an exception despite of handling it. Next we have throws. This is used to declare an exception. Suppose say I am using something like thread dot sleep or something. If I do not declare the exception, for example, say interrupted exception, it will not let us to continue with the normal flow of the execution. So it is a must that you should declare an exception using throws whenever you are using some statements like thread dot sleep or something as such. Next you have finally. This is used to execute the important code of the program. Suppose assume that you have handled an exception using try catch, but even though it's not getting handled and you also have some important code to execute. In that case, you will use finally block to make sure that the important part of the code is always executed. No matter what, either the exception is handled, not handled anything, the finally block code will always get executed. So that's the main speciality of this. Now I hope you got a clear idea regarding try, catch, throw, throws and finally let's see along with an example. Okay, now let me consider the same example and tell you one thing. Okay, now that you know I have handled an exception. So there is no disruption in the flow of execution. Now I will do one thing. I will use throw of fees that is I'm throwing an exception irrespective of the catch block is handling exception. It will still throw the exception. That is this one. Why? Because I want to throw the exception. Very simple. Let's check the output. So again, Google Chrome was launched. So you can see here first it printed element is not found and hello as well. After that, as I'm using throw a fee, that is, I'm throwing an exception, it said no such element. That is unable to locate this particular element. Correct? So it's throwing a complete exception of this irrespective of whether the catch block has handled the exception or not. If I use throw it will still throw the exception. So that's how throw is used. And as I have already told throws is used to declare the exception. I'm using thread dot sleep here and if I remove this you can see there's an error. So what's the error? It's telling to add throws declaration that will be interrupted exception. So this is how throws is used to declare the interrupted exception. Now say you have handled the exception and you're also throwing the exception. Okay, now let's see how the no alert present exception will be raised. So now what I'm doing here, I'm just navigating through google.com and inside the try blog, I'm simply trying to switch to an alert and trying to accept it. As I have mentioned you before, accept and dismiss are the alerts if it is being used at the wrong place, it will throw an exception. And though I'm handling it in the catch block, telling no alert present exception, and I'm printing the stack trace. Though I'm catching it, it will still throw an exception. Let's see the output. Okay, so you can see here that exception was being thrown and it said no such alert. So this is how this exception is thrown. If you want to handle it, you can again handle it with the help of try catch. That's so simple. Next, we will see no such frame exception. 
Here I'm doing nothing. I'm simply switching to a window and I'm closing the driver. Let's run the program and check the output. It will obviously say no such window exception. Yes, you can see that. It's telling no such window. So these are some of the types of exception. Again, if you want to switch to some frame that is not present, then again it will say no such frame exception. Now let's run and check the output. Yes, you can see that it's telling no frame element found by name or ID that is fail. Yes. So you learned about no such element exception, no such frame exception, no such window, no alert present. So basically these are the different types of exceptions that occurs when you're working with Selenium web driver and that should be handled in order to continue with the normal flow of the execution else it will disrupt the normal flow and the program execution will not be happening in a proper way and there are various methods to handle like you have try catch throw throws finally etc. What are listeners? Listeners are basically the ones who have the ability to listen to a particular event. Now say you want to share some secret with your friend. So you give him a call and start talking. Now what is the role of your friend in this case? He basically listens to everything that you want to share. The same goes with the Selenium web driver too guys. Selenium provides certain functionalities that help in listening to a particular event which in turn acts as an interface. Now I'll give you a formal definition of what are listeners. Listener is defined as an interface that modifies the default behavior of the program. As the name suggests, listeners listen to the event defined in the Selenium script and behave accordingly. It is used in Selenium by implementing an interface called listeners. The main purpose of using this listeners is to create logs and reports. So now that you've understood what are listeners and also understood why do we use them in Selenium? Let's move on to our next topic. That is what are the different types of listeners? There are basically two types of listeners guys the web driver listener and test ng listeners. First we'll discuss about what are web driver listeners. People who are working on Selenium must have craved for more logs from the web driver so that you can debug your scripts or maybe log more information about your test to the web driver, but you couldn't do it. How can you do that using Selenium? That's the whole point, right? There are two listeners, basically events, which help you in doing this process. They are event firing web driver and the web driver event listener. So first we'll see what is the web driver event listener. So this listener basically helps in capturing the web driver events. Now what is event firing web driver? This event firing web driver is a class that implements the web driver interface. So what does this mean? So this actually means that you will get all your regular web driver methods like find element by ID find element by tag name and in addition to this you'll also have two methods like the register method and the unregistered method where the register method will let you register the implementation process whereas the unregistered method will help you with the detaching process. So this is about the web driver listeners guys. So now let's try implementing a use case of this web driver listener. To do that we require the Java libraries and we also need an IDE where we can perform some actions. So I'm going to consider working on the Eclipse IDE because it provides various functionalities while working on a Java project. So in order to implement the web driver listeners, we need to check if the Java libraries are present. So to do that, I'm going to go to the command prompt and type Java version. This specifies the version of Java installed in my system. So I have Java 1.8. Okay, so after this we need an ID where we can perform the actions. So I have the latest Eclipse IDE guys because Eclipse provides all functionalities when we are working on a Java project. So you can see that I have the latest Eclipse IDE. So I'm just going to open this. Launch the process. Okay, so this is the Eclipse workspace guys and in this case we will try automating our official website edureka.co so that we can implement both the web driver listener as well as the test ng listeners 
and you can see that I've already created a project by the name listener web driver and I've also written the code guys because I think it will be useful for you guys when you try to understand the implementation process. So I'm just going to click on the drop down of this project. You can see that the Java libraries are present guys and I've also added the test ng libraries. This source field is where we are going to write our code. So I'm going to click on the drop down. So first I've created a package under which our classes reside. Okay, you can find two classes by name event capture and listener main class. So these both help in showing how web driver listener work. So there's another folder by name referenced libraries. So this contains all the selenium libraries. So first let's understand what happens in the event capture program. As you can see that I've created a class called event capture and implement the web driver event listener and once we've implemented the web driver event listener we have to implement the list of methods as shown in this code. Okay, these are all the functions that we are going to implement. I'm going to consider explaining you about one function guys here because all the methods here corresponds to an event. For example, the function called after navigate to which is called every time the navigate to page is completed. So all we have to do here is put some code inside these methods so that our code is executed every time when the page navigates to some other page. So ideally we would be adding our login statements here. Okay. And the first function here that is after change value of is called every time after you change the value of a specific element and after click on is called every time after you click the element. Likewise after navigate forward function which is called after you navigate to another web page after navigate function is called every time you want to navigate to another web page before change of value this function is called before you change the value of an element before click on before find by before navigate back before navigate forward before navigate refresh this helps in refreshing the web page before you navigate through it and before navigate to on exception if there are any exceptions occurring in the program. So this function is called after alert except after you finish accepting the alert this function is called after change of value. So these are all the basic constructors guys. So these are the functions that are going to be called every time you specify them in the main page. So what is their main agenda? So their agenda is to act as an interface between the element and the web page. So this is about the event capture program guys. Now let's move on to understand our main function. You can see that I've created a class called listener main class under which our main class resides. The first thing you need to do when you're working on selenium is to set the browser property. So in this case I'm going to consider working on the chrome driver. So I'm going to specify the name of the chrome driver and also specify the path in which it resides followed by the extension chrome driver.exe which has to be the executable form and after this I'm going to create an object of the web driver and call it driver and instantiate the new chrome driver. So this might throw an error guys all you have to do is just import the packages to the project and once this is done I'm going to create an object of the JavaScript executor. Now you might ask what is a JavaScript executor? JavaScript executor is an interface that helps to execute the JavaScript through the selenium web driver. After creating an object I'm going to link this JavaScript executor to the driver and after this I'm going to create an object of the event firing web driver. I think you guys have understood what is an event firing web driver. It is a class that implements the web driver interface. So I'm going to create an object of the same and instantiate it with the new event firing web driver and link the driver along with it. And after this we are going to create an object of our event capture program and call it eCapture and instantiate it with the new event capture. And once we're done with this we are going to register the event handler function with the object of the event capture using the register function guys which helps in registering the implementation process. And once this is done, I'm going to use the navigate to command which helps in navigating to a particular web page and also specify the URL of the web page you want to navigate it to. So I'm going to consider the object of the event firing web driver 
and navigate it to a web page edureka.co slash blog. So after you finish navigating through this page, say for example, you want to scroll down through a page. So let's navigate to our web page edureka.co slash blog. So this is the page that we want to navigate it to. Now say if you want to perform the scrolling function here, how would you do that using Selenium? So let's write a piece of code. So I'm going to consider the object of the JavaScript executed JS and execute script with the help of the function window dot scroll by. So this function helps in specifying the axis in which you want to scroll down through. The first attribute here contains the x axis value, which is zero. As you want to scroll down through the page, I'm going to consider the y axis, which is 400. And I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds using the thread command. So it is 3000 nanoseconds, which is basically three seconds. Let's say you want to find an element on the web page. So this is the web page. So I'm going to scroll down through the page. Say you want to search for this element software testing on the web page. How would you do that using Selenium? So I'm just going to right click on it. Click on inspect. It has a class name and this is the link text specified here. So I'm just going to copy this link text and go back to our project and write the corresponding code. I'm going to consider the object of the event firing web driver and find the element by the link text by specifying the value of the link text and also click the link text. Say after this you want to navigate to another web page. How would you do that using Selenium and that to the navigate to function? So I'm just gonna go to our web page. Okay. Now say I want to search for this courses. So I'm just gonna click on this courses and I want to navigate to this particular web page. So I'm just gonna copy this link and go back to my project and specify the URL of the web page. And say you want to navigate to the web page you were working on, that is the blog page. Now, how would you do that using the functions those were specified? So I'm going to consider the object of the event handler and specify the navigate back command. So this command helps in navigating back to our blog page. So once this is done, I'm going to quit the event handler function using event handler dot quit. So this particular command helps in ending the event firing web driver functions. And after this is done, we are going to unregister the events of the eCapture program. So to do that, I'm going to consider the object of the event firing web driver that is event handler and specify the unregistered function and specify what you want to unregister. Once these are done, I'm going to print end of the listener class to specify if the project is working properly or not. So this is our web driver listener. Now let's try to run this code. You can see that Chrome is being automated. It will first open the block page scrolls down clicks on the software testing. And navigates to all courses. And comes back to the page. And you can also see the command that is printed here end of listeners class. So this is how the web driver listener work in Selenium. Now let's understand what are the test ng listeners. Test ng listeners allow customizing of the test ng reports or logs. Now say you want to get the report of the functions or the programs that you've executed and the log functionalities of the program. So how would you do that using Selenium? So this test ng plays an important role in getting the reports or the logs of the programs or the processes that you've executed. And the main task of the test ng listeners is to change the default behavior of the methods and write the own implementation when the test fails or skips. There are many types of listeners which allows you to change the test ng's behavior. So I've noted down a few of them. I annotation transformer, I annotation transformer 2, I configuration listener and so on. These interfaces are used in Selenium to generate logs or to customize the test ng reports. But in this session, we'll mainly concentrate working on the I test listeners. So this I test listeners has the following methods. So it is on start, 
This method is called when any test starts in the process. On test success is called on success of any test case. On test failure is a method which is called on a failure of any test. On test skipped is called when you've skipped off any test. On test failed but within success percentage is called each time when the test fails but is within the success percentage. The last one on finish is called after all the tests are executed. Having understood what test ng listeners are, let's write a use case of the same. So to do that, we are again going to consider working on the Eclipse ID. So let's take a look at the Eclipse ID. So this was the web driver listener. So even in this case, I've already created a project and written the code so that you guys find it easy to understand. So I'm going to click on the drop down directly go to the source folder default package where you'll find two classes one by name listener test and the test cases so let's try understanding what the listener test program does so the first thing i'll do here is create a class called listener test that implements the i test listener and it might show up an error here and it will also suggest two quick fixes Select the first one which will say the add unimplemented methods which will help in adding multiple unimplemented methods without a body under which we are going to override the function on finish. I think you guys have understood what on finish function does. So once you call this on finish function, I'm going to pass the attribute I test context. So what does the I test context do? This class defines the test context which contains all information for a given test run. So I'm going to specify the result along with it and create a constructor of the same. And after this, I'm going to override another function called on start and also pass the attribute I context result. I'm going to do the same with the on test failed but within success percent. Okay. So we are going to override the functions here and also specify the attribute. So these functions are called when you want to start the process and end it. Now say you want a function to be called when it's failed or skipped or started. So we use the on test failure command and specify the attribute I test result which holds the result of the on test failure and I'm going to print this particular command which says the name of the test case failed by specifying the name of the test case that failed. After this say you want to specify the test that was skipped. So you can specify it using the on test skipped command. So this function helps in getting the name of the test case that was skipped and I'm going to print this command the name of the test case skipped by getting the name of the case by using this command result dot get name and after this say you want to call a function which specifies the start operation. So I'm going to use the on test start function which is called every time the test case starts. Okay, and under this I'm going to print this command here which specifies the test is started and after the execution of the program now say you want to specify the success of the test. So using this on test success function we can specify if the test case was successful or not. So this is our listener test program guys. Now let's move on and understand our main function that is test case. Now to implement these listeners into our regular project that is this test case project. There are two ways you can connect to the class and the interface. So the first method is by using the listeners annotation. So this help in linking the listeners of the listener test class to our test case class. So after this I'm going to create a class called test case class where I'm going to declare the web driver as public and create an object of the same and I'm going to write the annotation test which tells the J unit that the public void method attached can be run as a test case. So under which I'm going to create a function called login and I'm going to write this code inside this so that we can link the test ng listeners to this test case project. So the very first thing you need to do is set the browser driver. So you can see that I've considered the command system dot set property where I've mentioned the name of the web driver and also specified the path in which is located and then I'm going to instantiate the browser driver with the new Chrome driver and try to get the URL of the web page that we want to search. 
and we are also going to consider using the JavaScript executor to perform scrolling operation. Now say you want to maximize the web page. So I'm going to do that using this command driver dot manage dot window dot maximize. So let's go to our web page. Eureka dot go. Now say you want to search for this particular search box. So I'm going to inspect this search box. You can see that the ID is present, which is the CSS selector. So just copy this ID and go back to a project and specify the ID that is this repeat and specify the CSS selector using the find element function. Do note that CSS selector always starts with the symbol. So if the ID is present hash is used. So I've specified the hash before the value of the element and I'm going to send keys to that particular location that is test automation engineer masters program and click the search button. So let's go back to our web page. The search button is what we want to search for. So just click on it and inspect. So you can see that the class is present here. So I'm going to copy this class name and go back to my project and paste it. OK and click the search box. And after this I'm going to perform actions like scrolling down the web page and pausing. So you can see that there are three commands here which contains the object of the JavaScript executor and I'm going to consider the function window scroll by by specifying the axis in which it has to scroll. So I'm going to consider only the Y axis pause the execution using the thread command. OK. Now say you want to forcefully fail a test case. How can you do that using selenium? So we are going to consider the function test to fail which actually helps in the failure of a test case. So under this function I'm going to print this particular command. This method is to test the failure. I'm going to consider using the assert function here. That is we are asserting that the expression is true. If it is not true then we will display the message and the assertion will fail. In assert false you are asserting that an expression evaluates to false. Assert true specify the message and the value is false that is equal to assert false where the message and the value is false. So let's try running this program. Test ng detected. Okay, you can see that the login test case started has popped up here. Maximizes the screen. Searches for test automation engineer masters program. You can see that it is scrolling down through the page without clicking the button. So you can see the output of this guys. It says one test case is successful and one test case is passed. Let's look at the console. Okay. You can see that the message is printed here. You can also figure that out using this result. It says two test cases are run in total and one failure. That is, you can see that it navigated to the web page at Eureka.co, maximized the screen, searched for the search box, and sent keys to it, but it did not click on the search icon. And after that, it continued executing the scrolling function. So it specifies the failure of a test case and also specifies the success rate of the test case. So this is how test ng listeners work in selenium guys. Now let's move on and understand the major differences between the web driver listener and the test ng listeners. The test ng listeners are used to generate the reports for the test cases. It also helps in capturing the screenshot of the test cases failed and it also helps in performing events like on test failure on test skipped and on test success. Whereas the web driver listeners perform jobs like the test ng listeners of the logging and reporting functions, but it works differently with different events. So these are the major differences between the test ng listeners and the web driver listeners. Let's understand what is test ng. Test ng stands for test next generation. And it is an open source test framework that is inspired by JUnit and NUnit. Well, not just inspired, but an upgrade to those two frameworks. So you may ask, what is the upgrade over here? The upgrade with TestNG is that it provides additional functionality like test annotations, grouping, 
prioritization parameterization and sequencing techniques in the code which was not possible earlier besides managing the test cases even detailed reports of tests can be obtained by using test ng and there will be a summary displaying the test case that has failed along with the group which it was part of and the class that it falls under when bugs can be accurately located like this they can be fixed immediately to the relief of developers so these are the new features that was upgraded in the test ng now that you know what is test ng let's see why use test ng in selenium software developers from around the world will unanimously agree that writing code in test cases saves a good part of debugging time why that is because test cases helps in creating robust and error free code so how does it do that by breaking the entire code into smaller test cases and then by evaluating each of these test cases to pass or fail conditions you can create a error free code since selenium does not support execution of code in test cases you can use test ng for the same purpose and this is where test ng fits in the selenium framework also test ng helps in generating a report in a proper format that includes the number of test cases runs the number of test cases passed and the number of test cases failed and the tests that have been skipped as well and multiple test cases can be grouped more easily by converting them into test ng.xml file in this you can make the priorities as to which test cases should be executed first and which after that and using test ng you can execute multiple test cases on multiple browsers that is it supports cross browser testing and test ng can also be integrated with frameworks like maven jenkins etc so these are some of the reasons that depix why test ng is necessary and why it is used in selenium so you already know that test ng is inspired from junit but do you know how is it better than junit let's see that now so here annotations are easier to understand annotations in test ng are the lines of code that control how the method below them will be executed and they are always preceded by the at symbol so you can see you can set your priorities like you can set the priority to 0 and you can set the priority to 1 and also if you want to execute some of the test cases before the test that should be followed by at before annotation and the tests that have to be executing during the test with at test annotation and after the test if you want to close the driver or if you want to clean up the cache or something it can be done using the at after test annotation so this is how test cases can be grouped more easily and the annotations are very easy to understand next parallel testing is possible so in case of parallel testing you can simultaneously test the test cases in various browsers like google chrome mozilla firefox edge safari opera and many more So for that you just have to mention the driver and the path of the particular drivers and also detailed log report can be generated so these are few of the advantages of test ng over junit having understood this now let's dive into the core part of the discussion that is test ng annotations annotations in selenium are used to control the next method to be executed test annotations are defined before every method in the test code in case any method is not prefixed with annotations then that method will be ignored and not executed as a part of the test code to define them methods need to be simply annotated with at test annotation so you have at before suit at before test at before class at before method at test and after method after class and many more now let's dive into the details of all these annotations first at before suit a method which is marked with this annotation will run only once before all the tests in the suit have run next at before test a method which is marked with this annotation will be executed before first at test annotated method that is if there is any at test annotation so the very first or the very previous test but that is marked with at before test will be executed next at before class a method which is marked with this annotation will be executed before first at test method execution it runs only once per the class next you have at before method a method which is marked with this annotation will be executed before every at test annotated method so now you have at test so whatever is the sequence of the test or whatever you want to perform it as a part of your test you can execute it over here 
So this method will run for all your test cases. Next you have at after method. A method which is marked with this annotation will be executed after every at test annotated method. Next at after class. A method with this annotation will be executed after the all methods in the current class have been run. Next at after test. A method with this annotation will be executed when all the at test annotated methods complete the execution of the classes which are inside the test stack in test ng.xml file. And the last one is that after suit. So this annotation will run once after execution of the test in the suit have run. So these are the various test ng annotations in Selenium. And as you understood, each method or each annotation has its own purpose. Having understood this, let's move further and see how to write a test case using test ng. So this is a flow of execution. So first you have to write before suit after that before test after that classes before method then you will get your test annotation and after that after method after class after test and finally you have to close after suit. So this is the execution flow and this is how it will execute no matter what even if you jumble it or even if you write after suit before or if you write after class after that or if you write the before test as first and then you write the before suit. Even if you jumble everything, it will again execute in the same sequence only. So this is all about the annotations in test ng. Now let's move further and understand how to write a first test case using test ng. So first you have to create a new test ng project, then configure the build path and add test ng library. And after that you have to create a test ng class file and code the program and run it on a test ng suit. And also you can run it as a test ng test. So now let's see a small demo. So I have created a project over here called as a Eureka Selenium project. And then I'll just click on the configure build path. So you can see here I have all the jar files. I have the Maven dependencies library. I have test ng library and also I have a JUnit library. So I'll just say apply and close. So I have created a simple example over here. So first what I will do I will say public string base URL. So I want to navigate through edureka.co website. So that is the reason I'm just specifying the website over here. And next I'm giving the driver path. So the driver that I am using is the Chrome driver and this is the path where I have saved my Chrome driver. So that's the reason I'll be giving the path for the Chrome driver. Next I have to create a driver object. So that's the reason I'm saying public web driver and a driver. And now I'm simply using only one annotation that is at test annotation. So you can see it comes under org.testng.annotations.test package. So it has a target value and it has a retention also. So it marks a class or a method as a part of the test. Yes. So what I have done, I have just created a method called verify homepage title. So for that I am saying system.out.println. I'm just specifying a print statement like launching the Chrome browser. And then I have to set the system property for the Chrome browser. So what I'll say I am using Chrome driver. So I'll say web driver.chrome.driver and the driver path will be this one. So it will refer the driver path from here. And after that I have to create a new object of Chrome driver or else it won't create an instance of that. So that's the reason what I'm doing. I'm just saying driver is equal to new Chrome driver and I want to get the base URL that is this one. So what I'm doing either you can specify in double quotes as this or you can just write it in this way as well. As I have created a string object of base URL. So that's the reason I'm just passing the object over here. Next I'm trying to match the actual title and the expected title of the web page. So the expected title will be instructor led online training with 24 7 lifetime support followed by Edureka. But for the actual title I have not specified anything it has to take from the website now. So that's the reason I'm using assert equals actual title and expected title. If yes then it will say test case is passed else it will say the test case has failed. So now let's see a very small thing. So you can see here the title is instructor led online training by 24 7 lifetime support and followed by Edureka. This is the same thing that I have been given here. Now let's run the program and check the output. 
So I will run this as test ng test. Let's see what happens. So it's telling launching the Chrome browser. You can see that it launched the Chrome browser and it navigated through edureka.co. And you can see the title over here that is instructor led online training with lifetime support. And it closed the driver as well because I have given driver dot close. Okay. So now let's check the output. So what was the test? The test was to verify the home page title. On default test, test that was run is one. There were no failures and there were no skips. And also on the default suit, total test that was run was only one. That is this one, the verify home page title. And again, there was no failures and there were no skips. Now suppose say I remove this and I just write it like this. I'll save the program and I will run it as test ng test. Now let's see what happens. Again it detected the version of test ng. It said it launching the Chrome browser and it is and the Chrome driver launched Chrome browser. It's navigating to edureka.co. And here you can see that there was an exception telling Java Lang assertion error. And it's telling the expected thing was this, but it found this thing because I have removed the pipe over here. So what it's telling the actual title that was found was this, but here it was able to find only this. So that's the error it threw. And it's telling the test ng assert was failed. There was a failure. And again, it's telling test that was run was one. And also there was a failure as well because I have missed that. So this is how you can use test ng annotations. So this is a just simple example of how to use add test annotation. Now we'll see the same example using three different annotations that is add before test, add test and add after test annotation. So this same example will be clubbed into or it will be grouped into three different annotations. Let's see how it works. So I have created an example called public class annotation example. Okay. Again, what I'm doing here, I'm just giving public string base URL is equal to edureka.co and the driver path I'm specifying for my Chrome driver and I'm creating object of a web driver. And now I'm using add before test annotation. So this comes under the package org dot test ng dot annotations dot before test. So I have already imported the package for before test after test and add test as well. So what I'll do, I'll just say system dot out dot print ln and launch the Chrome browser again system dot set property. I have to set the properties so I will set the property for my web driver and I'll refer to the driver path and after that what I'll do in the before test. I'll create an object of a new Chrome driver and get the base URL that is edureka.co. So these are the things that is happening before the test and that test what will happen and that test I have to verify the home page title. So I'll specify the expected title and in the output I want the actual title. So I'll say driver dot get title and again I'm using assert equals to verify whether the actual title matches with the expected title or not. So these are the operations or the actions that should happen at test and finally at after test what I should do I should just close the driver that is driver dot close. So in this example you can see these four statements as part of before test. And these three statements are a part of at test annotation and this will be performed in after test annotation. So this is how I have split the code and grouped among three different annotations so that it is very easy to understand. So you can easily get to know that these are the functions that will be happening at before test and this is what will be happening during the test and this is what will happen after the test. It's very simple to understand, right? So yeah, this is how the test ng actually works and now let's run and check for the output. So I will run this as a test ng test. So you can see it detected the version of test ng. So it said it's launching the Chrome browser and now you can see the Chrome driver launched Google Chrome browser and it's navigated to edureka.co and it will verify the title now and then after that it will just close the driver. So you can see on the default test and the default suit the test that was run was one and there were no failures and no skips as well. So this is how your results looks like.
So you can see here on the default suit there was a default test and the class name of the test was annotation example and during the test the method was verify the home page title. So this is how your summary of the test report looks like and there is no fail test so it won't display. So this is a summary. Yes. So this is how you can specify the annotations and group it in a very understanding way and run the test cases. I hope you understood this and now I will jumble all the annotations and write the test cases. I hope you know the sequence and the flow of annotations. So first I have created a class called test and annotations. After that I'm writing my test case one. So that will be followed by at test annotation. So simply I want to print in test case one. Next there's one more test case so that will also be followed by at test annotation and I've created a method called test case 2 and for that I'll write in test case 2. So after this I'll write before method and after method again I'll create a method for before method and after method and I'll just say in before method and in after method. After that what I am using I'm using before class and after class and I've defined the methods for that as well. After that I will write the before test and that after test methods. So it will just print in before test and in after test. And finally I will write at before suit and at after suit. So you can see that first I wrote the test cases that is one and two. Then I used before and after method then I used before after class then test and then suit. But what is the execution flow? The execution flow is first comes before suit before test before class before method. And then test after method after class after test and after suit. But here you can see that I have wrote in a jumbled way. But when I execute the program you can see it will follow the same sequence. Let's check that now. So you can see it detected the version of test entry and there were two test cases that was run. So as I have told you how it will say first it will say before suit and then in before test and before class and before method and then it will execute the first test case. Then after before method what happened after method got executed and after that again it's executing before method because it has one more test case. So it will run one more test case at the test case two. again it will say after method after class and after test. But you can see that there is no after suit here because first it ran both the test cases. And I hope you remember that a method with after suit annotation will run once after execution of the test in the suit have run. So it executed only till after test and it said test case one and test case two was passed. That is in default test. You can see it's telling in default test there were two test cases that was run. There was no skips and no failures. And after that it said in after suit because after all the test cases have run it will just run only once that is the reason it ran after the suit and again in the default suit you can see the number of test cases was true that was run and there were no failures and there were no skips as well. So this is how all the annotations can be used and also you can execute many other examples based on the different annotations and you can use all the annotations and group your examples in a very easy way. Now let's see one more example of a cross browser testing. So what I have done here I have just created a class called cross browser test. This is nothing but a cross browser script where the same test cases will run across the different browsers and test ng is very helpful for that as I have already mentioned you before. Now let's see how it works. So what I have done I have written here at before test and the parameters is also one of the annotations. It describes how to pass the parameters to a add test method. So in the test I want to specify the browser. So that is the reason I'm using at test parameters. So now I'm setting up a method called string browser and that throws exception. So first I want to set up Firefox browser. So that's the reason I'm giving if browser equals to ignore case of Firefox set the system properties of the Firefox driver. So this is how I do that. I'll specify the path and I'll create a instance of a Firefox browser and next I'll check it for the Chrome driver. That is I want to launch a Google Chrome with the help of Chrome driver. So that's the reason I am specifying it in this way. And after that what I want to do I want to check for Edge as well. That is Microsoft Edge as well. So this is how I'll do that. I'll set the system properties and I'll create an instance of a new Edge driver. If no browser passed then it has to throw an exception. 
So that's the reason I'm telling throw new exception telling that browser is not correct. If the about as cases fail and after that what I am doing I am specifying the time mods for implicitly wait. I want to wait for 10 seconds because it will take time to load the browsers execute the test cases, right? So I don't want to throw exception or I don't want it to close the driver or anything like that. So that's the reason I'm specifying implicitly wait. So this is all the things that is happening before test and let's see now what happens at test. So public void test parameter with XML throws interrupted exception. So what I'm doing I am just getting the driver telling driver dot get and specify the URL that is a dot co. I want to log in so I want to click on the login button. So this is how I'm specifying with the help of a locators. If you wish to know how to locate elements with the help of locators and everything you can check out my video in our YouTube playlist and you can very well understand these concepts in depth. And after that what I'm doing as it is a link text. I'm clicking on the login button and again after that I'm using a thread sleep because I want to know what actions are happening. So I'm just using a four milliseconds of sleep time and now I want to enter the username and password. So that is the reason I'm specifying driver dot find element by ID. This is the value of my locator for ID and I'm using send keys because it is a text box. I'm entering the username and again same for password and what I'm doing. I'm using the next button because I want to hit on the login button. So that's the reason I'm specifying next dot click. I want to search this as well. I'll inspect that and I will search it. So for that I'm using CSS selectors. Again if you wish to know what the CSS selectors what is X path and everything you can check out the videos. Again, this is a type of locators only. So this is how I'll specify the search input value for my CSS selectors and then I'll send keys as selenium and after that I want to search it automatically. So that's the reason what I'm doing. I'm specifying the X path for the search icon. So finally I'll say search button dot click and now I have written a text ng dot XML file. So you can see there are three different types of browsers. And I want to specify the class path for all the three different browsers. So that is the reason I have written XML file for the test ng. So this is how I need to write it. So the test ng suit name will be test suit, third count will be two, and the test that will run in parallel. So first, the test name is Chrome test. So first, what will happen? The Chrome browser will get launched. The parameter name is browser value is equal to Chrome, and this is the class name that is the package name. Which is code.edureka.pages followed by the class name. The class name is what? Cross browser script. Yes. So after that, I'll close the class and I'll close the test. Again, the second test name will be Firefox test. Parameter name is browser, value is equal to Firefox. Again, the class name will be the same. Again, after that, you have your edge test. Again, the same thing for that. And finally, I will close the suit. So first, you can see I open the suit, then I open the test, then I open the classes. Close the test again open the new test again open the classes and then close the class and after everything I close the suit because I have told you it only executes once. So now here what you need to do is you need to run this as a test ng suit. Let's see how it works. So you can see test ng version was detected. First it launched Google Chrome browser. It's navigating to edureka.co. Hit on the login button and simultaneously it launched Firefox browser navigating through edureka.co. Let me check with this. You can see it's entering the username and the password and hit on the login button as well. Again, it's navigating through the edge and it hit on the sign in, and you can see here it logged in. And it's giving the search as selenium. So this is how you can run the test cases. So you saw it executed on three different browsers and it performed the actions on all the three different browsers. If you wish to know how to run a cross browser script in more detail way, you can check out the video on our YouTube playlist and you can have a very depth knowledge about that as well. So this is how you need to use all the annotations. You can configure your test ng file and you can configure your XML file as well based on the script that you have written in your class file. And this is how you can use all the annotations and that serves different purposes. And yes, that's all about the test ng annotations in Selenium. What is an action class in Selenium?
action class is based on a builder design pattern which basically builds a composite action with the aggregation of a selenium web driver where the web driver is only used to identify the presence of web elements on the web page action is a way in which something works but in selenium actions class is based on the builder design pattern which basically helps in building a composite action with the help of selenium web driver where the web driver is only used to identify the presence of the web elements on the web page selenium provides api to automate the keyboard events mouse events drag and drop feature and so on and this can be achieved using the action interface and the action class the action interface is only used to represent a single user interaction that is to perform the series of actions termed by this actions class it contains the actions and the action class which are needed while executing the events so this is about the actions class in selenium now let's understand the importance of this actions class in selenium this actions class is mainly used to handle the actions that can be performed on the keyboard mouse drop down drag and drop and so on this class mainly focuses on the user facing api for emulating complex user gestures this api also includes actions such as drag and drop clicking multiple elements double click right click on the mouse and so on okay so this is why we need the actions class in selenium now let's take a look at the different methods that are available in this actions class like i mentioned earlier this actions class control the mouse and the keyboard functions like the click action click and hold action double click action double tap action key down key up and so on so let's learn about them in detail first we'll start learning about the keyboard interface okay so this keyboard interface has these methods it has send keys it has key down it has key up let's learn about them in detail send keys are used to send a series of keystrokes on to the web element for example if you find a search box or a text box on the web page you can inspect the element and get the id of it and send keys to that particular element that can be done using this send keys method now what is a key down method key down method sends a key press without releasing it so it, this basically allows to press the key so this key down method basically helps in pressing the key for example keys dot shift keys dot control and so on now let's discuss about the key up method key up method is used to release the key okay for example key release now let's discuss about the mouse events in selenium there are a few methods under this mouse events say click which simply clicks on the element double click which helps in double clicking on the web element context link this is something new this context click performs a context click that is a right click on a web element click and hold it clicks at the present mouse location without releasing it drag and drop i think you guys might have wondered how to drag and drop a particular element on the web page using selenium so this drag and drop feature can be achieved in selenium by using this actions class so let's see what this drag and drop is all about this method invokes the click and hold at the source location and moves to the location of the target element before releasing the mouse it basically has two fields which is the source and the target source hold the location of the element that has to be grabbed and the target holds the element that has to be released okay so this is about the drag and drop method now let's take a look at the drag and drop by method this has basically three attributes this drag and drop by method performs click and hold at the source location by shifting to the given offset horizontally or vertically okay so this is about the drag and drop by method now let's move on and understand what is a move by offset method this method shifts the mouse from its current position to the given offset it can either be horizontal offset or the vertical offset now let's take a look at the move to element method 
This move to element method helps in shifting the mouse to the center of the element that has to be located. Okay. Now, what is the release method? This method releases the depressed left mouse button at the existing mouse location. That is, it releases the left mouse button. And in some applications, we may face a situation where you have to automate the drag and drop an item from one location to another location. We could not achieve this using the basic elements that are present on the web page. But Selenium has provided an actions class to handle this kind of scenarios. So we can overcome this using the drag and drop method. To execute this drag and drop feature in Selenium, we require two attributes that is namely the source locator and the target locator. The syntax goes something like this. It says action dot drag and drop specify the source locator and the target locator and build and perform. Okay, so this is about the drag and drop method in the actions class. In some cases, we might want to right click on the element to get more options. To do that, we use the context click method in the actions class. Okay, so this is everything you need to know about the methods in the actions class. Now, let's move on to the interesting part of this session a demo on how to handle the action class in Selenium. For that, we require the latest version of Java in our system and also an IDE where we can perform the actions. So, this is the Eclipse workspace, guys. In this case, I've already written the piece of code so that you can understand how exactly the action class work. So the very first thing you need to do when you want to test an application using Selenium is to set the browser driver. In this case, I'm going to consider using the Chrome driver. So I'm going to set the system property to the Chrome driver and also specify the path in which it exists followed by the extension Chrome driver.exe which specifies that it's an executable file. Once you finish this, we have to instantiate the browser driver with the new Chrome driver. And once you do this, let's get the URL of the web page. In my case, I'll be considering working on the official website of Edureka, that is www.edureka.co. And I'll maximize the screen using this command driver.manage.window.maximize. That is the object of the web driver. Manage the window maximize. So this command helps in maximizing the window and once you do this, let's add the implicit wait command here, which basically helps to wait for the complete page to load. So this will be for 10 seconds because the time unit is in seconds. Okay. And after this, I'm going to pause the execution using the thread dot sleep command that is in milliseconds. So it will be 3000 milliseconds. And after this, I'm going to create the object of the actions and instantiate it with the new actions that is linked with the driver. Okay. This actions might throw up an error. So just add the packages to the project. And after you instantiate the actions with the driver, let's perform the operations on this actions class. I think you guys have understood what is the move to element method in the actions class. Okay. So this move to element helps in shifting the mouse to the center of the element. So we'll move the element to this particular location. So let's inspect our web page. Edureka.co. Okay, so we'll so first we'll start working on the drop down. Okay, so I want this particular location. So I'll inspect this. I'll inspect this location. Okay, this comes under the class. Okay, you can see that the ID is present, which is an element locator in Selenium. So I'm just going to copy this ID and go back to my project and paste it here. Okay, as you can see, I'll find the element by its ID. Do consider writing build dot perform, which basically helps in compiling and execution. Okay, so this is the function of the build dot perform function. Now, after we find the element on the web page, we'll pause the execution for three seconds using the thread command. Okay. And once this is done, we are going to find another element on the web page. Let's go back to our web page. So under this, let's say you want to search for this particular element that is the software testing. So I'm going to inspect the software testing. Okay. As you can see, the link text is present, but in some cases, link text might not work. So I'll try using the CSS selector because ID is present. 
so i'll just copy this and go back to my project and paste it over here okay after you find this element we need to link it with the builder which is the object of this actions class okay so we'll do that using this command builder dot move to the element and specify the object of this web element that is link dot build and perform which helps in compiling and executing and once you move to this element on the web page we'll pause the execution for two seconds okay and after this say you want to click on the software testing so let's see how you can do this just go here say you want to click on the software testing how to do that using selenium let's go back to our project let's try inspecting this as you can see the id is present and this is a subclass of li which is a subclass of the ul okay so let's try writing the x path to this location so i'll write control f where i'll consider writing the parent class first and then write the child class so i'm going to copy this parent class so and i'm going to write ul where class is equal to this and the child class and also specify the class of this see as you can see that the drop down is selected over here and it comes under a where text equals like i mentioned the link text won't work at some point so i'm just going to copy this text okay you can see that i made a mistake here okay i have to take out the annotation here so this is a unique location on the web page so i'm just going to copy this location of the web element and go back to my project and paste it over here and i'm going to click the particular location okay and after i click the element i'm going to pause the execution for four seconds okay and after that i'm going to create another object of the web element called act where i'll be searching this particular location that is the search box okay the search box has the id so i'm going to copy this id and go back to my project and find the element by id okay like i mentioned earlier we need to link the actions class to the web element so i'm going to write builder dot move to element and specify the object of the web element act dot build dot perform okay and once you find the element that is the search box on the web page i'm going to pause the execution for three seconds and then try to send keys to them and once you get the location of the search box we need to click on the search button okay so to do that i'm going to consider finding the element let's go back to our project Okay, this search box is what we want to search. So this has class, which has the ID present. Okay, but I'm going to try writing X path to it. So I'm going to write the X path to this particular location. So this comes under the span where class is equal to this. Okay, this is a unique address. So I'm going to copy this and go back to my project and paste it over here. Okay. So this search button needs to be clicked. So we'll see how to do that using the actions class. And like I mentioned earlier, we need to link the actions to this web element. So I'm going to use this particular command and pause the execution for three seconds. And after this, I'm going to create an object of the action class, not the actions. Okay. And then I'll be creating an interface called action and name this interface as series of actions. Okay. And this interface can control the entire actions class. Okay, so after specifying the series of actions class, I'm going to instantiate it with the builder, and then I'm going to perform some actions. Okay, as you can see that these are the methods that we just saw. That is the key send keys method, key down, key up. Okay, so these methods can be called using this action interface. So I'm going to consider the object of the actions class, that is the builder dot send keys to act what is act act is the web element that is used to find the search box or the text box and i'm going to send keys as selenium okay so i'm going to send keys to the search box in the web element and then i'm going to perform the action called key down key down helps in pressing the key so i'm going to press the key that is search search is used to find the element that is the search button okay 
So this search button is pressed using the key down function and then I'm going to perform the shift operation that is it helps in clicking. Okay, so this helps in pressing the key and then I'm going to perform the key up action which helps in releasing the key. Okay, so the search box key shift. Okay, and after this I'm going to build it and perform. So I'm going to specify the series of actions which is an interface of actions class and perform and then I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds and quit the driver execution. So I'll just save it and run it. Okay, it first has to navigate to the edureka.co page. Maximize the page and then search for the drop down. Pause the execution and click on the software testing. And then it has to search for the search box and send keys to it. Selenium and clicks. Okay, so this is how the actions work in Selenium. Now let's understand how the drag and drop feature works in Selenium. Okay, so I've already written a piece of code here so that you understand it properly. In this case, I'll be testing a generic web page that is jQuery UI. Let's check out this web page. Okay, so this page mainly deals with drag and drop. You can see that there is a frame here under which there is drag me to the target and dropped. So this is how the drag and drop feature works in Selenium. One thing you need to know about this drag and drop feature is it can only drag and drop the web element. You cannot drag the file from the folder and drop it on the web page. That doesn't happen. It only works within the current web page. Okay, that's how Selenium works, right, guys? It just drags this source and drops it to the target location. Okay, let's see how you can do this using Selenium. So, this is a software which mainly deals with drag and drop feature. Okay, so I'll go back to my project and just explain you guys how this works. As you can see that this drag and drop feature exists within the frame. Okay, so if you inspect it, you can see that there is page source and frame source. Okay, so I'm going to click on the frame source. Okay, you can see that the HTML code is present here. Okay, now if you click anywhere else outside this, you can't find the frame source here. You can only view the page source or the inspect option but inside this you can view the frame source okay so everything inside this frame is considered as an object so when you inspect this element you can find the id is present you can see that the id is present but the very first thing you need to do when you want to search for this particular location is to switch to this particular frame okay so this exists under the frame see you can see that the iframe exists here which holds this particular frame in it. Okay, so this is just another division in the frame. So first you need to switch to this frame. So to do that, I'm going to switch to the frame and specify the frame value as zero. So it switches to the particular frame. And after that, I'm going to find the element using its ID. As you can see that the ID is present, which is a element locator in selenium so i'll go back to my project and create an object of the web element and find the element using the id the same goes with the target element as well so i'm going to create an object of the web element call it target element and find the element using the id okay you can see that the id is present here yeah so i'll copy this id and go back to my project and after you find the location of the source element and the target element we need to perform actions on them that is the drag and drop feature. So to do that I'm going to create an object of this actions class and call it action and I'm going to instantiate it with the new actions where I'll be linking the driver along with it. And after I do this I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds so that you can clearly see what is happening and after this I'm going to consider the object of the actions class that is action and I'm going to use the drag and drop method to perform the action. So in this case, you need to mention the source element as well as the target element. And the syntax goes something like this. It asks for the source element and the target element. Okay. In our case, the object of the source is the source element and the target is the target element. So I'm going to build and perform this function 
and I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds so that you can see that the drag and drop function is working. And after this, I'm going to quit the driver execution. You can also use this command here, which I've used this as a comment. You can click and hold the source element and move to the target element. And then I'm going to release the clicked button on the mouse and build and perform. Even this function works, guys. Okay. So let's save this and run it. It first navigates to the page, searches for the target and the source element, and drags the source to the target. Okay. And closes the web execution. Time plays a major role while testing, and we need to make sure that we complete the desired task within the specific time. A robot class is used to generate native system input events for the purpose of test automation, self-running demos, and other applications where the control of mouse and keyboard is needed. The primary purpose of this robot class is to facilitate the automation testing for the Java platform implementations. In simple terms, I can say that this class provides control over the mouse and the keyboard devices. This robot class can handle the pop-ups during the execution. This class is very easy to use with the automation process. Now you might ask why do we need this robot class when we can perform actions on the keyboard and as well as hover the mouse over the location on the web page. Right to answer this I would say a robot class is used to simulate and handle the mouse and keyboard functions. We don't have to click any button while automating a web page. It can handle all the pop ups as well as the notification section of the web page. It also helps you when you want to upload a file onto an application. This can be done using this robot class. Hope you guys got a clear idea on why we use this robot class in Selenium. So this is about what is a robot class and why we use this robot class in Selenium. Now let's move on to our next topic that is what are the different methods that are used while working on this robot class. So there are basically five different methods. As I mentioned earlier, it handles all the keyboard and mouse functions. So the first method would be the key press. So this is used to press any key on the keyboard. For example, if you have this particular command, it will press the up key in the keyboard. Next up, we have the key release method. This is used to release the press key of the keyboard. For example, if you have this particular command, it will release the pressed caps lock key in the keyboard. So this is about the methods that are used to control the keyboard functions. Now let's take a look at the methods that are used to handle the mouse functions. In this we have the mouse press method which is used to press the left button of the mouse. For example, if you have this particular command, it helps in pressing the left button of the mouse. And then we have the mouse release method which is used to release the pressed button of the mouse. For example, if you have this particular command, it helps in releasing the pressed button of the mouse. Last up, we have the mouse move method, which will move the mouse pointer to the X and the Y coordinates. Coordinates of the elements are passed in this mouse move method. So the command goes something like this. It says robot dot mouse move and specify the coordinates of the X axis and also the Y axis. Okay, so these are the methods that actually control the mouse and the keyboard functions. To understand how to implement this robot class in Selenium, let's take a look at the implementation of this robot class. So to do that, we require the latest version of Java installed in our system and also an IDE where we can perform all the actions. So let's check if Java is installed in our system. Let's go to command prompt and type Java hyphen version. This is the version of Java installed in my system. So now we need an IDE where we can perform the actions. I'm going to consider working on the Eclipse IDE because it is very convenient when you're working on a Java project. So I'll just quickly open this Eclipse IDE. Launch the workspace. Okay, so this is the Eclipse workspace guys. So first, so first I'm going to create a new project that is a new Java project. Go to new and go to Java project. You need to give this a name. So I'm going to name this project as a robot class. Click on finish. Okay, you can see that there is a folder being created by the name robot class. 
I'm just going to click on the drop down. You can find the source field and the Java libraries. Now we need to add the Selenium jar files to this folder. So I'm just going to right click on this, go to build path and configure the Selenium libraries. Add external jars, Selenium standalone server. Okay. And we require the Selenium libraries. Open, add external jars. Open. All the Selenium libraries are added to this project. Click on apply and close. You can find another folder which holds the Selenium libraries. Now let's write our code in this source field. Go to new and go to class. So I'm going to name this as demo class where I'm going to include the main function and click on finish. So in this case, we'll try performing actions on our official website at Eureka.co. So to do that, I'm going to first set the browser driver. So in this case, we'll be performing actions on the Chrome driver. So I'm going to type system dot set property and specify the driver that is web driver dot Chrome dot driver and also specify the path in which it is located. In my case, it's in the C drive. So I'm just going to copy this path and go back to my project and paste the location here. One thing you need to know when you specify the path, it should always end with the extension Chrome driver dot exe. That is it specifies that it's an executable file. And after this, I'm going to instantiate the Chrome driver. OK, so to do that, I'm going to create an object of the web driver and call it driver and instantiate it with the new Chrome driver. OK, you can see that it throws an error. So just import the web driver packages to this project. OK, I think you guys understood how to set the browser driver. Now let's get the URL of the web page. So I'm going to consider the object of the web driver that is driver dot get and paste the URL here. So it's HTTP colon at Eureka dot co. So this is the URL of the web page guys. Now let's go to our web page at Eureka dot co. So we're going to perform actions on this web page here. Now say you want to click this particular element on the web page. So I'm just going to inspect this. OK, you can see that the link text is present. So I'm just going to copy this link text. And go back to my project. So I'm going to consider the object of the web driver that is driver dot find element by the link text. And specify the link text here. As it's a clickable element, I'm going to click this particular location. OK, so once this is done, I'm going to instantiate the robot class. So to do that, I'm going to call robot and create an object of the same and call it robot as well. And I'm going to instantiate it with the new robot. You can see that it throws an error here. So import the robot packages to the project. OK throws declaration it throws AWT exceptions. OK, so once you initialize this robot class, we need to perform certain actions on the keyboard as well as the mouse functions. So to do that first, I'm going to pause the execution for a few seconds. So I'm going to pause the execution for four seconds. It throws an error. So add throws declaration. OK, once you're done initializing the robot class, I'm going to perform some actions on the keyboard. So I'm going to consider the object of the robot class that is robot dot key press. I'm going to press this particular key key event which specifies that a keystroke is initialized. OK, so once you do this, I'm going to consider pressing the key down, which specifies that the key is pressed. OK. So once you do this, I'm going to pause the execution for a few seconds so that you can see that the key is pressed. It's in milliseconds, so I'm going to consider it as four seconds. And then I'm going to press the tab key on the keyboard. So to do that, I'm going to consider the object of the robot class. Key press. The key event and specify 
that you want to press the tab okay so do add the thread dot sleep command so that you can actually pause the execution for a few seconds and it will be useful when you're executing the program thread dot sleep pause the execution for four seconds here as well now in order to make sure that you don't have errors while executing the program i'm going to add the system dot print ln command i'm going to print e here okay after this, I'm going to press another tab key. So consider the object of the robot class bot dot key press and specify the key event and also specify that you want to click the tab button. Okay. And after this, I'm going to pause the execution for a few seconds. And I'm going to print certain text so that you can know where the error exists when you're executing i'm going to print b and again i'm going to click the tab key so consider the object of the robot class key press specify the key event and also perform actions on the tab again i'm going to pause the execution for a few seconds and I'm going to print. After you're done performing actions with the keyboard functions, now let's move on and automate the mouse functions. So I'm going to consider the object of the robot class that is robot dot mouse move, where you have to specify the axis in which you want the mouse to move. So I'm going to take it as 30 and the Y axis will be 100. OK, so let's see how this comes up. And after this, I'm going to print system dot out dot print ln where I'm going to pass this particular text. And after this is done, I'm going to exit the driver execution. So driver dot quit. Okay, it quits the driver execution. So I'm going to save this code and run it. Run as Java application. It first navigates to Edureka website, searches for the course link, and then opens it. Processes the keyboard functions. And the mouse handle function. OK, you can see that it is going here. That is the tap function. And the mouse handling function, OK? So this is how Selenium can control the mouse functions as well as the keyboard functions. Now let's take a look at the limitations of this robot class. The mouse or the keyboard event will work only on the current window. It is difficult to switch among different screens or windows. For example, if a code is executing any robot event by the code execution, but the code execution is moved to another window or a new window. In this case, the mouse or the keyboard event will still remain the same, but on the previous window. A method like this mouse move depends on the screen resolution. And if you're using the XY coordinates for your test, then the test will behave differently on the different screens. And if in case you're running your tests in a virtual machine, then the script failure is more. Okay, so these are the certain limitations of this robot class. Selenium WebDriver is a combination of two major projects that is Selenium version 1.0 and WebDriver. Let's see what this means. Selenium WebDriver is a collection of open source API which are used to automate the testing of a web application. You might ask what's the difference between Selenium and Selenium WebDriver? Selenium as you all know is a suite of tools specifically for automating web browsers. There are many flavors in Selenium and the user should know which is the appropriate tool that you need to use. Selenium suite of tools mainly consists of Selenium IDE, Selenium RC, that is remote control, Selenium WebDriver and Selenium Grid. Selenium WebDriver is basically designed to supply a well-designed object-oriented API and the test scripts can be written in any programming language like Java, C Sharp, 
Python, Scala, and so on, but it has only a programming interface and not an IDE. It is fast when it comes to interacting with most of the browsers like Chrome, Firefox, IE, and so on, as it directly interacts with the target element rather than interacting with the server and then point it to the target element. So, this is about Selenium WebDriver. Now, let's take a look at the advantages of this WebDriver. Selenium WebDriver is an open source tool which is simple and provides a concise interface to perform testing. It is highly efficient because it can find the element on a web page using the element locators, which can easily identify the web element to automate the process. It has support over dynamic web pages like Ajax and so on, and also helps in the process of changing the web element by not reloading the page. So, this is one of the major features of Selenium WebDriver. It also drives the browser much efficiently and also overcomes the limitations of Selenium 1. So, these are the few notable advantages of Selenium WebDriver. Now, let's see what are the basic prerequisites that are required to work on Selenium WebDriver. We require the latest version of Java in our system, and we also need the latest Eclipse IDE where we'll write our test scripts and run them. And the version that I'll be using in this session is Photon. And we also require a few Selenium plugins like Selenium Standalone Server, Selenium IDE, and so on. And we also require the browser driver, which helps in performing actions across different platforms. So, this is about the prerequisites that are required to run the test scripts. Now, let's move on and understand the core topic of this session what is multiple window handling? Say, for example, if you're working on an application and you want a particular link to open in a new window. How would you do that using Selenium? Well, I'll help you understand how to handle multiple windows in Selenium. We use the window handling function which helps in dealing with multiple windows simultaneously. So what is a window handle and how can it help in switching to the new window? So the window handle function helps in handling multiple windows and the syntax goes something like this get dot window handle. This function helps in getting the window handle and returns the string. And we also use get dot window handles, which helps in getting the handles of all the windows and returns the string, which is alphanumeric. And to get the details of all the window handles, we use the command called set handles, which is of the form string, and link the driver details to the window handles. And to switch from one window to another, we use the switch to command, which helps in switching between the windows. And we also make use of actions by instantiating with the browser driver. So we are going to instantiate the new window action to the driver action. So now that you've understood what this function does and why do we need it, let's get to the demo section of this session where we'll try to handle multiple windows at the same time. So to do that, we'll open our latest Eclipse IDE where we'll write the code to automate a website. And I'll also be giving you a few tips on how to automate the testing of web application by walking you through a few simple programs. Okay, so let's get to the demo section. Okay, let's open our latest Eclipse ID, launch the workspace. So this is our Eclipse ID workspace. And in this session, I've already written a few programs so that you can easily understand and follow my instructions. So I've already created a project here. You can see it says Selenium multiple windows. I'll just click on the drop down of it. As you can see, the Java libraries are included in it and the source file exists under which we are going to write our piece of code and the referenced libraries under which the Selenium libraries are configured and the test ng libraries and the Selenium multiple windows where our class path and project path resides and the test output contains the target values. So this is about the structure of this project. So I'm just going to click on the source file and I've already created a package called Selenium under which I've written a few programs which are very simple and easy to understand guys. So let's start by understanding our first demo. Okay, I'm just going to click on it. As you can see, it comes under the package Selenium. I think more get more visible to you guys. Okay, as you can see, it comes under the package called Selenium. I have named the class as demo one under which our main class resides. And the first thing you need to do when you're working on Selenium is set the browser driver. So in this case, I'm going to use the Chrome driver as my browser driver. So I'm going to set the system property to the browser driver that is webdriver.chrome.driver 
and also specify the path in which the Chrome driver resides. So in my case, it is in the D drive. So I'm going to write D followed by the extension Chrome driver dot exe, which should be an executable file. And I'll also instantiate the web driver and create an object of the same and instantiate with the new Chrome driver. This might throw an error saying Chrome driver is not resolved to a type. Just click on the Chrome driver and you'll find an option called import Chrome driver instances. That means you need to import the Chrome driver packages to our project. The same goes with the web driver as well. So after instantiating the Chrome driver, we need to get the URL of the particular web page that we are going to automate. So driver dot get this is the URL of the particular web page that we are going to perform the actions on. Okay, that is tools SQA automation. So first let's click on the URL. Just go to Google. Okay. So you can see that this particular website is only for demos and it says automation practice switch windows. Okay, so just click on this. So you can see that the new window is being created here. A new message window. All right. Let's close this a new browser tab. So it opens in a new tab. Okay, so let's automate this process by using selenium. So let's go back to our code. After we get the URL of the web page, we need to find the web element called click element on the page. And this can be done using the element locators in selenium. So we're going to find them using the ID. Okay, let's go back to our web page. Okay, so we're going to inspect this. So you can see that the ID is present here, which says button one. So I'm going to just copy this and paste it in our code. Let's go back to our workspace. Okay, you can see that the ID is already present. So this particular click element helps in opening only one window. So we need multiple windows to handle. So we are going to use for loop to do that for int i is equal to zero and i less than three and i plus plus under which we are going to click click element and then we are going to pause the execution for three seconds using sleep command that is thread dot sleep which is in the form of milliseconds. So let's execute this process and check what happens. One. Two. Three. All right, guys, three child windows were created using this code. OK, so I'm just going to close this child windows here. One, two and three. So four windows were opened and automated using this process. You can see that there is no such testing or automation taking place in this process because the website itself deals with switching the windows. So this is how you deal with a website whose sole intention is to switch the windows. I think this is the most easiest one I can say and we'll try to customize the application a bit more. I think you could figure out that we did nothing except just clicking the browser window there. It just opened twice or thrice. That's all. So what if you want to customize the child window and the parent window? So let's take a look at the second program. OK, even this comes under the package selenium and I'm going to name this class as demo to under which our main class resides. I'm going to set the system property to the Chrome driver and specify the path and instantiate the web driver to the new Chrome driver and also get the URL of the web page that we are going to perform the actions on. So this is a web page. It's the same URL and in this program we are going to use the get window handle function. OK, so to do that I'm going to call the string function parent window handle and link the driver to the get window handle function. OK, so this command helps in getting the parent window handle by linking the driver that is the Chrome driver to the parent window. And after this, we are going to print the parent window handle. That is the ID of the parent window handle because each window handle has a unique ID. So the parent window handle ID will be printed here. And after this, we are going to click the web element called click element. The same that we did in the previous program as well and find the element using the element locator ID and specify the ID here. OK, and after this, the same process repeats here. We want three child windows to be open. So to do that, we are going to use the for loop under which we are going to click the element that is click element and pause the execution for three seconds. So what's so special about this? This is almost similar to what we saw in the first demo. 
but the thing about this program is we are going to get the handle IDs of all the windows that are opened. We are going to set all window handles which is of the form string and link the driver to get the details of all window handles using get window handles. So there is a difference between get window handle and get window handles guys get window handle helps in getting the details of the particular window whereas get window handles help in getting the details of all the windows that are open. So we are going to link the driver with the details of all the windows by using this command called driver dot get window handles and after this is done we need to print the window handles of all the windows present one by one. So to do that we are going to use for loop for string handle all window handles we are going to print the window handle of each of them by using this command. All right so this is the program let's save it and I'm going to run it. One. Two. And three. OK you can see the three child windows are open here. I'm going to close this. I think I make it more clear to you guys. So you can see that the parents window handle is present here which says CD window followed by uh, the unique ID and the first window handle has the same ID as that of parents window handle. That is the first window handle and the parent windows handle are one and the same and after that it is followed by three windows that we opened and you can see that each of them have unique identification code. So this is about the execution of our second program. Now let's move on to understand what exactly happens in the third one. So this comes under the same package selenium and I'm going to name this class as demo three under which our main class resides and I'm going to set the system property to the Chrome driver and specify the path in which it resides and then instantiate the driver instance to the new Chrome driver and this command is something new right. So what does JavaScript executor do? This JavaScript executor is an interface that helps in executing the JavaScript through the Selenium web driver. OK, so we are going to use the JavaScript executor in this program and then we are going to get the URL of the web page and in this case I'm going to consider the web page at Eureka community. So it says at Eureka dot co slash community. And then we are going to declare the main web which is of the form string and link the driver to get the detail of the window handle that is the parent window handle. And then we are going to find the element using this command driver dot find element by xpath. So xpath is one of the element locators in selenium and the location is denoted something like this. So this is how the xpath element locator works. So once you find the element using xpath we are going to send keys to that particular location that is shift and enter which are the keyboard functions that is shift and enter. And after this is done we are going to pause the execution for two seconds and then we are going to use the JavaScript executor command here use the object of the JavaScript executor js dot execute script and we are going to scroll through the window. So this scroll by function works according to the axis. The x axis is specified first and then y axis. So if you want to scroll through a page horizontally you can use the x axis and if you want to scroll down through a page you can use the y axis. So I'm going to scroll down through a page so I'm going to consider the x axis to be zero and the y axis is 400. And after scrolling we need to pause the execution for two seconds so that you can see that the window actually scrolled. OK and once you're done scrolling down through a page we need to get the details of all the windows that are present here. And after this is done I'm going to set the window functions to a command called set under which I'm going to link the driver with the window handle function that is get window handles which helps in getting the details of all windows that are open. And once we're done with that we are going to print the set that we declared here. OK so printing this set it will help us get the details of all the windows that are currently open. And after this I'm going to use the iterator function which enables the programmer to transfer a container particularly the lists. It is provided via the containers interface. OK so I'm going to use the iterator operation here which is of the form string. 
and then I'm going to set the iterator that is I'm going to link the window handles of all the windows with the iterator and then I'm going to use the while loop to specify if it is a parent window or the child window on which we are going to perform actions. Okay, while the iterator has next under which we are going to scroll down through the page using the JavaScript executor that is js dot execute script and we are going to scroll down through a page by the y axis. Okay, and after this I'm going to declare the child which is of the form string and iterate it to the next and after this I'm going to use the if condition here while the main web that is the parent window equals the child driver dot switch to window child. So I'm going to switch to the window child. So you can see that there are only two windows that are currently open. All right. And after this, I'm going to print a particular command here that is driver dot switch to window child. That is it prints the child window and gets the title of the child window. So this is how you print the title of the child window. And after this is done, we are going to close the child window and also we'll close the main window that is main web using driver dot switch to dot window main web. Okay. Let's see how this works. I'm going to save this program and run it. Okay, the Chrome driver is opening. Okay, it has to first open the community page. Yep, and opens a new window. It is edureka.co. Goes back to our first page and scrolls down and gets the title of the child window. I'll make it more clear to you guys. Okay. So the window ID of the first, that is the parent window, is specified here. And the ID of the second window that is the child window is also specified followed by the title of the child window. Okay, so this is how you switch between two windows and perform actions while the web driver is connected to both these windows. Okay, I hope this was clear to you guys. Now let's move on to understand our fourth demo. So these are all very simple and easy to understand programs guys. So not to worry about. So this is also the same. It comes under the package selenium under which I'm going to create a class and name it demo for and under which our main class resides and first I'm going to set the system property to our uh, web driver that is Chrome driver and specify the path followed by the executable Chrome driver dot exe and then I'm going to instantiate the web driver to the new Chrome driver and get the URL of the particular web page on which we are going to perform the actions. And after this, I'm going to create the parent window handle, which is of the form string and link it to the driver to get the window handle of the particular parent window, which is linked to the driver that is Chrome driver. And after this, I'm going to print the parent window handle. Okay. And then we are going to search for an element on the web page. This is the same website on which we worked on in our first two demos. So I think you guys are clear with this particular website, which is basically used for switching between the windows. Okay, so we are going to search this click element on the web page by using the element locator ID and specify the ID here. And after this, we want three child windows to be open apart from the parent window. So I'm going to use the for loop to do that where I'm going to click the particular element called click element on the web page and then pause the execution for three seconds so that there exists a three seconds pause between the clicks and after this I'm going to set the all window handles which is of the form string to get the handles of all the windows that are open and I'm going to link that with the driver that is the Chrome driver. Okay, so this command helps in getting the details of all the current windows that are opened and after this I'm going to print a few commands here so that you get the details of all the windows in a proper form. I'm going to use the for loop to do that under which the handle which is of the form string is linked to the all window handles and gets the window handles of all the current windows that is open under which I'm going to print switching to the window and print the first handle that is the parent window handle and after this I'm going to print navigating to google.com and after this I'm going to switch the driver to the first handle that is the first window handle or the parent handle using this command driver dot switch to dot window handle. So this helps in switching to the first window that is the parent window and after this I'm going to get the URL of the page that we want to navigate it to. So that is the google.com. So I'm going to get the URL of this. Okay, 
So this is the program guys. Now let's save it and run it. Okay, so it must first open the application. Okay, and then open three child windows. Two and three. Okay, so three child windows are open. Now the parent window must navigate to google.com. Okay, and so does the child windows. One, two, and three. Okay, so this is how you navigate through a page using multiple windows in Selenium. I'm going to close this one, two, and three. So the first parent window handle is specified here. And like I mentioned, the first window handle is same as the parent window handle. So it is going to be the same ID and navigating it to google.com. It gives the ID of the first window that is opened and then the second one and the third one. So these are the child windows that were opened and it navigated to google.com. Okay. So this is how you link the parent window and the child window using Selenium. Okay, now let's move on to the fifth demo. Now this demo is almost similar to what we looked in our previous demo. So this program comes under the package Selenium and I'm going to name the class as demo file under which our main class resides. And I'm going to set the system property to the web driver that is Chrome driver and specify the path in which the Chrome driver resides. And then I'm going to instantiate the web driver with the new Chrome driver and also get the URL of the web page on which I have to perform the actions. So this is the same website I'm going to use. So first I'm going to get the window handle of the parent window using this command that is string parent window handle is equal to driver dot get window handle. So that is I'm going to link the Chrome driver to get the window handle of the parent window. And after this, I'm going to print the parent window handle using this command. And after this, I'm going to create a web element called click element and find this element on a web page using the element locators in Selenium that is ID and specify the ID. And after this, I'm going to use the for loop to specify how many child windows I need. So I'm going to need three child windows. And while this is executing, I'm going to click the web element called click element and pause the execution for three seconds so that you can clearly see the child windows there. And after this, I need the details of all the window handles that are present. So to do that, I'm going to use this particular command called set string all window handles and link the driver to get the window handles of all the windows that are open. After this, I'm going to specify the last window handle and initialize it with the string. And after this, we are going to print the handles of all the windows one by one. So to do that, I'm going to use the for loop where I'm going to specify the window handles of all the windows and the parent window. So first I'm going to print the window handle of the parent window and then I'm going to print navigating to google.com. It is almost same as that of the previous one. And after this, I'm going to switch to the first window that is the parent window and then we'll get the URL google.com. So this URL is opened in the parent window and then I'm going to assign this last window handle to the current window handle. That is the one that is currently open. And after this, I'm going to switch to the parent handle using this command called driver dot switch to dot window parent window handle. And once you switch to the parent window handle, we are going to close this parent window handle using driver dot close command. And once you close the parent window, we are going to switch to the last window handle using driver dot switch to dot window last window handle. And once you get to the last window, we are going to pass the URL of the web page here using driver dot get command. And this particular website will be open only in the last window. Okay, now let's see how this is done. I'm going to save this and run the program. Okay. So it will first create three windows that is three child windows. The first one. The second one. And the third one. After this it navigates to the Google page and so does the child classes. And it closes the parent window and the last window will open this particular link doll tool SQA. Now I'll close this last window here. You can see that this is the only page which has this particular website. The other one will be the Google page. All right. So you can see that the Google.com is open in this page as well as in this page. 
Okay, so this is how you can navigate through a page using Selenium and also control the actions of the child window with respect to the parent window. So this is how the ones that we wanted to be printed. Okay, so this is how you switch between multiple windows in Selenium. So let's move on to our next program here. In this program, I'm going to automate a web page called Nokri.com. Let's see how you can handle multiple windows in this application. Even this comes under the package called Selenium, and I'm going to create a class called Multiple Window Class. And I'm going to use the annotation in this method. This test annotation tells the J unit that the public void method is attached and can be run as a test case. Okay, so this is the feature of the annotation test under which I'm going to create a function called test multiple windows and I'm going to set the system property to the Chrome driver and specify the path in which the Chrome driver resides followed by the executable file that is Chrome driver dot exe. After that I'm going to instantiate the web driver to the new Chrome driver and also I'll maximize the web page using this command driver dot manage dot window dot maximize. So this particular command helps in maximizing the web page and after this I'm going to get the URL of the web page that is nokri.com and after this I'm going to create a function for the main window which is of the form string and get the window handle of the main window and then I'm going to create a set under which the window handles of all the windows are saved using this command called set string and the object is string and link the driver to get the window handles of all the windows. Okay. And after this, we are going to use the iterator function, which is of the form string, and we are going to link the set to the iterator function. And after this, I'm going to use the while loop, where if the iterator has next, where I'm going to create a child window whose iteration is specified as next. Okay. And then I'm going to use the if command to compare if the main window is not equal to the child window. So if main window equals child window, we are going to switch to the child window using this command called driver dot switch to dot window child window. And then I'm going to print the title of the child window using this command here. Okay, so it is the same that is driver dot switch to dot window child window dot get title which helps in getting the title of the child window and once you get the title of the child window we are going to close this driver function using driver dot close. So all the driver actions that are happening are closed using this command driver dot close and after this we are going to switch back to our main window using this command driver dot switch to dot window main window. Okay, so this is our program. So let's run it. Maximizes the page, opens Nokri.com. You can see that three pages are created here. Closes, yep, all the child window closes. Okay, this is the process, guys. So you can see that the title of each of the child window is printed here. So this is how we automated the web page Nokri.com. Now let's move on to our last program that is Selenium. Let's see what happens here. Even this program comes under the package called Selenium and I've named this class as Selenium under which our main function resides. So first I'm going to set the system property to the Chrome driver and then specify the path in which the Chrome driver resides and then I'm going to instantiate the web driver to the new Chrome driver and get the URL of the page that we are searching. So first we are going to get the title of the web page. So that can be done using this command that is string title driver dot get title. Okay, so it links the Chrome driver to get the title and then we are going to print the title of the web page. And after this, I'm going to use the JavaScript executor, which is an interface that helps in executing the JavaScript through the Selenium web driver. So I'm going to use the JavaScript executor and link it with the driver using this command that is JavaScript executor driver. And then I'm going to find the element on the web page using the element locators in Selenium. That is the CSS selector in this case. Let's take a look at the web page, guys. So I'm going to take edureka, edureka.co. So I'm going to search for this particular search box here. So I'm going to inspect this.
Okay, you can see that the ID is present here, which is the CSS selector. So I'm going to use the crow path in this case. So you can see that the CSS selector of this particular element is specified here. So I'm just going to copy this CSS selector. CSS selector basically deals with the ID. So if there is an ID present here in the element locators, you can use a CSS selector so that it will be easy to find the element using the ID. So I'm just going to copy this CSS selector and go back to our project. OK, so the CSS selector always starts with a hash followed by the ID that was copied. So this is how you represent a CSS selector in Selenium guys. Now we are going to send keys to the element location that is Selenium certification course. And after that I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds using the sleep command. So I'm going to scroll down through a page using the JavaScript executor and the function window dot scroll by by specifying the axis in which it should scroll. So I'm going to consider the y axis in this case. So the x axis is zero and I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds after the scroll and then we need to click the search icon that is present here. So let's go back to our web page. So we need to find this particular search icon on the web page. So to do that I'm going to inspect the page and find the X path of this location. As you can see it is under the span and class is mentioned here. So I'm going to copy this class and click control F so that you get the text box there and X path always starts with two consecutive slashes. So I'm going to use the slashes and specify the span where that is the annotation followed by a bracket and the class is equal to the value of the class that is the type head underscore button and close the bracket. It is single quoted guys and just copy this command and go back to our project. OK, you can see that this is already present here. The X path is specified here and we are going to click that location. That is we are going to click the search icon and then we are going to find the web element called link using the element locators in Selenium that is X path. Let's get back to our web page. And I'm going to search for this course here. OK, so I'm just going to right click and inspect this element. OK, you can see that it is a link all courses data location. So I'm going to find the crow path of this first. So I'm going to use the relative path in this case. So you can see that there is no ID present in this case to use the CSS locator. So I'm going to consider the relative path and copy the relative path and go back to our project. As you can see the location is already present here. That is the relative X path is already present. OK, this is the relative X path that we copied. And after this I'm going to perform some actions on the new window. So to perform some actions I'm going to consider the new window and instantiate it with the new actions of the driver that is our Chrome driver. And after this I'm going to consider the new window keys down that is it refers to the keyboard function keys down shift key and click on the link that is provided. That is the course link that we provided and key up is a keyboard function which means releasing the key function. OK, so in that I'm going to release the key function of the shift and I'm going to build the process and perform the action. So these particular commands help in opening up the new window. And after this I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds so that you can see that the new window is created. And after this I'm going to use the set windows to get the details of all the windows that are currently opened using this driver dot get window handles. And after this we are going to print the set of windows here. That is the unique identification ID of all the windows. In order to know where exactly the error occurs we are going to print a few commands here say a1 a2 here after getting the title and then b1. So these are for a reference to know where exactly the error occurs. OK and after this I'm going to use the set command to set the child windows here out of which I'm going to use the switch to command to switch from the parent window to the current window. OK and after this I'm going to use the if condition say if the title of the web page contains this that is the best training and certification courses for professionals that is edureka we are going to scroll down the page using the javascript executor 
and we are going to use the window scroll by command where we are going to scroll down through a page using the y axis and we are going to pause the execution for three seconds and we are going to find the element using this command driver dot find element by x path which is an element locator in selenium and specify the location in which the element is present so this is the location of the all course and we are going to click on it and after this is done we are going to set the window position to a new position okay so that can be done using driver dot manage dot window dot set position new point that is it specifies the axis in which we want our new position to be there so in this case i'm going to consider the x axis and i'm not going to consider the y axis because we want our new position to be set in the x axis that is minus 2000 that will almost be to our left so this is where we want our new window to be there and after this I'm going to pause the execution for three seconds. I'm going to get the details of all the windows that are currently open using this command set windows one which is of the form string and link the driver to get the details of all the windows and once this is done we are going to print the window handle of the first window that is window one. And after this is done, we are going to switch to our first window using this command driver dot switch to dot window window. So this command helps in switching to the first window and also we will scroll down through the current window using this JavaScript executor command. So we are going to scroll by the Y axis specifying the axis that is 400 and then we are going to quit the driver execution. Okay, now let's save this and execute the program. First, it must open the Edureka website that is edureka.co and then search for the search box here and send keys to it that is Selenium certification course and click on the search icon. Opens the next window and scrolls down and opens the Selenium certification course training. So this is how you handle multiple windows in Selenium guys where you can keep the parent window static and perform actions on the child window and vice versa. In automation, it is mandatory to take the screenshot for the purpose of verification in order to prove that your test case has covered certain functionality. Screenshots also help you a lot when your test case fails so that you can identify what went wrong in your script or in the application. These screenshots are desirable for bug analysis. That's true guys. Selenium can automatically take screenshots during execution. We'll understand how to do that in the course of time. They also help us in understanding the flow of application and also checks if it is behaving accordingly or not. In order to do that, I'm going to use the take screenshot method in which I'm going to typecast the web driver instance. This actually helps while you're performing cross browsing testing as you may require to view the reports of the execution and also tracking the execution would become much easy if you're working on the headless browser and also do note that screenshots of the tests failed can also be easily captured. So this is everything you need to know about why exactly do we need to take a screenshot while testing an application. Now. Let's move ahead and learn how exactly you can take a screenshot. To capture a screenshot in Selenium, we make use of an interface take screenshot. Okay. This method basically indicates the driver that it can capture a screenshot and store it in different ways. So the syntax goes something like this. It says file creating an object of it, take screenshot and link it to the driver and you'll get a method which says get screenshot as. So we are going to get the screenshot as a file. So I'm going to specify the output type as file and now we'll learn more about this get screenshot as method. In order to capture screenshot and store it in a particular location, I use a method called get screenshot as. So let's understand this in detail. So the syntax goes something like this. It says get screenshot as output type where x is the return type of the method and specify the target where the target holds the destination address. It might throw an exception. So I'm going to specify the web driver exception in a default way. This exception is thrown if the underlying implementation does not support screenshot capturing. 
So this is how you take a screenshot in Selenium. Now let me walk you through a demo which will make you understand how exactly you can take a screenshot. So to do that we require the Java libraries in our system. So I'm just going to check if the Java libraries are present or not. So I'm going to open the command prompt. And type Java. Hyphen version. As you can see the Java version installed in my system is 1.8.0. So the Java libraries are present in my system. Now I require an IDE to write my test scripts. So I prefer working on the Eclipse IDE because it's user friendly and this platform can be used to develop rich client applications, IDEs and so on. So I'm just going to open this IDE. Launch the workspace. So in this case I've already written the code here guys so that you can understand how easily it works. Okay, this is the Eclipse workspace and I've already created two projects here by the name screens and screenshot. So the first thing you need to do when you're working on Selenium is to download the Selenium dependencies or the Selenium jar files. As this is not a test ng program or a Maven program, I'm going to consider adding the external jar files to this project. So I'm just going to right click on my project and go to build path, configure build path. Where I've added all the Selenium jar files. I've also added test ng for my reference. So this is the Selenium jar files and you need to add the Selenium standalone server too. Okay, so apply and close. You will see a folder being created by the name reference libraries, which holds all the Selenium jar files. And the source field is where we'll write our code. And I've created another folder by the name screenshots, which holds the screenshot. As you can see, there is a screenshot over here. So I'm just going to clear this. I'm going to delete it. Okay. So the screenshot folder is empty for now. Now let's take a look at our source folder. Okay. Created a package and there's a class screen. So in this case, I'm going to just create a class by the name screen and include the main function in it, which throws exceptions. That means all the exceptions that are caught during the program are not executed. Okay, so I'm going to set the browser driver to the Chrome driver. I prefer working on the Chrome driver guys because it's easy to implement. So system dot set property specify the web driver and also specify the path in which it exists. So in my case, it's in the C drive and also don't forget to mention the executable file, which is Chrome driver dot exe or else Chrome driver won't open. Okay, and after this, I'm going to instantiate the web driver instance to new Chrome driver. You might get an error here for both web driver and Chrome driver. Just click on it and import the web driver packages. The same goes to the Chrome driver as well. And after that, I'm going to get the URL of the web page. So to do that, I'm going to consider the object of the web driver that is driver dot get and specify the URL. Okay, so in my case, it's edureka.co. You can take whichever website you want guys and after that I'm going to consider the method take screenshot. This method basically helps in taking a screenshot. So I'm just going to create a package of it and link the take screenshot method with the driver so that it's in an executable format. And the major thing you need to do to take a screenshot is to specify the source and the destination folder so that if you take a screenshot it would be easy for you to navigate it through. So I'm going to consider the format of a file so that it would be easy to understand. So specify the source here and consider the object of the take screenshot that is TS. You will get a suggestion which says take screenshot as this method. I think you guys have understood what exactly this does. So this method helps in capturing the screenshot and stores it in a particular location. So the output type of it will be in the form of a file. Okay. And after this, I'm going to consider the class file utils, which basically helps in writing, copying the files, making the directory, including the parent directories, deleting and so on. It provides all the necessary facilities. So after specifying the file utils, I'm going to copy the file from the source to a new file and specify the path. So in this case, I have the file name as screenshot. You can see that the folder name is screenshot, which comes under the screen. 
and I'm going to copy the file from the source file to the destination file. For the destination, I'm going to consider a new file and specify the path of it. That is this folder, guys. So I'm just going to right click on it. Properties and this is the location of the file. So this is one way and the other way that you can do is dot slash the name of the folder slash the project name and also specify the name of the project. So in my case it is screenshot. OK, but it's screen here. So I'm just going to change the name of the screen here or I'm just going to make it screenshot here. And do note to add dot PNG in the format because we want an image. OK, so I'm just going to save it and I'm going to print this particular text. It says the screenshot is taken and I'm going to quit the driver execution. OK, so I'm just going to save it and run the program. Navigates to Eureka page. Exits the driver execution. It also prints that the screenshot is taken. OK, so I'm just going to refresh this folder. So I'm just going to copy the source file to the destination file that I'll create a new file and name it screenshots. That is the same as this. So I'm just going to write dot slash screenshots and specify the file name. That is screenshot.png. You can write whatever you want, guys. Now I'll change it to screens. Do note that it must be in the .png format because we need an image. And after this, I'm going to print this particular text. The screenshot is taken. And once this is done, I'm going to quit the driver execution. So let's save this and run it. It first navigates to edureka.co clicks the screenshot and exits the navigation and it prints the screenshot is taken okay so let's refresh this folder okay you can see that the screenshot is taken with the name screens so this is how you take a screenshot in selenium web driver i hope you guys understood how to take a screenshot using the take screenshot method Moving ahead, we'll understand how to take a screenshot of the test failed. Selenium WebDriver has come up with some great new functionalities that makes the testing of an application easy. This is because the WebDriver architecture allows the interaction outside the JavaScript sandbox. One of the new useful functionality is being able to take screenshots using WebDriver. You can take a screenshot at any stage of the test, but mostly it is used when a test fails and taking screenshot helps the analysis so that we can see what went wrong during the test failure. This can be done using the test ng annotations. So to do that, I'll first create a class and then implement the test ng listener that is I test listener. So let's see how this can be done. So even in this case, I've written the project guys so that you can easily understand this. So first you need to create a new Maven project. I'll show you guys how exactly to do that. So new Maven project. And create a new simple project next and you have to provide the group ID and the artifact ID that is the name of your project. So I already have one. So I'm going to cancel it and go to screens. OK, so these are all the fields that are there in a Maven project. Source main Java, source main resources, source test Java, source test resources, Java libraries, Maven libraries, and also you need to include the test ng libraries. So right click on your project, go to build path, configure build path. So you can easily get this test ng library. So I'll show you guys how exactly you can do it. Just remove it, add library. You can find the test ng library here. So next, finish. The test ng libraries are added to your project. So apply and close. And I've created another folder by the name screenshots taken, which holds the screenshots. Okay, so I'm just going to empty this folder. Yeah, you can see that this folder is empty. And you need to add the Selenium dependencies to your pom.xml file. In this case, we are not adding any jar files from the build paths procedure. 
okay all we need to do is go to the maven repository search for selenium get the dependencies paste it here so i've pasted the selenium libraries junit testng and commons io and then we use the apache io which is a library of utilities to assist with developing io functionalities we need to create a testng xml file so this file holds the class name that we want to execute so the class name is specified here you need not change any of it just specify the class name over here so the package name comes in the beginning because the package that i've created is com.edureka so i'm going to write my test scripts in source test java folder so under this com.edureka package exists so the package and the class that i want to execute so this is the testng xml file okay so let's understand this in detail. So first I'll walk you through the base class. So this class basically contains all the necessary resources. Like first I'm going to specify the web driver and I'm going to globally declare it by creating an object of it. And I'm going to create a function by name initialization. So this function basically helps you in initializing the browser instances. Okay. So first I'm going to set the browser driver. As I told you, I'm going to be working on Chrome driver, so I'm going to specify Chrome driver and the path in which it exists, followed by the extension Chrome driver exe, which specifies that it's an executable file. And then I'm going to instantiate the driver with the new Chrome driver and get the URL of the web page. So in this case, I'm going to consider the same page that is edureka.co, or else I'm going to consider the blog page. Okay, save it. And after this, I'm going to create another function by name failed. And in this, I'm going to write the take screenshot method. So I'm going to consider the take screenshot method and link it with the driver and get screenshot as the output type file. I'm going to call this in the form of a file. So I'm going to call file here and specify the object of a file that is source file. And I'm going to write this file utils function under try catch so that if there are any exceptions during execution, it will be caught. So I'm going to write the file utils class and copy the file from the source file to the new file that is the destination file. So in this case, right click on it, go to properties. So this is the path in which it exists. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it over here. And once this is done, we need to specify the file name, which is in the form of an image. So I'm going to name this as test. So I'm going to name this as test cases failed dot png okay save it so this basically helps to save the screenshot in this particular folder okay so this is about the base class okay and these are all the packages that we are going to import in this program this is output type file utils take screenshot web driver chrome driver i don't think we've used the test ng annotation but okay so i'm just going to take this off save it and let's move ahead and go to our demo class this method is way too simple compared to the base class. All you need to do is create a class demo which extends the base class. That is, it inherits all the properties of the base class. I'm going to specify before method under which I'm going to call this function setup, under which I'm going to call this initialization method. So, this is a function call, and every time this initialization method is called, this will link to the base class. So it will instantiate the web driver instance, opens the Chrome driver, and so on. So after this, I'm going to write the after method. So this method is run after each test method. And under this, I'm going to create a function called teardown. And in this, I'm going to quit the driver execution. Okay. And once this is done, I'm going to create an annotation called test. So this basically marks a class or a method as a part of the test. Okay, so this is actually a part of this test and under which I'm going to create a function called take screenshot test. So whenever the function is executed, this method is called. So this is included in our project now. So take screenshot test under which I'm going to assert this alerts basically helps in taking a decision in the middle of the test run. So these alerts are most popular and frequently used methods while creating Selenium scripts. So I'm going to assert as assert equals if 
if these two are true it will conclude or it will execute that the test cases have successfully run so we don't want the test cases to be successful so i'm going to write the converse of it so i'm going to specify true here the actual value is true and the expected value will be false so this will definitely throw an assertion error and after this i'm going to import the test packages after method packages and the before method packages so once this is done we'll understand how this exactly works okay so before that we'll take a look at the listeners class okay this is our listeners class so first i'm going to create a class called listeners class which extends the base class and also implements the i test listener and after you mouse over here you will get add unimplemented method so these are all the unimplemented methods guys and i'm going to consider this particular function that is on test failure i'm going to print failed test and i'm going to call this function failed this is a function call guys okay so once this is done it will automatically print that the test just failed okay so the thing is we use listeners in order to listen to a particular event but in this case the demo class has no link to this listeners class so in order to make the demo class listen to this particular class or event we use the listeners annotations and specify the listeners class that is the name of the class and dot class okay so this helps in listening to the listeners class okay so let's try to execute this program let's save it and i click on it and run as test ng it should first navigate to the block page it says failed test one test run successfully it's printed failed test and it also specifies where it has failed this is the method which failed like i said it will throw the assertion error it says expected false but found true okay so our test case has failed successfully so i'm going to refresh this folder yeah it says test cases failed dot png and it got the screenshot of the web page Let's see what is cross browser testing. Cross browser testing refers to testing of an application in multiple browsers like Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, Safari so that we can test our application effectively. Cross browser testing is a very important concept in automation because here the actual automation comes into the picture. So consider an example. Suppose say if you have 20 test cases to execute manually. So for you it is not a big deal. because you can execute it within one or two days however at the same test cases has to be executed in five different browsers which means there are 100 test cases then probably you will take a week or more than that time and it also turns out to be quite boring and time consuming so what if you try to automate these 20 test cases and run them obviously it will not take more than one or two hour and it will also be very efficient based on your test case complexity So this is where the actual cross browser testing comes into the picture. Having understood this, now let's see why do you need a cross browser testing in Selenium. So before I tell you the need for cross browser testing, let me tell you what is cross browser compatibility. It is nothing but ability of a website or a web application to function across different browsers and different operating systems. which means your web application or website should work absolutely fine across all the different browsers like chrome microsoft firefox safari and even across all the operating systems like windows mac ios etc and that's where you need to understand the concept of cross browser testing so now let's see why do you need cross browser testing basically a simple website is comprised of three major technologies that is html5 CSS3 and JavaScript but there are hundreds of technologies that are there in the back end like you have Python Ruby Node.js etc and all of these back end technologies can be used but overall in the front end in the rendering only these three technologies are used 
However, each browser use a completely different rendering engine to compute these three technologies. For example, Google Chrome uses Blink, Firefox uses Gecko, and Internet Explorer uses Edge, HTML, and Chakra because of which same website would be rendered completely differently by all these different browsers. And that's exactly why you need a cross browser testing. For the better experience, you need to do cross browser testing so that the customer will get the same UI of application even if we use different or any browser. Along with these facts, let me tell you few reasons that depicts why we should perform cross browser testing. First reason is browser compatibility with different OS. That is, you need to check the browser compatibility with all the different operating systems. Next, image orientation. Next, compatibility with the new web framework. And also, each browser have the different orientation of JavaScript, which can cause issues sometimes. So these are the few reasons that depicts why one should perform cross browser testing of a website. Now that you know what is cross browser testing and why do you need it? Let's move further and get the hands on on this. Now let's see how to perform cross browser testing. It is basically done with two methods. First manual method second automated method. So in case of manual method a business identifies the browsers that the application must support. Testers then rerun the same test cases using different browsers and observe the application's behavior and report bugs if any. In this type of testing, it is not possible to cover many browsers and also the application might not be tested on major browser versions. And also, performing cross browser check manually is costly and time consuming as well. Now, coming to automated method. Cross browser testing is basically running the same set of test cases multiple times on different browsers. This type of repeated task is best suited for automation. Thus, it's more cost and time effective to perform this testing by using tools. Now, let's see how it is performed in automated way using Selenium Web Driver. If you are using Selenium Web Driver, you can automate the test cases using Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Edge, and many more. Next, in order to execute the test cases with different browsers in the same machine at the same time, you can integrate TestNG framework with Selenium Web Driver. And finally, you can write the test cases to check for the cross browser compatibility of your website. Now, let's see a small demo that illustrates how the cross browser compatibility works and how your website works perfectly fine in all the different browsers and in a parallel way. I have already written a code over here. First, I have created a class called cross browser script and I have declared the variable for my driver. And you can see here I have used at before test annotation because this is something that will execute before the test. And the parameters that I will be passing is browser because I need browser to check the compatibility of all the different browsers and that is the reason I am using it with at parameters annotation. Next, what I'm doing, I'm setting up browser, that is a string variable. Next, so in this program, first I will tell you how to check the cross browser compatibility of one website and two different browsers parallelly. That is, I'm going to run my website and perform the cross browser testing and check the cross browser compatibility of my website in Firefox browser and Chrome browser as well. So, first, what I will do, I will check if browser equals to Firefox. Then what I will do, I will create the instance of Firefox driver using this web driver because I have already declared a variable of that. And then I will set the system properties of my Gecko driver. And this is the path where I have saved my Gecko driver in my system. And then I will create an object of that. So this is a code that I want to check for Firefox browser. Next, in the else if condition, I'm again checking if the browser equals to Chrome. I'm ignoring the case because I don't need if there is any issue with the case. And again, what I'm doing, I'm using system.set property and giving the path of my Chrome driver. And this is where I have saved my Chrome driver. And I'm creating a new object of the Chrome driver. And in the else condition, I'm throwing an exception telling browser is not correct if in case there's no Firefox browser and there is no Chrome browser. And finally, I'm giving an implicit wait of 10 seconds because I want to wait on that particular website for 10 seconds unless and until a page gets loaded. 
that is the maximum time I am giving it. It can be even less also no issues and now I am using add test annotation. Why because this is what is happening in my test. So first thing what I am doing I am creating a method that is test parameter with XML that throws an interrupted exception because I have used red dot sleep for four milliseconds. So first what I will do I will navigate through edureka.co website and then I will hit on the login button. So the first thing what I will do is I will hit on this login button. I want to enter the email name and password hit on the login button after I hit on the login button. I want to search for selenium. So that is what I'm doing here. So first using driver.get I will navigate to edureka.co website and I'm creating a web element called login because I want to find the element with the help of a link text locator that has login as a value. Next I want to hit the login button. So I'm clicking that is I'm giving login dot click next. I'm using thread dot sleep because I want gap of four milliseconds between all the actions that I'm performing on the browser and next what I'm doing once it clicks on the login. I want to enter the username and I'm finding the element by ID and this is the value for that. You'll get it as you inspect it over here like this. I'll show you how so I'm just inspecting an email text box. And you can see I have ID attribute whose value is SI pop up email and the same thing goes with password as well. So I'm sending the keys for my username as the email address. And again, I'm creating a new web element for password and locating with the help of an ID attribute with its value as I pop up password. And finally, I'm sending the password. And now I want to hit on the login button. So this is how I'm finding it with the help of an XPath because when I inspect on this, so when I inspect this login button, you can see I'll click on the crow path over here and you can see there's a relative XPath for that. So I have just copied the relative XPath and pasted it in my code. So this is the XPath for the login button. Next, I'm going to click on that because as you all know, it is a button and not the text box. And next what I want to do, I want to search selenium in the search box. That is this one. So again, I will inspect on this and you can see there's a CSS selector for that, which can be written by using search input. You can also search it with the help of an ID telling search input. And finally, I'm sending the keys as selenium. And now say I want to hit on this search button also. I'll simply inspect that copy the relative X path and write the code that is going to be web element. I'll give it as search button and I'll write driver dot find element by X path. And this will be the value of my X path and I'm going to end it over here and I'm taking the search button dot click because it is a button. So this is the actions that I'm performing on my website. So that is the reason it is followed by a test annotation. But before my test I'm just launching the browsers. So that is the reason I'm using it as before test. Now what I have to do I have to write an XML file of test ng. So I have already written over here. So you can see this is a basic step that will comprise of an XML version. It's encoding and the doc type. So my test name is test suit. Thread count will be three and the tests are running in parallel. So it is parallel is equal to test. So the first test will be Chrome test. So the parameter name will be browser value will be Chrome and inside the classes. I'm going to give my class name as code or edureka dot pages dot cross browser script. So the package of this class file is co.edureka.pages followed by the class name. I will end that next again. I'll open the new test that will be Firefox test and the parameter name will be same browser, but the value will be Firefox and again the class name will be edureka.pages.cross browser script and I will end the test save this. So now let's run and check the output. So I'll be running this test ng.xml file on a test suit. Because I want to know how many test cases have been run successfully and how many skips were there and how many failures are there. So I will run it on test ng suit. Let's check for the output. So you can see it detected the version of test ng. It is launching the instance of Chrome driver and Firefox driver. And it first launched Google Chrome because that was the first instance. And now parallelly it launched Firefox as well. 
so you can see even here it entered the login credentials and it got into the page and even here as well even on the Mozilla Firefox it entered the credentials and it is giving selenium search you can see even on this it first entered selenium and I can search for any of the courses in our edureka website yes so here as well so I can check from the selenium course so what happened exactly on the browsers first it launched Google Chrome browser it hit on the login button entered the credentials for username and password and then what it did it gave the search for selenium on chrome browser and on the other hand even on the firefox browser it executed all these actions in a simultaneously with chrome driver but there was a delay of two to three seconds because it was the second instance and my chrome browser was the first instance and that is the reason there was a delay but both the actions happened simultaneously there was no any different actions that was happened in the different browsers, but same website was launched same locators were used to perform actions and send the values. Yes, so this is how you can perform cross browser testing using selenium on different browsers. So you can see here on the test suit the total test that was run was two. There were no failures and there were no skips. So I want to add one more browser say edge. And I want to again set the system properties and create an edge instance. So this is how I will be adding one more browser in my else if condition. Rest things will be the same. And I have to add one more instance for this as well. I'm going to give it after Firefox. So what I'll do after this, I will add that. So here what I will do, I will add one more test name that will be the edge test. And then the browser will be same. The value of the browser will be edge followed by the class name. So again what I will do I will save both the programs and run. So now let's see how the same actions will be performed simultaneously and parallelly in all the three different browsers. So it started executing. So first Google Chrome was launched. It will perform all the actions and you can see that Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. Next Mozilla Firefox was launched and again it will perform all the same actions on this as well. And now you can see that edge is launched. It will hit on the login button. It will enter all the credentials. So here it's completed everything and even on edge. And now it will give the search for selenium. So again, you can choose from one of them simple. So you can see that in all the three different browsers that is Google Chrome Mozilla Firefox and in Microsoft Edge. So you just saw that in all the three different browsers the website worked perfectly fine and performed all the actions on all the three different web browsers. So it means the cross browser check or the cross browser compatibility testing was working fine in all the browsers. So this is how you need to write a selenium script in order to check the cross browser compatibility of your browser so that you can ensure that your website works perfectly fine in different types of browsers and different versions of browsers as well. So again if you wish to add one or two more browsers you need to write the selenium script like the way I wrote and you can go ahead and execute the same thing and it will give you the execution as well. But your driver should support all the different versions of the browsers. So just make sure whether the driver supports your version or not and accordingly you can go ahead and execute the test cases. And if you wish to know how to perform cross browser testing using one of the most amazing tool that is Lambda test you can check out our YouTube playlist wherein you will get a video called cross browser testing using Lambda test and also you can learn that as well. So now I hope that you understood how to perform cross browser testing using Selenium web driver. Now that you know how it works. Let's also have a look at the benefits or the advantages of carrying out cross browser compatibility testing. First, it resolves the issues that might keep the vital functions of the web application. So, what it is? A web application that performs exactly as desired in one browser could have some issues when it runs in another web browser. These issues include factors that might keep the essential functions of the application from working simultaneously. For anyone who wants to have a website or application with a professional look, cross browser compatibility testing is essential. 
It is not that web browsers on personal computers are a concern here. But with the ever increasing advancement of phone and tablet with their web accessibilities, there is also a need for cross browser testing of web application to extend to mobile web browsers. And for this mobile web browsers and your tablets and your laptops, everything, Lambda test is also one of the best tools. And for all these things, cross browser testing using Selenium is one of the best suitable tool for all of this. Next. It makes your web application successful and draws more customers. The times of Internet Explorer or Netscape dominance are over. The more enhanced your web application is and the more customers you have, the more success will be your browser usage. In this regard, Google Chrome has just passed Internet Explorer to become the most popular web browser in the world. If you want to ensure that you don't lose customers owing to the lack of support for the one of these three important browsers, you should consider testing your web application on all the three browsers that is Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Internet Explorer. Next, it not only improves just the look and feel but also the functionality of the application. And also it eliminates the need for developing and maintaining separate tests. Because conducting automated tests can be recorded in one browser and then played back in other supported browser that needs new test automation technology. So this is very simple. I hope you understood this. So these are a few of the advantages of using cross browser testing and why one needs to perform cross browser testing on your website. Now I hope that you got a clear idea about why it is important. Let's understand what is data driven framework. Data driven is a test automation framework which stores the test data in a table or a spreadsheet format. This allows automation engineers to have a single test script which can execute tests for all the test data in the table. In this framework, input values are read from the data file and then they are stored into a variable in test scripts. And data-driven testing enables both positive and negative test cases into a single sheet. So basically, first, the expected output will be defined and then we will match whether the actual output matches with the expected output or not. So in data driven test automation framework input data can be stored in a single or multiple data sources like XLS XML CSV and databases. Now that you know what is data driven framework. Let's move further and understand the types of parameterization in test ng. In order to understand the parameterization more in a more clear way, let's go through the parameterization option in one of the most popular framework in Selenium WebDriver that is TestNG. So basically, there are two ways by which we can achieve parameterization in TestNG. First, with the help of parameter annotation and TestNG XML file. So basically, you will use add parameters annotation and you will provide the name and the search key. And the next one is with data provider annotation. So in this instead of parameter annotation, you will use the data provider annotation and you will search for the given provider. So this is the difference between these two among these types of parameterization in this session. I will be discussing data provider annotation in test ng. If you wish to know about parameter annotation, then stay tuned for the upcoming video on parameter annotation in test ng. For now, let's understand what is data provider in test ng. If you want to provide the test data, then you need to declare a method that returns a data set in a form of two dimensional object array. The first array represents a data set, whereas the second array contains a parameter values. The data provider method can be in the same test class or in one of its superclasses. It is also possible to provide data provider in another class, but then the method has to be static. Once you have added this method, you need to annotate it using add data provider annotation, like the way how you write the data provider. And that will help the test ng to know that it is a data provider method. You can also provide a name to it using the name attribute of the data provider annotation, but this can be optional. If one has not provided the name, then the name of the method will be used to refer it. If a test wants to use a data provider, it can do so by specifying the name of the data provider in data provider attribute of test annotation. So this is all about what is data provider in test ng. Now that you know what is data provider in test ng, 
let's move further and understand how actually it works through parameterization. So by now you all might be aware that data provider eases the task of testing multiple sets of data to fill thousands of web forms using our testing framework. You need a different methodology which can gives us a very large data set in the single execution flow and this data driven concept is achieved by data provider annotation in test ng. It has only one attribute name. If you do not specify the name attribute, then the data provider's name will be the same as that of the corresponding method name. And also, it returns a two dimensional Java object to the test method. Now, let's get hands on into the data provider in test ng with the help of examples. So, first, I will pass the data from the get data method to the data provider. So, in the first example, I will pass the data from get data method to the data provider. I will also send the data into three rows and two columns. That is, I will pass three different usernames and password. Let's take a look at the code now. So, first I have created a package and then I have created a class called data provider example in the package called code.edureka.pages. Next, as I have already mentioned, that I will pass the data from get data method. And that is the reason I'm using at test annotation and data provider is equal to get data. Next, I'm creating a method called set data and passing string username and password. So I'll simply write print statements like username is so and so and the password is so and so. Next, I want to create an array object that is two dimensional array. So what I'll do, I'll use data provider annotation. I'll create a method called public object that is an array object get data because I want to refer it from this one. So next I'm going to create the object of a new array and that will be three rows and two columns as I have already mentioned that is I will pass three different usernames and password that is username and password is two columns but the rows will be three because I'm passing three different username and password. So at data of zero and zero suppose say if you plot a graph at zero and zero what I will have I will have a user one and at zero one that is first row first column will be user one next first row second column will be the password next second row first column will comprise of the second user second row second column will comprise of the second password again the same thing for the third row as well third row first column will be user three and the third row second column will be the password so this is how i have created my array object and finally what i will say i will say return the data so this is very simple. Let's first understand this and then I will tell you how to integrate with selenium and how does it actually works with test ng. So now let's run it as a test ng test and check for the output. So you can see that test ng version was detected and it printed the username and password for all the combinations that is the first username first password second username and password and the third username and password. Then I have created an array of object and that's the reason in the set data method that is this one it's printing as user one and the password of the user one then second user and the password of the user two and the third user and its password. So this is how you can provide the data using data provider annotation. So you can see that on default test the test that was run was three. There was no failures and there were no skips. Also on the default suit as well. There were three tests that were successfully run and there were no failures and no skips. So which means your test got executed perfectly fine. If you wish to know how exactly test ng works and what are the various annotations in test ng you can check out the YouTube playlist and you will get the videos and you can learn in depth about these concepts. For now, let's take a look at the other example and understand how it works. Now let's understand one more example where I will be providing the data into Facebook website using data provider. So in this example, what I will do, I will type the username and password and log in into facebook.com. In this test case, it should run two times with a different set of data. That is we have provided it in a two dimensional array. Let's check that now. So first what I will do the same thing. I've created a class and it will take the data from the data provider which we have created. That is I'm using at test annotation and data provider will be the name and the test data will be the search key. 
yes i hope you remember that i've showed it before and now what i will do i'm just creating a method called test firefox because i'm using a firefox website you can give it any name and i'm passing two parameters like username and password so this is how i need to set the system properties and create object of a new firefox driver if you want to use chrome driver again you can use chrome driver there is no doubt in that so i want to maximize the browser window so i'll say driver.manage.window.maximize and using driver.get i'm navigating through facebook.com and next i want to clear the email field suppose say that there's some data already present so i want to clear that so that's the reason what i'm doing i'm just giving it as driver.find element by id i'm using id locator and the value of the id locator is email and dot clear after it gets cleared then i want to enter the username and password so what i will do i will type driver.find element by id again email dot send keys as username so this username will be referred from where i have given the username as and again i have to clear the password field and then again enter the password yes so if you wish to know about the locators about id locator about name xpath everything again you can check out the video in youtube playlist and you can get hands on over it so next what i am doing is i am using a data provider annotation and pass the name is equal to test data and next what i am doing i am creating a method and creating a object array with two rows and two columns first parameter is row and the second parameter is column now i have to enter the data to row 0 column 0 i hope you remember in the previous example that what we did we simply entered the data right the same way so at row 0 column 0 it will enter the username as this and at row 0 column 1 it will enter the password as this one again next to row 1 column 0 it will enter the second username and to row 1 column 1 it will enter the second password and finally i have to return the facebook data because facebook data is the object that i have created that is the reason it will do that if i want to enter more details i can again enter it over here there won't be any issue with that so now let's run it as a test ng test and check the output as these are not valid credentials for username and password it won't log in simple now that you can see it is launching mozilla firefox browser that is geeko driver is launching firefox and now you can see that it's navigating through facebook.com it entered the username and the password again you can see it launched firefox for the second time navigated through facebook.com it entered the second username and the second password yes so you can see here that the test firefox was passed for username and password So default test that was run was two, and on the default suit also, there were no failures and skips. So if I provide ten records or twenty records or hundred records, this will pass because there is no doubt in that. So if you have hundreds and thousands of data sets, then you can use Excel sheet to store the data and then provide the path of the Excel file in your code. So that will help you to process all the records present in the Excel file. So simply you can create package and you can create a simple excel file and you can enter all the datas like username and password if you want to enter age any details it can be depending on that you just have to create a array object it can be any length any dimension and you have to just pass the values as i just wanted to provide two records i'm just creating it in the program else i'll just refer to the excel sheet path and i can process the records So you can see here there was two different Facebook pages where it entered the first username and the password and it entered second username and password. So which means it was able to provide the data using data provider. If not it would have thrown any error over here. But it did not do. Why? Because our test cases run perfectly fine. So this is how it works. Basically this was used to check whether the data provider was successfully able to provide the data into Facebook login page or not. So basically this is how it works. We need to use a Selenium framework because finding and fixing a very small bug in a million line code is insanely challenging. And besides, as a Selenium tester, we need automation, right? We need automation in places like fitting the data to the data script. Because how many times will you have a single data script in which you'll be manually changing the data? 
how many times will you feed different data to your data script to make sure that different test cases succeed you need automation for that reason and you need your code to be simple you should be able to understand your code and if you have a bug you should be able to easily and efficiently fix that bug right for these reasons you need to use a selenium framework i'm pretty sure i'm not making too much sense right now so let me go forward and explain what i'm talking about in more detail but before i go forward let me tell you what are the benefits of a selenium framework first and foremost when you implement a selenium framework there is increased code reusage which is a very very good thing because if your code is too big you will have a problem understanding your code smaller the code the better and when we say code reusage it means that you will have a small piece of code for a particular functionality and at a later point of time if you need to use a, the same functionality then you can call that particular code instead of rewriting that same code right you can reuse that code which you've written earlier that's the benefit the second benefit is that there is improved code readability it means that when your code is smaller and it follows the framework pattern then your code is more readable there's unwanted complexity for every single functionality you will have a small piece of code and if you want to modify any functionality if you want to modify the test for a particular functionality you need to only modify a small piece of code and modifying that small piece of code will not have any dependency on other parts if you're having one single test script in which you're testing five different functionalities then the code is going to be pretty huge right by making changes to one part of the code you might be affecting other parts right the other functionalities so you can avoid that by breaking the entire code into smaller parts of code and then testing them the next benefit is that with the help of a selenium framework there is higher portability so if you have a smaller piece of code that code can be moved easily to another package or to another project or if you want to just use it later for some other purpose you can do that there's no stopping you and most of all your script maintenance is going to be very very simple because if there is something that you want to change you'll be changing only that part and that will not affect anything else in your code because it's going to be a very small class or a small method in a small test case which you will have to modify nothing more nothing less right so these are some of the benefits of a selenium framework and now that you people have understood this part let me go forward and uh, start off with our actual topics okay let's start with what is a selenium framework and as it says here a selenium framework is just a code structure to make your code maintenance simpler and to make your code readability better and there are various frameworks that we can use like i said earlier we have something called as a data driven framework we have a keyword driven framework and we have a hybrid framework so a data driven framework is a technique wherein you would be separating your test script and your data set so whatever data you want to feed that would be separated from your actual test case okay and a keyword driven framework is something similar but yet different the difference is that instead of separating the data set from the test script we will be separating the methods which need to be executed in that same test script so you have a test script and the methods which need to be executed in this test script to make sure you're testing the application those methods will be stored separately that's it that is the only difference and then we have hybrid framework which basically implements the best features of both of these frameworks okay so these are the types and uh, let me get started with uh, explaining each of them one after the other and of course i'm going to give you a demonstration okay so let's start with a data driven framework a data driven framework is a testing strategy in which the data set under test is stored separately from the test script let's take an example of me logging into a web application and i want to test that success okay and if i want to basically achieve automation then what i'm going to do is i'm going to separate the data set in my case the data set is going to be the username and the password fields correct these details if i have uh, let's say 10 or 5 sets of these login credentials i will store them separately in a different file in my case i'm going to store it in an excel file and uh, basically my test script will only contain the functionality to test the web application and whenever it needs data to enter into the login button or into the password button then it would fetch it from the excel file and then feed it over there and then continue with the execution of the test okay so that's how simple that is and the uh, big benefit with uh, implementing this data driven framework is that your automation testing here is driven by your data set so basically at a later point of time if you want to change the data set you can do it without affecting your code okay you just need to go and edit your excel file and nothing more you can have 50 credentials there you can have 100 credentials there you can have any number and that's not going to impact your 
code here okay and the best part is the same script is going to be used for n number of tests so having said this let me go to the next slide and ask you this question here can selenium web driver read data from an excel file for input because that's what we're trying to achieve here correct and the answer for this is no selenium web driver cannot on its own read data from an excel file and then will come the next question you can ask if it cannot read then how will we feed the data from the excel to the web driver correct that's a brilliant question and the answer to that is we can use an external tool called apache poi okay you can use apache poi for both reading and writing operations on microsoft files not just excel files okay so apache poi is an open source uh, tool and it's a library which is nothing but a set of programs or a set of functions which allows us to read create or uh, edit these microsoft documents using java okay so let me go forward and uh, get to more details this is going to be the demo that i'm going to show you okay i have my excel file here something similar to this in one column i have my username credentials and in the other column i have my password credentials and these two need to be sent as a pair to my program to execute my test and as part of apache poi there is something called as a data provider function and this data provider function is what i'm going to use to basically read my data from the excel file okay this is the method which is going to do that for me let me explain this uh, code but before that let me go and open up my eclipse which is going to be the IDE where I will be working and on this Eclipse IDE let me give you more details so this is my Eclipse and I have this project here right selenium frameworks demo so this is my project and inside this project I have three packages one is for data driven the other is keyword driven and the third is hybrid framework so I will be showing you a demonstration of these three Okay, so let me open up data driven first and uh, open up these two classes Which is going to be my demo now the DDT Excel dot Java class, right? This is going to be my main class or my main test case Which is going to do the functionality, but just to read data from an external Excel file I've written another class and here I've used Apache POI functionalities. Okay, so I've used this XSSF workbook and XSSF sheet now these two are very prominent libraries or uh, let's say functions that come with Apache POI. I'm using them to read my uh, Excel sheet and then get data from there. Let me first start off by uh, explaining this main class of mine. Okay. So here what I've done is I've imported these set of libraries. These are very simple and uh, you should know why I've imported them. So let me just minimize this and coming to my class. So basically the first thing I've done in my class is I have created a Chrome driver object and I've created this outside because uh, I want to do it globally because all my other functionalities all my other methods which is uh, containing the functionality to perform the test they all have at the rate test annotations and because I cannot have my Chrome driver inside one of these annotations I have uh, defined it globally outside and coming to the next line I have an at the rate test annotation to basically execute my method here and my method is demo project Okay, and uh, to this demo project method, I will have to provide my username and password credentials. So I've used the driver.find element command to pass the username and the password credentials to my web driver. Okay, I have uh, specified that I want to perform the test on this particular uh, URL, and I've of course set the system property over here. Okay, and most importantly, I have mentioned that the data provider for this is test data. So what this means is there is an external method and the method which has the annotation name as data provider will be the method that will be passing the username and password credentials to this particular method of mine okay so adrate test is the annotation here and if you come down i have another method here right public object so this method has been annotated with data provider so this means that the username and password credentials will be read by this method and passed to this particular method of mine okay guys and uh, basically everything else is very simple so once i have uh, passed it to my web driver i'm just trying to uh, log in by pressing the click button and then i'm waiting for some time till the entire functionality takes place and i'm verifying if my login is successful or if it's not successful i'm doing that by getting the uh, title of my web page so 
when I log in this is going to be the title. Okay, this is supposed to be the title of the web page. So what I obtain and store in this get title variable if that matches this then my test is a pass right if it does not then it's invalid and after that I have another small method which is basically to terminate my session. So I've used an after method annotation for that. Let's say when all the methods get completely executed that time this will be executed and uh, my program will quit. Now let me go to this part of my uh, program which is nothing but the data provider and explain you how I'm reading data into this method. So I've created this method as an array. Okay. And here what I'm doing is I'm calling my second class. So the read Excel file here, right? So this is a class and uh, as you can see, this is the same read Excel file class and I'm creating an object instance of that class. And as you know, this is the rule to create an object, right? And while creating an object of this read Excel file class, I am passing the place where my login credentials are present. So the Excel file is called as login credentials dot XLSX and it's present in this path. So I'm just feeling the path. Okay. So basically when this class is called from uh, that method, it's called along with the Excel path, right? It's uh, passed with some parameters and that is what is received over here. Now the funny thing that you might notice here is there is another method that I've started with the same name as the class. So when you have a method in your class, which has the same name as your class, then that's called as a constructor. Okay, so it's not technically a method. It's basically a constructor which has the same name as my class name. So this constructor has the path where my Excel file is present. Okay, and here I'm just uh, using a try catch block to catch any exception if it arises. Okay, and what I'm doing is uh, as you can see there is something called as X SSF workbook and X SSF sheet, right? Now these two are uh, inbuilt libraries that come with Apache POI and uh, I have created objects for those. Okay uh, objects with uh, web and sheet. So these are the two uh, names. So for XSF workbook which will help me deal with the Excel workbook and this would uh, help me deal with a particular sheet in that Excel file. Okay, so the object name for that is sheet and for this is WB and I've just initiated that process here. Okay, so I've created a new file here and I've uh, fed the file name the file path over here and again this file input stream is a function that uh, we get with our Apache POI library, right? So if there is any problem here, so ideally there should be no problem. Okay, but if there is ever any problem in uh, reading this Excel file, then that would be thrown as an exception. So program termination would not halt, but it would be just thrown as an exception at the end of the program. Whenever the uh, execution is complete that time the exception would be thrown. Okay. And it will be thrown with the help of this println statement that makes it displayed. But getting back to the main method which actually does my reading. Okay, so that is done over here. So I have two methods which is uh, string get data and int get row count. Okay, so two methods get data and row count. I'm using the get row count method to basically find out how many rows are there in my Excel file because that will be used to define the number of times I will read my Excel file because I will be running a for loop, right? If you go back to here, you can see that I'm running a for loop to basically execute multiple login credentials. So how many other login credentials are present in my Excel file that many times this for loop would be executed. Okay. And then I have a get data method which would basically take the sheet number row and column as uh, parameters and use that to read my data inside the cell. Okay, so this is to basically read the data inside my cell. So you will not understand this method if I do not go back to my main class file. Okay, so let me go here and explain every single uh, line one after the other. So I'm creating a new object called rows. So here I'm getting the value of my row count. Okay, but when I want to find out the number of rows that are there, I have to also specify the sheet number. So that is why you can see a zero over here. Correct. So if I go here, you can see that this is the login credentials and the name over here is sheet one. Okay, but the index is ideally zero. So this is sheet number zero right index wise. So this is what I've passed as parameters when I'm calling the get row method. Okay, and when I'm calling this method, I would come here and uh, the same sheet number zero would be brought in as the input. Okay, so I'll be using the sheet number to identify how many rows are there in that particular sheet. So this is the logic that I have used 
to find out the number of rows. So I've said int row is equal to wb dot get sheet at with this sheet index. Okay, so wb has the path and the Excel file which has the credentials and it will go to this particular sheet having index number of zero and it would get the number of the last row. Okay, so get last row number is again an inbuilt library which would uh, obtain what is the number of the last row. So if I go here, the number would be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, index wise, it's 0 to 4. And the 4 is what would be present here. And what I'm doing is I'm uh, saying row is equal to row plus 1, which would make it row is equal to 5. Because I have a 5 credentials, I cannot give the entry as 4 over there because index starts from 0. Because it starts from 0, I have just appended 1 manually. Okay. And then I'm basically returning this value of row. So that value of row would be stored in this particular object. Okay. Now the next thing that we are doing is we are creating another object for storing the credentials. I'm creating a two dimensional array where uh, I'll be storing both the username and the password as a two dimensional array. Okay. This is the name of the uh, object. So the size of the object is going to be controlled by this two dimensional array, right? So the number of rows is going to be the number of rows that is obtained and present in this object and the number of uh, columns is going to be two because uh, if you go back to my excel of course there are just two columns so so that's going to be the size of my two dimensional array okay row size by column size and to basically read the data from each and every single cell i'm writing a for loop wherein i'm running a for loop for the number of rows that are present and uh, i'm increasing it every single time and every time i'm reading a particular cell I'm reading it for the I throw and zero column and I throw and first column. So when my I is equal to zero, it starts from I is equal to zero, right? So at that time it would pick up the value in cell number zero and zero. So index wise, the value of this cell is zero and zero, right? This is zero and one. So if I want to pick up the data in this cell, then I would say get me data which is present in I throw and zero column and I throw and first column. And when I say first column, it is this right and this would be asked when this get data method is being called. So the get data method is called with these parameters, which means that get the data that is present in this format. Zeroth sheet number, ith row and zeroth column. And again over here it would be zeroth sheet number, ith column and first ith row and first column. And the credentials here would be basically returned to this particular data provider annotation right to this particular method it would be returned so that's how it's going to work but how is my get data here reading the cell value present in this particular cell that we can see from here okay so get data method is there here and it would receive three parameters like i told you before sheet number row and column and what i'm saying here is i'm creating a new object again sheet wherein i'm going to say get the sheet number where I'm saying access this particular sheet number using this library WB, which is my Excel file, get sheet at sheet number. And once I've accessed this sheet number, I'm saying create a new object called data, which is of uh, type string and store this data. Get the row value of uh, this row and what's passed here and get the cell value of this column. Okay, the column that is passed over here, right? So get that value. And return it back to this method. Okay, so I'm just using return data for that. And uh, basically, the method whichever is calling this one would get back the values. And uh, since the method which is calling this method is my test data feed, this would get back the values and it would store it in this two dimensional credentials array. And from the credentials array, it would go back to my test annotation here, which is my first method called demo project. Once it's received over here, the username and password, it would basically be passed whenever it's needed. Okay and uh, my web application would get the login and password fields like that so that's how my code is structured all right so let me execute this program and show you how the demo works so i'm just clicking on this run button here and let's just wait for my chrome to open here we go chrome driver instantiated and this is my uh, first test case right it was edreka and the password was fed chrome browser closed and again my chrome browser is going to reopen and it's going to basically check for every single credential. It's going to check if I can log in or not. If it logs in, it means that the credentials are valid. Otherwise, the credentials are invalid. Okay. So the first two succeeded, I could log in, but the next three, 
I can however not log in right my login has failed over here and that's what we would get in my test result It would say that uh, three credentials failed. So let's just wait up for that So there we go my five different test cases are uh, successfully executed and if I pull it up It shows that the number of tests run were five and there were three failures That's because I manually gave wrong credentials over here so these two are valid credentials and these three are invalid. So that is the uh, inference that we get from this particular test. Okay. So that is the demo for my data driven framework. If you do have any doubts, please put them in the comment box. And you can also look at the description below because there's a link to a blog where I've explained the same concept. And if you want to pick up this code, you can pick up the code from that particular blog of mine. Okay. So in the meanwhile, let me just move on to my next topic and my next topic is a keyword driven framework We saw what a data driven framework is and a keyword driven framework is slightly different in the fact that you still have an excel file But in the excel file you're not feeding data, but you are feeding the methods which need to be executed uh, Suppose let's say I have five different methods in my test script. Okay, and in this test script I don't want to execute all five I can have a new excel and in that excel i can say just the three methods which i want to execute and when i execute this test script then it would only test those three methods which are mentioned in this excel file okay so that's how it works that's what a keyword driven framework is it helps you control the methods that you want to execute in your test script again it's very similar in the fashion that you have an external file where it will be stored and uh, the excel file can be used or you can have database or you can use an xml file you can use one of these three i have used an excel file for uh, simplicity and again the benefits and the features are uh, very similar if you want to control the number of methods you want to execute you can easily do that by just removing or adding those method names to your excel file and uh, this is how it looks like so i have uh, two columns one is description and the other is keywords and uh, these action keywords these are my set of methods which i want to execute now the same test that i performed some time back right with data driven framework i'm going to perform the same login test so basically if I want to run a test which is very similar to the test I showed you some time back What are the functionalities that I need to test right? So I have to first of all instantiate a Chrome browser That's one functionality I would have to write in my test I would have to specify the URL on which I want to perform the test I have to specify the elements in my case It would be the username field and the password field and then I have to be able to click on the login button I have to be able to verify the login and then I have to close the browser Right, so these are the different functionalities. I want to test and that's what I have done here So instead of having one single test case where I have written the entire code for these things I've broken down that into multiple methods. Okay, and the methods look like this And the methods I can call from one more file over here So I have the method names specified as keywords here and these method names have smaller functionalities uh, For opening or launching my browser driver. I have the open browser method for navigating to a particular web page I will have one more method for the uh, for passing the username credentials There's one method and similarly for each and every functionality I have a separate method and these methods will be called from my main file from my main class file Okay, and this is how it looks like the method is the name of my class where the functionality is present Okay, I've written the code to test it and I'm basically calling these functions with some parameters. Okay, so let me quickly go to my Eclipse and show you a demonstration of this very same So let me first close these two files which I do not need these were for data driven framework and now going to keyword driven framework Let me open up these three files. Okay data script is going to be my main file which will uh, control the execution But along with that I have a methods class in which I have specified the different functionalities I want to test and I have a read Excel data which is again going to read my data from the excel file which is the excel cells and it would pass that back to my driver script okay so this is my main file and it's a very simple class where i have created one variable and here i've stored the path where my excel file is present okay and my excel file is data engine dot xlsx let me just quickly open up that file and show you this is my excel file like i told you these are the methods which i want to execute and this is just a small description which is of course not relevant or needed for my test it's just for your understanding purpose i've just said what each of these methods do these will be the ones that will get executed 
and the next thing I've done is I have called the read Excel data class. Okay, so this is the read Excel data class and this has a couple of methods set Excel file is one method and get cell data is one more method inside this class. Okay, and uh, what I've done here is while calling this class I have said execute this set Excel method. Okay, calling this method with these parameters as path and sheet one. So sheet one is basically the name of my sheet number. Okay, and as path is the path. So I'm setting what I want to read. Okay, when this is uh, basically executed, then it would call this method and this method will uh, receive the path of where my Excel is present and it would go to the sheet name. So the sheet name present over here is sheet one, right? So let me open up the Excel and show you that sheet one is the name. So it would straight away come to this particular Excel file and it would start reading data or it will be ready to read or write data in this particular Excel sheet. Okay. And here again, I've used XSF workbook and XSF uh, sheet, right? As you can see here, I've used them to basically read my actual data. So they are the ones that contain the smaller libraries, which would do actions like reading the cell and obtaining that cell value and storing that cell in a different uh, variable. Okay. So I've created uh, separate static objects for them and I'm calling them inside this particular Excel file of mine. So how the logic works here is the path and the sheet name comes in from the calling method. Okay. And when that comes, I am creating a new object called Excel file. Okay. And uh, the same file that is mentioned over here that would be stored in this object. Okay. And in this Excel file, I'm using this as a base to create another object, which is Excel workbook. And here I'm just saying I want to use the XSF workbook functionalities on this particular Excel file. So that's why I'm creating this particular object. Okay. So this acts as a class for this particular object of mine and finally I've created one more object for which this would act as the class. Okay, so whatever I'm saying here, right? There's Excel workbook. There's Excel W sheet. So I'll be using this Excel W sheet to write the sheet name of this particular Excel file. I'll be accessing this sheet name in this Excel workbook, which is present in this particular path. So that is what this piece of code does for me. Okay, this method which is setting the Excel file and getting my environment ready for me. That is about this method. So let me go back to the driver script and continue with my explanation. So right after setting my uh, Excel file, I am starting a for loop here and uh, I'm starting a for loop to basically read all my Excel column contents. So whatever method names I've specified in my uh, column, I want to read those things, right? So for that I've created a for loop and I've hard coded the value that run the for loop seven times. Because if you look at my Excel, I have seven entries here, correct? Count as seven. So I want to run the for loop seven times, but start the execution from row one because row zero is not something I want to execute. It's just a header. So these are the ones which I want to execute. So this is row number one. So start executing from this row. And this time I'm creating a new object called S actions, having data type uh, string. And I'm again calling this same read Excel uh, data file write this uh, read Excel data class and from this class I'm executing this method get cell data. Okay, and when I'm calling this get cell data method I'm passing the row number and the column number of the particular cell I want to read. So I want to read the cell number which is executed as part of the for loop. So when the first time this for loop is executed then I will be reading row number one column number one. Okay, because uh, row number is mentioned as one over here. That's where it starts off with and the second time when this follow up is running I will be reading row number two and column number one because if you go back to my Excel the column number is the same and the row number is what changes So one one two one three one four one five one six one seven one. That's how it goes. Okay, and every time I open this and every time I call this particular method I'm passing these values, right? So this method would get called and when this method is called the same row number and column number is received as parameters. Okay, and uh, these are used to basically read the cell contents. But how am I doing it by creating a new cell object and here I'm saying the Excel worksheet choose this worksheet and over here go to this particular row because this worksheet has this sheet name, right? So go to that particular sheet uh, name and sheet number uh, go to this particular row which is nothing but row number one and go to this column which is nothing but column number one and once you're there I have written the next line string cell data. Okay, so this is the next object 
which is uh, of type string and here I'm saying cell dot get string cell value so whatever value is there in that particular cell that is obtained and stored in this particular cell data object and then I'm finally returning this cell data to the calling object or the invoking method so the method that is invoking this method is this object right so that value would come in here and every time the value is returned here there's an if a statement which is executed okay and here we have manually specified if the value that is returned if it is equal to open browser then execute the open browser method which is present in the class called methods so methods is this class of mine so like i told you this is the place where i have defined the web driver object here so for open browser method i have uh, instantiated the browser driver okay and this would be defined globally because driver is again uh, declared uh, globally and the next method over here is the navigate so if i want to go to a particular web page then i would say go to this particular url and that would be inside this particular navigate method and similarly i have another input username method which is for passing the username field my credentials and similarly for password field there is one more method and this is the credentials which will be passed on and then to click on the login button there's another method click underscore login this would log in and click this would basically log in by clicking and finally it would verify if my login is successful by analyzing the page title so i'm saying get the page title and store it in this particular variable okay that is of type string and this is evaluated with this find a flight mercury tours because this is the page title and uh, this would be verified with this and if it is matching then it basically means that your test case pass your login credentials is correct otherwise it's invalid so that's the logic here right that is what happens here and then finally I have one method for close browser which would just end my browser instance so each of these are separate methods and each of those methods would be called via a for loop over here so the first time the for loop executes it would uh, check if it is equal to this open browser if it uh, matches then the open methods dot open browser this method would be executed and called and the second time when the for loop is being executed it would technically be reading this cell right it would be reading the navigate uh, cell and uh, since that is not equal to the open browser the next if statement the else if statement where i'm saying if that equals to navigate and if it's matching with this navigate then it would execute the next method navigate inside this class called methods okay so this class contains all my methods like i told you and this navigate uh, method inside this methods class would be executed and similarly there's a for loop which would execute each and every single method which is present in the excel file it would compare it with each of these here and if there's a match then that particular method will be executed okay and then basically i'm just ending this for loop right over here only okay so that's how this logic is that's how this works so let me quickly execute this driver script file and then show you how this demo works. So my Chrome driver has opened up. So all my functionalities are being tested, right? My driver opened, my username credentials was passed. I've been logged in successfully and then it would have by now retrieved the page title and it would have analyzed. So let me pull this up. And uh, yes, I've not got any error. That means that my test has successfully passed. So I don't have any test annotation here to show you that if my test pass or if my test failed. Correct. So I did not have that. So that's why you didn't see any failure there. So anyways, that shows my code is uh, executed successfully and that's how you perform keyword driven testing. So guys, I hope this was clear to you people. And if you guys have any doubts, then I would request you to go back to the link present in the description below to read more about how this keyword driven framework works. And also if you want to get this code, you can do so from the same blog link and let me uh, in the meanwhile go to the next slide and uh, talk about the next topic so the final topic is a hybrid framework and a hybrid framework is basically using a combination of both the features of both the data driven and keyword driven right so let me quickly go to the demonstration and show you how i'm going to perform this hands-on so i have built this hybrid driven framework in a way which is very similar to the keyword driven framework but I am passing the method names by using the data driven framework. Okay, this might be a little confusing to you. So just listen again to what I'm exactly saying. What I'm exactly doing is the same Excel file that we uh, saw, right? The data engine Excel file. So we have different methods. So what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to write if else conditions every time to execute each of these methods. 
Okay, so I'm just going to write a for loop and I'm going to use the data driven framework technique to execute each of these methods whenever there's a match. So I hope that made a little more sense to you. A combination of data driven and keyword driven. Keyword driven because at the end of the day, my method names are present in an external Excel file and it involves a data driven framework because these method names are read from this Excel file by using the data driven technique. Correct my Excel file. My class file is reading this data with the help of data driven framework. If you guys have not understood this, then just wait up till I bring up my Eclipse. Okay, over there I will explain it better. But before that, I just want to tell you that to achieve this, I have used a Java reflection class. So a Java reflection class is used to import your methods in one class onto another class. So I have a class one, which is my main class. And if I want to import the methods which are there in class two onto my class one, then I can use the Java reflection class. All right. And these are the two lines of code which does it for me. So actions is the name of my class which contains the list of methods, right? So it contains the functionalities of different methods and I'm importing these methods onto my new object. Okay, because I'm executing or starting instantiating an object instance of this particular class in my second class. Okay, so let me just open up the Eclipse and uh, explain this better. So this is my Eclipse. I'll uh, just close all these files here. And uh, this time, let me open up hybrid framework package and uh, open the three files here actions, driver script, and read Excel. So, very similar to keyword driven framework, we have driver script Java file, which is my main class, which would be doing all the functionalities. Okay. My actions is uh, the one which is going to contain all my methods. Again, very similar to my keyword driven. And the read Excel will be the one which will be reading the cell values from the uh, Excel sheet. The very minute difference that this particular class file has when you compare it to the keyword driven uh, data script file is that instead of me using the if else to call the different methods, right? I am using a for loop to call those methods. And since I'm using a for loop to access or get data from an Excel file, the data driven framework technique is implemented. And uh, since the data which I'm getting from the Excel file is the name of the method. The keyword driven framework is also implemented. Okay, so that's how things work. So I don't think I have to explain you actions and uh, read Excel files again. Okay, because they are exactly the same. The only difference is over here and what I've done here is I've uh, first of all used the Java reflection class as in so this actions which is there over here, right? This class I have created an object instance of this particular actions class. And uh, this is defined globally outside because it can be used by even other methods in this particular program. So once I have uh, created an object of this particular class, I'm using the method variable or the method object to get the class and the methods which are there in this particular action keywords. Okay, so the action keywords uh, refers to my action class and uh, in this action class, whatever methods are there that would be obtained. So get class dot get methods is the key term which is used for that purpose. Okay. And uh, by now all the different methods would be stored in this particular method as array. So if I go back to actions, you can see that the different methods I have here is close browser, verify login, click login, input password, input username. I have navigate and open browser, right? So all these methods would be stored in this particular method object, this array. And what I've done next is I've started a for loop. And this for loop will run as many times as the number of methods that are there in this particular object. What is the length? Let's say if there are uh, seven methods over here which are imported uh, to this particular object, then the method length would be seven, right? So this for loop would run seven times. Basically, the number of methods that were imported. Method dot length is a function for that. And it would start from zero and it would execute that many number of times. And it would keep running. And every time the for loop runs, it does one simple thing and every time it would basically obtain the method name and if it equals whatever stored in s actions that would be executed but uh, if i have to explain this let me first complete this part and in this main function what i have is uh, i have first uh, created a variable and here the uh, path of my excel file would be present this you of course know and of course the sheet name is also uh, present and then there's a for loop that gets executed right and this for loop it would be executed the number of times there is a row. 
So for the number of rows that are there that many number of times the follow would be executed and every time it gets executed It does one simple thing. Okay. It reads the value by using the get cell data method. Okay inside the read Excel class Get cell data method is there here it would pass the values the row number and column values and it would read the cell value and store it in s actions okay and after storing it in s actions it would execute this actions method so that's when basically this method would be executed okay so i explained this part and getting back to what happens inside the for loop and for every single method that is present right so it would first get the name of the method so for method number zero it's going to get the name of the method and it's going to check if it is equal to what is there in actions so in s actions the first time the value that would be stored is open browser okay and over here when we say if method i dot get name then method number zero would be compared with this s actions so the first time when it's comparing method number zero would be open browser itself because if you go to actions the first method is open browser right so that would be compared over here and if it is equal then this line would be executed and the line here is method i dot invoke action keywords so this basically means if it's a match with respect to what is there in the excel file then execute that particular method it will execute that same action keywords right and moment it's executed it would break the functionality and since there's no else part this uh, if method will be executed once again so the next time this for loop gets executed and then when uh, this is called right execute actions is called that time what happens is it would be basically checking for navigate method so that time for method number zero it will not match s actions variable because the first time uh, s actions will not contain that so for method zero s actions will not match because s actions contains navigate right so that is what is obtained from the excel file and navigate would be present the second time this if method executes and when it executes the basically this method would be invoked and it would be executed right so just like that every single time if loop runs a particular method will be executed and uh, every time a method is executed the functionality of the web application is tested okay so i have the different methods over here which would be involved in this for loop are these very same and these would be executed so let me just run the sample program for you and show you how this works so again it's going to be very similar my chrome driver has instantiated i have logged in and once my login is uh, verified my chrome browser is supposed to close and uh, that's what has happened so let me just pull up the results and show you what has happened and yeah there are no errors which means that my test is a success okay so that is what i wanted to show you and that is what i wanted to tell you basically so that is how i have built a hybrid driven framework okay so uh, if you guys again have any doubts i would request you to please go to the link present in the description below that is the blog i've written on uh, the same web drivers so that is the same blog i've written on these frameworks and you can access this same code from that particular web page so now let's begin and understand what exactly is cucumber and why it is useful Cucumber is a tool that supports behavior driven development. It offers a way to write the test that anyone can understand regardless of their technical knowledge. It explains the behavior of the application in a simple English text using Gherkin language. So why do you need Cucumber or why is it useful? Cucumber is one of the most popular tools because of the following reasons. First one, Cucumber is open source and hence it is free to use. With Cucumber, you can write your test scripts in multiple languages like Java, Ruby, C Sharp, .NET, and Python. And Cucumber easily integrates with Selenium, Ruby on Rails, Wait IR, and other web based testing tools. And it is also one of the most widely used behavior driven development tools. So these are some of the unique features that makes Cucumber helpful for testing a website or a web app. Next, let's understand what is BDD. That is behavior driven development in simple terms. It is a technique where your specifications or test cases are written in plain English like sentences with this approach. The non technical team members find it easy to understand the flow and collaborate more in the process of software development. So let's understand this with the help of a simple example. 
consider a scenario where you want to test Twitter website. One of the test scenarios will be to verify the login credentials. With BDD, you can write this test scenario in this format as shown in this picture. So first you will write the feature that will be say for example you want to test a Twitter website so you will write test Twitter smoke scenario and then you have to write the scenario where the title of the scenario will be you want to test the login of the Twitter website with valid credentials. So there are three conditions first will be the given next when and then so given that you have to open the Firefox and start the application and when you enter the valid username and valid password then you should be able to log in successfully. So this is a perspective how I have written the given when and then conditions and this is how you need to create a feature file and then write the scenarios in simple plain English statements. So it is very easy for you to understand right. There's no any much coding here nothing. It's just a simple English sentences right. So this is all about BDD and this is how you need to write your feature file. I hope that you are clear with how to write BDD. I will be showing you more of such examples in the demo part. Now let's dive deeper into the session and understand what is Selenium. Selenium is one of the open source portable framework which is used for automation testing of web applications. It is flexible when it comes to testing functional and regression test cases. Selenium test scripts can be written in different programming languages like Java, Python, C sharp, Ruby, etc. And all the Selenium test scripts can run across various browsers like Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Opera, and also it provides support across various platforms like Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Solaris, etc. And Selenium also helps us in creating robust browser based regression automation suits and perform the test. So now that you know what is Selenium, let's move further and understand why use Cucumber with Selenium. Most of the organizations use Selenium for functional testing. These organizations which are using Selenium want to integrate Cucumber with Selenium as Cucumber makes it easy to read and understand the application flow. And Cucumber tool is based on behavior driven development framework that acts as a bridge between the software engineer and business analyst, manual tester and automation tester, manual tester and developers. Cucumber also benefits the client to understand the application code as it uses Georgian language which is in plain text. Anyone in the organization can understand the behavior of the software. The syntax of Georgian is in simple plain text which is readable and understandable. Having understood this, let's know the prerequisites for using Cucumber. So prerequisites are nothing but the essentials or the requirements that you need in order to start off writing the application in Cucumber. So very first thing is you need Selenium jar files and Selenium standalone server. Next you need the jar files for Cucumber. I will tell you what all the jar files are required and I'll also show you how to add the jar files in your project. Next you should have your Java installed and Eclipse also should be there. After that you need to add the Cucumber plugin from the marketplace. I'll tell you how to do that. And the last step is you have to code your program. Okay. So once you finish configuring all the prerequisites, the next step is to create the application. Let's see how to do that. So first, you have to configure the build path and add all the char files to the project. After that, you have to create a feature file and add the scenarios, like I told you before in the BDD. After that, you have to write the runner class, and finally, you need to add the step definitions and run the code. So now let's see how to do that with the help of an example. So now we will be seeing the practical implementation of creating a Cucumber example and also we will learn how it is helpful in writing a test cases and how it is integrated with Selenium and helps us in testing a website. Let's see that now. So what was the first step? The first step was Selenium jar files and the server. So you can see here I have already downloaded the Selenium client. So first you should have your Eclipse and Java configured and also your Selenium should be configured. Okay, so because these are the basic prerequisites that is essential. So you have to download the Selenium standalone server from this version. I have already downloaded that 
and if you are coding the program in Java, you need to download the Java client. And if you're coding in Python or other languages, you can download the respective Java clients. And after that, there are third party drivers. If you wish to run the test cases in Mozilla Firefox, you can download the Mozilla Gecko driver. And if you wish to run it in Google Chrome, then you can use the Google Chrome driver. Or else if you wish to use in the other websites or other browsers, then you can use the other drivers for the respective browsers. Okay. So if you wish to know how to install Selenium, Java and Eclipse, you can check out my video on how to install Selenium in the YouTube playlist and you can very well understand about how to configure Selenium and Java on your system. So basically these are the jar files and these are also the Selenium jar files and this will be the standalone server. And next step is you need the jar files for Cucumber. So you can see these are the jar files for Cucumber. So I will show you how to download it. So just go to MVM repository that is Maven repository. Just type Cucumber and give search. So either you can download io.cucumber version or info cube. So just click on this. Say I want 1.2.3 version. So I'll just download the jar file. You can also write the Maven dependency in your perm.xml file when you configure the project. But now I don't want to do that. So simply what I'll be doing, I'll be just downloading the jar file. So same way you need all these jars that is Cucumber Java, Cucumber Core, Cucumber JUnit, Cucumber JVM Depths, Gearkin, JUnit, and Mokito. So all these jar files are essential. So after that, what is the next step? You have to add the plugin from the marketplace. So just click on help, go to Eclipse Marketplace, and just type Cucumber. So you will get a natural 0.7.6, which comprises of Cucumber, Gearkin, and BDD. You have to install that. I have already installed. That is the reason you can see it as installed. And next will be Cucumber Eclipse plugin. That also comprises of Cucumber, Gearkin, JVM Cucumber plugins and everything. So you have to install that as well. So this is how you need to add the plugins from Eclipse Marketplace. Okay. After that, you have to just create a project. It can be a simple Java project. Okay. So I'll just create a simple project. I'll click on next. I'll say it as Cucumber 1. Next. Finish. And next, what you have to do, you have to click on this project, go to build path and configure the build path. So, in this, you can see there is neither any libraries nor there is any jar files. So, you, you have to add the jar files. So, what I'll do, I'll add all the char files. JUnit. Yeah, and also you need the Cucumber report. So Gherkin, Hamcrest, Java Cucumber Core, this one, Cucumber Peak Container, everything. So in total, there are these many char files. Yes. I'll just apply and close this. And one more thing that I need here is I need to add the libraries as well. So I'll just add the JUnit library and I will add test ng library as well because I need them. So I want to know whether the test case were passed or failed or that scenarios was passed or failed and that is the reason I need all the libraries. So I'll just apply and close this. So right now you saw I just added the Cucumber libraries and I did not add the Selenium libraries. Why? Because I just want to show you how to write a scenario how to execute the test cases and then I will add selenium and then integrate cucumber with selenium. Okay. For now, let's see about this only. So after this, I need to create a folder. Say source folder as features. Okay. So in this folder, I need to create a feature file. So I'll just click on the file here. I'll click on next and I will name it as test dot feature. Okay. I'll just click on the finish. So you got a test.feature file here. So now my task is to write the test cases. So as I have told you, I'll write a feature called test Twitter smoke scenario. 
and then I have a scenario where I want to test the login with the valid credentials. Given that open the Firefox and start the application and when I enter the valid username and valid password, then user should be able to log in successfully. So when I run this program using Cucumber feature, so you can see here that the feature was test Twitter smoke scenario and then Scenario was test the login with valid credentials given whatever was there when and then. So what it is telling one scenarios and one step, but three are undefined and it's telling us you can implement the missing steps with the snippets below. So I have to write the step definitions and the runner class for this because that was what I told you when I was creating the steps. That is first I created the feature file and added the scenarios. And next I have to write the runner class and add the step definitions to run the code. So that is what it is telling me to implement the missing steps with the snippets below. So I have already created a project where I have my features like I have my feature file. I have the test runners. I have the step definition everything. So first let's see what scenario I have in my feature file. So in my feature file, I have the feature name called as reset functionality on login page of the application. So scenario is verification of the reset button given open the Firefox and launch the application. When I enter the username and password, then I have to reset the credential. Yes. So for this I have written the steps that is my step definition. So what I said. So the steps I have written in the step definition package. So I've created separate package for that and I've created a class called steps. So whatever is there over here given when and then I have to write it like this at given same thing open the Firefox and launch the application same thing over here. It's just within the double quotes. It should start with the powers to symbol and it should end with the dollar symbol after that it is enclosed. So this is how you have to write it and next the same method is written over here telling public void. This is a method telling open the Firefox and launch the application and it throws throwable because I have declared the throws declaration and inside this I'm printing this step opens the Firefox and launch the application. So next at when enter the username and password again the same thing which is there over here this step enters the username and password on the login page. So I again I have created a method over here and finally at then annotation I am using because it is in my features reset the credential. So here it will be like reset the credential and again creating a method and this step should click on the reset button. Okay. So now that you wrote the step definitions and the feature, but where is the executable file for that? I have created a package called test runner and in that I have my runner class which helps us to execute the project. So this is how you need to write it. So just say at run with cucumber dot class because this is a cucumber project and this is how you need to specify the annotation and the signature of the method and then at cucumber options features is equal to the name of the feature file that is features and glue is equal to step definition step definition is a package. Yes, and this features is your folder which is features and this features will be your the name of the feature file and this will be the package of the runner class which is step definitions. Correct. So after that I'll just simply write public class runner and I won't write any of the methods over here. I'll just simply save it. So now when I run it as a J unit test, let's see what happens. So you can see that J unit is running. So also you saw that. There was one scenario it was passed and there was three steps and that was also passed and it just took this milliseconds of time to execute the test cases. Yes. So if I right click on this you can see there's an option called cucumber feature and if I click on this and choose run as there's no option because I want to run a class to run the program and that is the reason I run it as a J unit test. Yes. So you saw that. All the steps was executed and the scenarios was passed. So what happened here first whatever I've created and entered it in the print statement it displayed telling the step is to open the Firefox and launch the application and the next step is to enter the username and password on the login page and the last step is to click on the reset button. 
so it means your steps got executed properly so this is how you can configure your cucumber and write the steps based on your requirements and it's very simple right it's just an english like statements wherein we have added the gherkin jar file to execute this it's very simple so this is how you need to do that so now let's do one thing let's add a selenium jar file either you can add the selenium standalone server or you need to add all the jar files of selenium which one is very useful adding selenium jar files or just one standalone server we'll simply add a standalone server right so for that what i have done i have created a project wherein i have integrated cucumber with selenium okay so i'll just right click on this project and go to build path so you can see first i have all the libraries that is required and then i have added selenium standalone server and also as i told i need a j unit so i have added that apply and close okay so now i have told you about the twitter smoke scenario right now we'll test this in this case it won't just display like this telling it has to open the firefox and launch the application but in actual it will launch the firefox start the application it will navigate to twitter website enter the username and password which is valid and then it will log in so it will do all these steps and let's see how to do that and what will be the output as well okay so first is i have to write the feature file so this is my twitter smoke scenario and then i have my scenario is to test the login with valid credentials given open the firefox and start the application and when i enter the valid username and valid password then user should be able to log in successfully next will be the step definition wherein i have created a class called smoke test so in this what i did was so in this what i did i first created a class and i initialized the driver that is web driver and again same thing from here open the firefox and start the application so in this i have created a method instead of just writing a print statement i am setting the system properties of my gecko driver because i want to launch a firefox and then navigate to this so i am creating an object of a new firefox driver as well specifying the implicit weight and using the driver.get i am navigating to the twitter.com login page yes and now when i enter the valid username and valid password so again i am writing a method for that and i am finding the element by xpath i am finding the element of this one say twitter.com and the login so i'm just inspecting on this and i have a crow path installed if you wish to know what is crow path and how to write css selectors and xpath using crow path you can just check out my video on the playlist and you'll get to know about it so again if you wish to know about xpath and the other locators also there's a video available on our youtube playlist you can check on that as well so i've just copied the relative xpath and i've just pasted over here and i'm sending the keys as a phone number for the login and again i've inspected the password as well and i have just copied the xpath from here and pasted the xpath over here and finally this is the last step and then user should be able to log in successfully so i've created a method for that and again with the help of an xpath i'm inspecting on this button and just copied the relative xpath and pasted it over here you can also use other locators for that because i felt it very easy so i am using this so now your step definitions is ready and the last step is to write the runner class so in runner what you have to do you have to simply write this signature and then at cucumber options features will be your this one features and the glue will be the package of this that is step d and just create a class called runner and specify nothing over you now what i'll do i'll run this runner class as a j unit test and let's watch the output so you can see mozilla firefox browser launched with the help of a gecko driver it's navigating through twitter login it entered the credentials and it hit on the login button yes and now let's check the output so what it said the scenarios was one it passed there were three steps and even that passed so what was the three steps first launch mozilla firefox browser and navigate through twitter login page and the next step was enter the valid username and valid password and finally the user should be able to log in successfully so these were the three steps and all the three steps were passed so this is how i simply added the jar file of the selenium standalone server 
and then I integrated it with Selenium concept where I launched the driver. I managed the timeouts and I navigated through Twitter login page and I used the locators to find the element and send the keys and also hit on the login button. So this is how I integrated Selenium with Cucumber and executed the test cases on Mozilla Firefox browser. Yes. So that's how you need to use Cucumber with Selenium in order to perform testing of a website or a web application. Let's understand what is page object model. Page object model is a design pattern to create object repository for the web user interface elements. Under this model for each web page in the application, there should be corresponding page classes. And this page class will find the web elements of that web page and also it contains the page methods which perform operation on those web elements. That is it consists of a page class along with the test class and the test engine. That is it consists of a page class along with the test case class. And one more important thing locators and test scripts are stored separately in page object model. The tests then use the methods of this page object model class whenever they need to interact with the UI elements of that page and the benefit here is that if the UI changes for the page the test themselves don't need to be changed only the code within the page object needs to be changed. Subsequently all the changes to support that new UI are located in one place. I hope you understood what is page object model. Now let's see why do we need page object model. Increasing automation test coverage can result in unmaintainable project structure if locators are not managed in the right way. And this can happen due to the duplication of code or mainly due to duplicated usage of locators. The chief problem with script maintenance is that if 10 different scripts are using the same page element, with any change in that element you need to change all the 10 scripts and this is time consuming and error prone right and a better approach to script maintenance is to create a separate class file which would find web elements fill them or verify them this class can be reused in all the scripts using that element in future if there is a change in the web element we need to make the change in just one class file and not the 10 different scripts and this is achieved with the help of page object model and that makes the code reusable readable and maintainable. For example, in home page of web application we have menu bar which leads to different modules with different features and many automation test cases would be clicking through these menu buttons to execute specific tests. Imagine that UI is changed or revamped and the menu buttons are relocated to different positions in home page and this will result automation test to fail. Automated test cases will fail as scripts will not be able to find particular element locators to perform action. So now what happens quality analyst or quality assurance engineer needs to walk through whole codes to update locators wherever necessary. And updating elements locators and duplicate code will consume a lot of time to adjust locators. Why this time can be consumed to increase the coverage. We can save this time by using page object model in our automation framework. So assume that a web page has an X elements and you write a test script for that. So you might feel it a cumbersome task to change the element locators in the entire script. Yes, it is of course. So what is the solution that page object model gives you? It writes element locators in one different class file and test case file will be written in the other class file and that is the main motto of the page object model to help you in updating the code and that increases the efficiency of the test automation framework. So I hope you understood what is page object model and why do we need it. Having understood this let's move further and see some of the advantages of page object model. So first one. According to the page object model we should keep our tests and element locators separately and this will keep the code clean and easy to understand and maintain and the page object model approach makes test automation framework programmer friendly more durable and comprehensive. Another important advantage is that page object repository is independent of automation test keeping separate repository for page objects helps us to use this repository for different purposes with different frameworks like 
we are able to integrate the repository with other tools like JUnit, PHP unit, N unit, as well as with TestNG, Cucumber, etc. And also the test cases become short and optimized as we are able to reuse the page object methods in the POM classes. Any change in UI can be implemented, updated, and maintained into the page objects and classes. And page object model is the best applicable for all the applications which contains multiple pages, each of which have fields which can be uniquely referenced with respect to the page. So these are few of the advantages that makes page object model as unique and easy to work with for automation testers. So now let's move further and understand what is page factory. Page factory is an inbuilt page object model concept for Selenium web driver, but it is very optimized. Here as well, we follow the concept of separation of page object repository and test methods. Additionally, with the help of page factory class, we use annotations that is at find by annotation to find web element and we use init elements method to initialize web elements. So page object model can be implemented with page factory and without page factory as well. If you implement it with the help of a page factory, then it uses by and there is no imports required and there is no cache storage. And if you do it without page factory, then you have to use at find by annotation, import the packages that is a page factory and cache lookup is faster. So that's all about how page object model can be implemented with the help of page factory and without the page factory. Now let's dive into some practicals. First, I will create a simple project with POM without using the page factory. Then I will show you the working of the same project with the help of page factory so that you can understand the difference between the two. So I have created a project called Edureka Selenium project and in that I have created a package that is code.edureka.pages and inside that I have only one file that is testng. I have named it as testng because this is a testng project and we will be checking the testng.xml file and that will be the part of our execution. So here what I'm doing, I'm not implementing the page factory. Instead, I'm creating only one page that is testng and writing the code in only one page and then referring it in the testng.xml file and executing it. So first, I'll show you how the execution works and then we'll take a look at the code, okay? First, let's run the program and check for the output and then I will explain you the workflow of the code. I'll run the program as testng suit. You can see that the testng detected its version and Google Chrome was launched. It navigated through Facebook.com, entered username and password, hit on the login button. And then it enters the value as Edureka and hit the search box. Now if you want, you can just click on the Edureka.in and you can do any other options as well. Now if you want to choose that, you can do anything as well. Now I will explain you this code. So first what I did, I imported all the packages and created a class called testng. And then I have declared the variable of web driver that is driver as public. And now I have written the at test annotation. So this is a process that it should happen at the test. That is the ongoing process. So inside the main method what I have done, I am using the driver or find element by ID. That is my locator and I'm sending the keys as my detail. That is the email or your mobile number or anything. So this is the value of my element that is ID. If you wish to know more about locators, you can check out our YouTube playlist where you will be finding the videos for locators in Selenium, XPath and many more. And then you can get thorough through the concepts. And the same thing for password. I'm again using element by ID and for my password, this is the value. And I'm sending the keys, that is my password. And then to hit on the login button, this is the value of the ID and I'm clicking on the button. Why? Because it is a link and it's not a text box to use send keys method for that. Okay. And you saw that as soon as I hit the login button, it navigated through my Facebook home page and it entered the value as Edureka. Correct? As you saw, all these things happen automatically. Yes, exactly. So that's how it works. And now comes the before method. 
So inside the before method what I have done I'm using the system dot set property to set my driver configuration. Why because I need a Chrome driver to launch the Google Chrome browser and navigate through a particular website. So how can we do with the help of a driver? So as I'm using a Google Chrome, I'm using a Chrome driver and I'm creating the object of that and this is the path where I have saved my Chrome driver. Okay, so next what I did I'm using implicitly wait to wait for 10 seconds. Say for example, a website takes seven to eight seconds of time to you know load the browser or load the website. I mean to load the website or a particular web application. So that is why if I don't want it to quit and exit from the website. That is the reason I'm giving it for 10 seconds. No matter what it will wait for 10 seconds if I declare the implicitly wait. And now what I'm doing I'm using a driver dot get method to do what to navigate through the facebook.com page. Okay, because this is how I need to navigate through using the driver dot get command and you know after this close driver I can simply give like driver dot quit if I want to quit the driver after it completes the execution else it will remain as it is and it will never quit from the drive. Okay, so this is all about how I have written my program for test ng and now let's see the test ng xml file. So this is the test ng xml file. I will tell you what are the important things that you need to focus on first the test name I can give it as whatever. So that is first test and the suit name it will be test suit. Okay. And inside the classes I have given my class name as the package name that is this one that is code.edureka.pages dot test ng because my class name is test ng and I want to refer to this class and I want to perform all the at test before method and after method that is this annotation it has to perform it has to perform after method annotation and at test annotation as well. So if I want to do that I have to just refer to my class. So that is why I'm referring it in this way. Say if you again run and check the output, it'll be the same. It will enter the details. It will hit the login button and it will enter the value as Edureka. Simple. You can choose among these. And finally what it will do it will quit. Why because it's simple because I have mentioned driver dot quit. So this is how you can implement a simple page object model without the help of page factory. Now say if you want to use the help of page factory how to do I will tell you that as well. So you can see here inside the project there are two kind of packages one is the page package and the other one is the test package why as I have told you for your pages and your locators and your script you need to maintain a separate files that is a separate class files and that is the reason I'm creating two class files for that and in my test package I'll be writing my test cases and finally for my execution I'll be writing the test ng dot xml. So first what I will do I will explain you all the four programs and Tell you about the linking between these things. Okay. So, first one will be the test paste.java file. So, this is the test case class, and here I am writing the before suit annotation. I will tell you what is all about. So, first, what I did, I created a class and I have declared my web driver as null, and I have set my system properties for my Chrome driver. And I am again, I am using the implicitly wait, and what I am doing using driver dot get I'm navigating through facebook.com. So initially when the Chrome driver launches Google Chrome it should simply navigate through facebook.com. Okay and after suit what it should do it should quit the driver. So here I'm just writing for at after suit and at before suit. I'm not giving it at suit or at test. So where is that that is here that is the FB login test. So in this program I'm writing the add test annotation and inside the init method I'm initializing the elements with the help of what page factory and for this what I'm doing I'm passing my driver that is the Chrome driver and I'm passing the FB login page dot class that is FB login page is this one and the class file of this and I'm using these variables to set the email and to set the password 
and also to click on the login button. Okay, not only that, I'm also doing one more thing over here that is, I'm creating an object of a home page and passing the parameters as my driver and the home page that is FP home page that is this file dot class. And from that, I am performing two actions. That is, I want to click on the profile drop down and I want to hit the logout link. So basically, I am performing five actions here. One is passing the variable or the value for my email ID and password and hit on the login button using the first login page. And using the home page, I am clicking on the drop down and click on the logout button. Yes. So now let's see. How the page factory took these elements that is the FB login page and the FB home page. First, let's see FB login page dot Java. So this is not the test case. This is the pages that I have declared. So I have declared a class of this and I've given the constructor that is this dot driver is equal to driver. And as I have told you, I have to use the find by annotation. And using the X path, what I'm doing, I'm locating on the email. And creating a web element called as text box again for password. This is the X path for that and web element as password text box and for submit button. That is a login. You can see that and the web element will be sign in button and next for all these three elements that is email text box password text box and sign in button. I am creating a method for that and just sending the keys as string email. So this string email will refer to the value that I have given in login test. That is this one. And again, this password that is a set password. I am passing string password and password text box dot send keys will refer to the string password from the login test page. Why? Because I'm referring to the class file of the login page and that's the reason it will refer from there and it will hit on the login button. And again, that will also refer to this one. So basically what it is doing it is giving an action call to these elements to refer to these email text box password text box and sign in button to perform an action on that. Yes, so that is how it works because I'm creating the pages as a different that is my class files my locators everything will be in different package and my tests will be in different package so that you can reuse the code. It helps you to maintain the code readability and also it enhances the performance of a test automation framework. So these three things refers to the Facebook login page wherein I have initialized my locators and I'm declaring them. And now you can see here there's something called as home page as well. And there is two more options. I'm using the chat dot sleeve for four milliseconds because I want to wait until the next action is performed and see what's happening actually and that's the reason I'm giving the thread dot sleep as 4000 that is a four milliseconds. So here I have the FB home page in this I'm using the find by annotation to find the locators by X path and this is the X path to click on the account settings that is a drop down and using the link text what I'm doing I'm again using the link text present on the logout. And the web element will be logout link for this logout locator and the web element will be profile drop down for the account settings. And again, what I'm doing as both are links, I'm just clicking on the profile drop down link and the logout link as well. And again, in the FB login test, these things are the call to action from this FB home page. So this is all about how you can actually write the test case classes in different file and the pages or your test scripts regarding your locators and everything in the different file. So now what I will do the name of my file will be page object model project and the class name will be the test base because inside my test base I have the before suit and after suit annotation where I have to execute and in FB login test there is the attest annotation in which I have to perform all these actions. Okay. So now let's run and check the working of that and the output as well. So first test ng detected the version and Chrome driver launched Google Chrome navigated through facebook.com. It's entering the email address password hit on the login button and now what it will do it will click on the profile drop down and hit the logout button. So you can see that it took a time of four milliseconds. And finally what it did it just quit the window because in the after suit I have declared that you have to quit the driver. So you can see inside the suit 
the total test that was run was one and there was no failures and there were no skips as well so you saw that it took a gap of four milliseconds between the actions to perform because i have declared it in order to exactly know what actually was happening with the test cases and how i also wanted to show you how the actual flow worked and that's the reason i gave a thread dot sleep as four milliseconds so this is how you need to create a separate packages for test case classes and the script classes and finally you have to write a test ng.xml file so basically this is all about the page object model design pattern where you will be having the pages that is fb login page and fb home page and you will be having the test where these two will be interlinked and the home page and fb login page will be having a test case one and in the test base this will refer to this why because it has to take the add test suit from the fb login test okay and this test base will refer to fb login test because test base contains only add before suit and add after suit and there's no add test and this will refer to this class so this is all about how you can define a page object model design pattern and if you wish to know more about it you can check out our edureka course on selenium certification training where these topics are carried out or taught in a broader gauge and you will get well versed with selenium let's first understand what is jdbc that is java database connectivity it is one of the standard java api for database independent connectivity between the java programming language and a wide range of databases this application programming interface lets you encode the access request statements in structured query language they are then passed to the program that manages the database it mainly involves opening a connection creating sql database executing the sql queries and then arriving at the output and we can use this jdbc api to access tabular data stored in the relational database with the help of this we can save update delete and fetch the data from the various databases it is very similar to the open database connectivity that is odbc provided by the microsoft so java database connectivity comprises some of the components like driver manager driver and connection driver manager is used to manage the list of database drivers the first driver that recognizes a certain sub protocol under jdbc will be used to establish a database connection next driver is an interface that handles the communications with the database server it also abstracts the details that are associated with the working of driver objects next connection this is also an interface that consists of all the methods required to connect to a database the connection object represents communication context that is all communication with the database is through connection object only so these are the three important components of a jdbc now let's see some of the sql commands that helps us to create a database use a database insert the records in the table etc so first create database so you can simply create the database with the help of this command that is create database followed by the database name next drop database if you don't wish to keep the database that you have created then you can simply delete it with the help of this command like drop database followed by the database name next create table once you create the database you need to create a table in that so that you can insert the records into the table so you can just create the table like create table followed by the table name and all the data types that you wish to next if you wish to drop the table you can simply drop the table with this command that is drop table followed by table name next you can insert the value depending on the table that you have created okay this is some of the mysql commands that will help you to create a database create table and insert the data into the table first i want to create a database and a table and insert the records so i have a mysql command line client so you can install mysql server and the workbench from the website so when you install that the mysql command line client will also be there you can either use your command prompt or you can use the mysql command line client so i am using this because it is very helpful for me i'll just enter the password because i have set my privileges for that 
and you can see that as soon as I entered the password it welcomed me to my SQL monitor. So here I can write my SQL commands. So first I will show the databases that is already present. So this is how I need to do that. So this is a list of the database that is EMP, MySQL, Selenium, says everything. So if I want to use the EMP database, so what I'll do, I'll say use EMP. Database got changed. Now what I'll do, I'll show the tables. In that I have a table named employees. Next, I want to list the records present in this table. So what I'll do, I'll just type select star from employees. Correct. So this is the details which has ID, age, first name and last name. Yes. So if I just want to create a database, I'll just say create database. Database name will be database testing. Okay, so what happened? One row got affected, which means a database called database testing got created. Let's see whether it got created or not. So, what I'll say, I'll say show databases. So, you can see there's a database called database testing. Now, I want to use that. So, it got changed. Say, I want to create a table called Records. Where care hundred. So you can see here when I wanted to create a table called records with a where care of with the name as attribute which has where care hundred and ID with where care of two. Okay, so the table got created. So what I'll say show tables. So you can see records got inserted. Now I will insert the values in this table. I'll say insert into records values. So I want to put the name as Edureka and ID will be 10. Okay. It got inserted. So when I say select star from records, what should happen? It should display the values that is present in the records that is Edureka followed by 10. Yes, so you can see that. So this is how you can create the table. You can create the database. You can change the database. You can you can switch to any of the database. You can insert the records and you can display the records. Okay. Now that you know what is JDBC and how to create a table, how to insert the records, how to display the records, everything. Let's move forward and see what are the various steps involved to create a JDBC application. So first you have to import the packages. So in this you need to include the packages that contains the JDBC classes that is required for database programming. So register the driver and open a connection. Here you have to initialize the driver so that you can open a communication channel with the database. You can register to the database with the help of the command that I will tell you later. Once you register the driver, then you can use the get connection method to create a connection object which represents a physical connection with the database. Next, you have to execute the query. This requires using an object of type statement for building and submitting an SQL statement to the database. Next, you have to extract the data from the result set. This requires that you use the appropriate getText method to retrieve the data from the result set. And the last step is to clean up the environment. Here you need to explicitly close all the database resources that rely on the JVM garbage collection. So these are the various steps involved to create a JDBC application. Now let's see how it works. So I have created one database testing. So I'm not making use of Selenium integration over here. I just want to show you how the actual JDBC application works and then we'll see how to test that application with the help of a Selenium. Okay, so first I imported all the collection, the statement, driver manager, result set and SQL exception because it is required and I'm just creating a class called Selenium database testing. So first as you remember what we have to specify the driver. 
so this is a driver you can download the char file from google say mysql char file and you have to then you have to just right click on the project go to build path and choose configure build path and click on the libraries and make sure that you have your mysql connector okay after that you should specify the database url that will be like this starts with jdbc then you will give a colon and provided by the path that is mysql the local host and followed by the database name so i am using this database say use emp show tables so this is the database that i am using for my application which contains all these records okay so you can see it has a id age first name and last name and these are the records that i have inserted okay so that will be the path for my database url and next i have set up my username as root and password as adureka do you remember as soon as i entered the mysql command line client it asked for a password and i entered this so after that i will create my main method and initialize the connection and statement object to null next I have to register the driver. Second step, because the first step was database credentials. Now what I will do? I'll register the JDBC driver. So I will use class dot for name followed by the driver. Okay. Next, in order to open the connection, I'm using the connection object, and I'm trying to get the connection using driver manager dot get connection. I'll specify the database URL. That will be this one. And then I'll specify the database credentials that is username and password. After that, what was the next step? The next step was to execute the query. So for that, what I'll do, I'll use a statement object. So I'll just print the statement telling print creating statement, and then I will print the statement using connection dot create statement. So I'm going to create a string called SQL, and for that, I'll write my query that is select ID. first name last name and age from employees you can see here it has a id age first name and last name so in that sequence it has to get the records from the database so after that what i am doing i am just creating a result set to execute the query so i will pass my sql because that is a string object that i have created and i will pass that now i want to retrieve the details by column name I will write a while loop for that and try to get the column name by saying int id is equal to result set dot get int of id and get int of age. So first I'll retrieve the id and age because they are of int type. Next, then I will write a string data type for first name and last name and get the string values for first name and last name. Then what I will do? I'll display the values with the help of the print statement in this way. So after all this, what was the last step? The last step was to clean up the environment. So I'll close the result set, I'll close the statement object, and I'll close the connection object. So if there are any exceptions, then catch block will handle all the exceptions. And in the finally block, and again, if there is any statement and connection object that is not equal to null, I want to close that as well. And finally, what I will say, I'll say goodbye. So this is how you need to create a JDBC application, wherein first you will connect to a database with the credentials, you will register a driver, you will open the connection, you will execute the query, and then you will retrieve the result. You will and finally and finally you will clean up the environment. So now let's run and check the output. Let's see how it works. So first it is telling it's connecting to a database, it's creating a statement. then it retrieved all the results based on the type that we have specified in our database over here so you can see and it just printed in this format because i gave id and then age and then the first name and then the last name and finally it said goodbye okay so this is how you need to create a jdbc application So now what is our task our task is to perform a database testing and check whether the test was passed or failed now let's see how to do that before performing database testing let's first understand what is selenium 
Selenium is one of the open source portable framework that is used to automate testing of web applications. It is flexible when it comes to testing functional and regression test cases. Selenium test scripts can be written in different programming languages like Java, Python, C Sharp, and many more. All these Selenium test scripts can also run across various browsers like Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Opera, and also provide support across various platforms like Windows, Mac, Linux, and Solaris. Selenium also helps in creating robust browser based regression automation suits and perform the test cases. So this is all about what is Selenium. Now let's see how to perform database testing using Selenium. As you might know, Selenium does not support database testing, but partially you can do it using JDBC and ODBC. Here, I will connect the Java program with the database and fetch the data tables and will verify it based on our requirement. So I will be integrating Selenium and test ng. So in order to perform the testing, I'm using MySQL database. You can also use Oracle and other databases as well. So I am using MySQL database and I'm integrating Selenium and test ng framework, which is an automation testing framework wherein ng stands for next generation. Test ng is inspired from JUnit, which uses the annotations. Using test ng, you can generate a proper report and you can easily come to know how many test cases are passed, failed, and skipped. Okay. So what we'll be doing? We'll be using the test ng framework. So I'll close this. So here I have written the same program using test ng. So first what I will do. I have imported all the packages along with the packages that I have already imported before. I'm using the test ng annotation test before test and after test so that you'll understand what are the actions that is supposed to be performed before the test and at test and after the test as well. So I have created a class called database testing demo. So as usual first I will initialize the connection object and the statement object and then what I will do I will specify the database URL that will be the same one that I have used and then I'll specify the credentials for the database username and the password that is root and edureka. So now what I will do I will use the at before test annotation. So you can see it comes under the package org dot annotations dot before test so it can be written like target value of the method retention and documented so first i will create a method called setup which throws the exception inside the try block i will first make the database connection telling string db class is equal to i'll specify my driver and i want to get the connection for that so what i will do I'll create connection con is equal to driver manager dot get connection. I'll specify the database URL. I'll write the username and the database password. And next I want the statement object to send the SQL statement to the database. And for that what I will say I will tell statement is equal to connection dot create statement. So that will help us to create the statement. So these are the actions that has to be performed before the test. And now let's see what should happen at the test. At the test, I will create a method called test, and inside the try block, I'll write the query that is select star from employees. That is the same thing that I have written over here so that it will retrieve all the results. After that, I will create a result set that is, it will help us to get the contents of the user information table from DB, that is, from the employees table. Okay. So that will be result set result is equal to statement dot execute query because I am passing here as query because I'm using it here as query only and now I want to print the results until all the records are printed and result dot next method returns true if there are any next records else it returns false. So for that I'm trying to get the results by using the get string method and finally if any exceptions are there it will be handled. And the last step is to close the database connection. So that will be done after the test that is clean up the environment. So I'll create a method called teardown and then close the connection using if condition. If connection is not equal to null, then just close the connection. Is it the same from the previous program? Yes, right? 
So now let's see what will happen when we execute this test case. Before that, you just have to check the build path. So you can see there's a MySQL connector jar, there is Selenium jars, and there's a test ng library, there, there is Maven dependencies, there is Selenium server as well. Okay. So I want to run this as a test ng test. So once I run this, let's check what happens with the output. So first it said it detected the test ng version and it printed the records based on the ID, age, first name and last name. Same way how it was present in our database. Yes, ID, age, first name and last name. Just that the column names are not there. And on the default test, it shows that the test run was one. There were no failures and there was no skips. And you can see the test was passed. And also on the default suit as well, the total test that was run was one. There were no failures. Again, there is no skips as well. So now I want to perform the database testing on the on another database. Say I want to perform it on. We'll use the database testing thing. Okay. So I will use the database testing database and I will use the records as a table in that. Instead of EMP, I'll make it as database testing. And select star from records. Is that correct? So now let's run and check what happens with the output. Again, I will run this as a test ng test. So test ng is running. So you can see it printed the values present in that database, which is select star from records. It just has one name and one ID. Okay, so first it printed one name and one ID, and then it showed the exception because I am trying to get the result from the rest of the three strings, which is suitable for the EMP database. But with this case, there is no any records. If I insert three more records into that, then it will not throw any error. Though it throwed error, it still said the test was passed because I retrieved the value from the database and there was no failures as well. But this exception is just because of what? Because I'm trying to get the other three records as well. And that's the reason. So this is how you can test the database using Java database connectivity and by integrating Selenium with test ng. Okay. So this is how test ng is very helpful to run the test cases to check whether the test was passed or failed and if there are any failures or skips in the test. So the first project is all about automating Edureka website. Let's have a look at the problem statement. So it goes like this. The candidate who has registered for Edureka portal wants to update all the details available in the portal. So what is the question? The question is to write a Selenium script to do the same and explore the Edureka portal. So what are the steps involved in that? First, you have to log into Edureka website, navigate to my profile, update personal details and career interests as well. And then you have to log out from the portal. Simple. Let's see how Selenium provides a solution for this. So already I have created a project that is test ng project because I need to check whether the test has passed or failed and that's the reason I'm creating a test ng project. So first I'll import all the packages and have created a class called handling all the controls and I have declared the web driver as static. Next at test. This is the annotation at priority zero. I'm creating a method called Edureka profile. Why? Because I need to check the Edureka profile only. That's the reason I'm creating a method called Edureka profile. And the very first step that I have done in this is I have set the properties for my Chrome driver because I want the Chrome driver to navigate and launch Google Chrome. And that's the reason I'm using Chrome driver. And I have defined my implicitly wait for 15 seconds and then launched Edureka.co website. And inside my try block, what I'm doing, I'm asking the thread to sleep for. Thousand milliseconds that is one second. 
If not, it has to catch an exception that is the interrupted exception E and handle it. Now, before we move ahead, let's execute the program and first understand what's happening. So I'm going to run it as test ng test. So you can see it detected the version of test ng, right? So what is happening? It navigated through Edureka website first and then it clicked on login button where it will enter the email and password as well and it will hit the login button. Yes, you can see on the screen that Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. Now let's see what happens. So it is clicking on the profile icon and clicked on my profile. So it navigated through my profile. So now what happened? I wanted to enter the personal details. So it entered that and then it's navigating through career interest and it's entering all the details like you can see employment types. Employment type was both and it asked are you willing to relocate and it clicked on yes and entered the preferred location as well. And next what happened it navigated back through the main page and it logged out correct. Yes, so I'm not doing anything here. Everything was being controlled by automated test software and everything was done by itself. So basically what happened it first navigated through Edureka website then entered the credentials for username and password and hit the login button. Then it clicked on your profile and navigated through my profile where you can update your details like personal details career interest everything and then it navigated back through your main page and it logged out. So how all this happened it happened with the help of a selenium that is an automation testing tool and it automated everything. Yes. So now you can also see in the console that Edureka profile test was passed and the default test was one test that it ran properly and there are no failures and there are no skips. And now again for default suit also the total test was one that was perfectly fine that it run and there were no failures and there were no skips as well. So now let's understand the code in depth. So basically Chrome driver is used to launch Google Chrome and that's why we are using Chrome driver for Google Chrome. You are using Chrome driver. If you are using Mozilla Firefox browser, you can use Geeko driver. There are different drivers for all the different types of browsers. Yes. Now using the driver.get you will navigate through Edureka website and the first thing that I done when I navigated through Edureka website was I want to click on the login button. Yes. So what happened? I gave driver.find element by link text. So link text is the locator whose value is login and as it is a button I'm just clicking on that. If you wish to know more about the locators and XPath and how to locate element on a website and everything you can check out the Edureka playlist on these topics like locators and selenium XPath and selenium automation testing everything you can have a look at all these videos in our YouTube playlist. So I'll tell you from where I got this link text locator. So first I will log into edureka.co and you can see there's a login button. So I'll click on that. I'll choose inspect. And you can see a text called login that is within the anchor tags. You can see that that is why I'm using link text locator to locate this particular link. Next I'm giving thread.sleep again same thing and now is the time for me to navigate through all the elements in the web page and perform actions on that. So what I have done I'm creating a new object of actions and pass the parameter as driver. So next using the created actions. I'm finding the element by ID that is driver dot find element by ID and I'm giving the value of the email. So that will be the ID for the Gmail username. So you can see it has a value for the ID as SI pop up email. So that's what I have given this here. And next I'm doing the actions dot click on that. And then I am sending the action dot send keys. Send keys is used to enter the values in the text box. So I am entering the value that is my email address. And next I am using action dot build dot perform. Why? I want to build this particular thing and perform the action on the email text box. So that is why I am using this. So the next one is to enter the password. Same thing. I'll go back to Edureka website and 
click on the password inspect it and you can see it has a value for id as si pop-up password correct again i'll send keys because i want to enter the password after that i want to hit the button that is the login button for that i'm finding the element by xpath Basically, XPath is also a type of a locator to locate complex elements on the web page when ID and name locators are not present. So what I'll do, I'll just go back here. For login, I have to just click on inspect and I'll just go back here and just click on inspect. So I have already installed my Chropath extension. If you wish to know about Chropath, you can check out the video on our YouTube playlist. So basically, Chropath is a plugin that helps us to write complex XPath and CSS selectors. So I have added that plugin to my Chrome, and you can see I can find the relative and absolute XPath. So I just copied the value and pasted for this particular button. You can write it on your own as well if you want. And now the next thing is so once it logged in, the next step was to click on the profile. So that's why I am writing it again with the help of the XPath. So you can see that I'm writing the same with XPath. That is, I'm clicking on the My Profile, and after that, there's a menu that is a drop-down menu. Wait, I'll just show you how it will work. So this is a drop-down menu, and I want to choose My Profile from this. So for that, what I'm doing, I'm writing it by XPath. That is a drop-down menu user to find out My Profile. This is the XPath. That's the drop-down. And next, I'm defining the web driver weight that is the explicit weight. Why? Because I am creating an explicit weight to check whether the expected conditions will be visible on the particular element or not within the given time frame. So what I've given the web driver weight that is nothing but my explicit weight. I am creating object of that and passing 20 seconds as a time frame. So what is my expected conditions? I want the expected conditions to be the visibility of the element located by XPath. So what is this XPath? So it contains the text whose value is my profile. This is just to check whether the element will be visible or not. And that's why I'm defining the web driver weight. And next I'm just trying to get the title using driver.getTitle, whatever is the page title. After I enter to my profile, I have to edit the personal details and update it. So next what I have to do I have to just select the edit button, right? So after that I want to just click on the edit option of the personal details and send the values for that So again, I'm finding the element with the help of XPath So after that I'm just printing some elements just to check whether the statements or the functioning of the project is working fine or not So in between the lines, I'm just printing some statements next what I want to do I want to navigate back to my profile. So I did that and from there, I want to click on career interest. That's what I'm doing. And I'm navigating back to career.interest. And using the drop down, I'm finding the element based on the select attributes, the interested job, and select by visibility of the text at the software testing. So, what it should do, it should enter the career interest as software testing. And that should be visible. So, unless and until that, it will be waiting. After that, next step is select from the drop down employment type and find it by XPath and choose it as both. It will be like permanent contract or both. So I'm choosing it as both. Next option is drop down CTC. So I'm locating with the help of XPath. That is the last drawn salary, and this is the XPath for that. And that I have to select by visible text that is not applicable. There'll be a drop down, like, you know, I'll just show you it. So there will be a CTC range. So I have to just click on not applicable or I can choose five to ten lakhs. You can choose it. However, so as I told there will be the employment types like permanent contract or both. I want to select both and also I want to choose software testing from this and I want to relocate. Yes, if you want to you have to enter the preferred choice. So that's how it's going to be. So based on that I have located all the elements and sent values to it and I'm giving some expected conditions that it should be visible unless and until it should wait something like that next it is like I want to relocate or not if yes I want to choose yes and I'm going to give the preferred city as Mumbai after that it should just hit on the submit button and again navigate back to learning.edureka.co and 
just hit the logout button and then you should again click on the username that is the my profile username and hit the logout button i'm again creating a try catch to check whether if there are any interrupted exception if yes then it has to handle that simple let's now once again run and check the output so now you'll actually understand how the flow of the project is and how it's working so first chrome travel launched google chrome navigated through edureka.co website and after that what it will do it will hit the login button and now it will enter username and password it will hit the login button and it will click on the username that is the icon at the corner and it will choose my profile from the drop down now it will hit on the edit button of the personal details i wanted to enter the name as edureka so i just gave that and now what it will do it will switch to career interest you can see the type of the job software testing employment type will be both yes and the location that is currently based is bangalore i want to relocate yes and it entered the preferred location as mumbai it hit the next button navigated back through the previous page again it will click on the user name it will hit the logout button so yes this is how it works so when i go back to my eclipse i can see the output over here so what it said whatever i wanted it print because i wanted to know whether the flow is working fine or is there any interruptions in the meanwhile but no everything was fine and it said edureka profile was passed and the default test was run there was no failures and no skips so yes this is how it works so i hope you understand how to log into the edureka portal navigate through my profile update the details and then log out so this is all about automating a website with the help of selenium testing tool i hope you found it interesting you can try the same with other websites as well now let's see what's the next project so the next project is all about flight booking application let's have a look at the problem statement so the problem statement for this is testing the flight booking website called new tours and getting the confirmation of the ticket through automation testing using selenium so let's have a look at the steps involved in that so first you have to set the browser factory to check the compatibility of the browsers and log into the new tours website and next enter the details that are required for booking a flight and finally check for the confirmation of the book ticket so you have to capture the screenshot for that okay let's see how it works so now let's understand the working of flight booking application so i have already created a project for this so let's see how it is being configured so basically what i have done i have created three packages first one for framework second one called as test package and the third one is ui package first let's see what the framework package consists of and this first one is browser factory so let me explain what does browser factory comprise of and also i will tell you why do we need to set the browser specifications as well so first i have created a class called as browser factory and declared the web driver variable as static and i've created a constructor for browser factory simple then i am setting the chrome driver options that is i'm creating an object of a new chrome driver and using the system dot set property i'm giving the path for the chrome driver that is where i have installed my chrome driver so this is the path next what i'm doing i'm deleting all the cookies maximizing the window because i want the chrome driver to launch google chrome and maximize all the windows and delete all the cookies and next i'm declaring implicitly wait and page timeout load and after that what i'm doing i'm just returning the driver so this was for chrome driver and the next one is for firefox driver so say if you want to execute or run the program in firefox what will you do you need to set the specifications and the drivers for firefox for firefox the driver that we use is geeko driver so using system dot set property i am giving the path where i have installed the geeko driver and next again same thing so in else if condition if the browser name is equals to ignore case of chrome then you have to print in chrome and again what do you have to do you have to again call the chrome driver and create an object of that else again so suppose say if i want to run it on internet explorer i have to give the path of the internet explorer driver where i have saved it so i am giving that 
again i'm just maximizing the window i'm deleting all the cookies i'm giving the page timeout loads and everything and finally i'm just returning the driver so i want my website or an application to run in all the three different browsers that is internet explorer chrome and firefox and that is the reason i'm giving the browser specification for all the three different browsers so this is about browser factory next let's go to our ui package and you can see there is a login page there is a flight finder page there is a select flight page and there is booking flight page and also there is flight confirmation page so the process goes like this first you have to log in you have to find a flight you have to select a flight you have to book a flight and get the flight confirmation so let's see one by one so in the login page what i need i need a username and a password simple so that's what i'm doing here i'm creating a class called login page i'm giving the web driver that i have declared static in the previous browser factory and i'm just creating a method of a web driver and returning this for driver is equal to driver that i'm just referring to it and i'm giving username and password that is i'm creating a web element for username and password and also a web element for login and then inside the login wordpress page i'm passing the arguments as string use and string pass that is for username and for user password and i'm sending the keys for username and password and i'm just catching the exception so basically this is for login page next will be a flight finder page so once you log in what you have to do you have to find the flight so this is a flight finder page where i have declared the variables so in this case what i am doing i am writing a absolute x path to find the flight details you can say this is absolute x path that is for round trip so in order to locate this particular element round trip i am finding it with the help of x path and then for one way trip also i am finding it with the help of x path so this is the x path that i have given and next for the other details like which month from which day and to which port to which month you have to book the round trip and also for the one way details as well and i'm also i'm trying to locate the airline that is the web element airline and trying to find the find flights option as well so next i want to know whether which kind of class i want whether i want economy whether i want business class or whether i want service class it again depends on each of your own interests right so i am again finding it with the help of x path for service class and then for all the above details i am just sending the keys like for round trip from which month and from which day to which port to which month and to which day and the type of the class and the type of the airline and then find the flights that is it is a link or a button that is the reason you have to just click on the particular find flights link okay simple so now assume that you have already found your flight so what you have to do next you have to select the flight yes so in this class what i am doing there are many options like blue skies airlines there's pangea airlines there is blue skies airline there's blue skies airline 361 there is unified airline and also there is blue skies airline 360t and there are other different kinds of unified airlines and everything and in order to select all those flights i'm finding it with the help of an expat that is i'm writing absolute expat to select the different options of the flight and finally i have to select one among them so if i want to select this particular airline then it has to execute the first if else second one else third one and again it goes on right so it again depends on which kind of a flight you want to select and if there is any exception it will be handled over here this one was for depart airline wordpress and now for return airline i am again specifying the same thing that is i am specifying the types of the airline present and i'm just catching it in the exception simple and finally i want to click on the particular one whichever you want to select and if any exceptions it will be catched as an exception and handled so once you select the flight the next step is what you have to book the particular flight so for that what you want you want the details like you want the first name you want the last name if you want any meal you want it be i'm declaring a web element for first name last name and meal so say you want to use a credit card so i'm giving the credit card type that is the web element again card number expiry month expiry years card first name card middle name 
credit card last name and the purchase so next what i have to do i have to send the keys to all these details like first name last name card type meal card number card mid name card last name and everything so you might have observed in order to send the keys always i have declared a particular method and then i have specified all the values to send the keys correct yes yeah, so, so this is how you need to send the values in order to book a flight so the next step is the flight confirmation page so it's very simple you'll just get the flight confirmation and for that i'm again using a uh, xpath and i'm giving the web element logout because i want to log out from the particular website because i'll be getting the flight confirmation and finally inside the logout press i'm just clicking on the particular logout method so this is all about the ui package and next what i have for you is i have a helper class for you so basically this helper class is used to declare the annotations like i want to know whether the particular statement or an element have been executed properly or not in those cases i want to specify the annotations to check whether the workflow is performing properly or not and whether the execution is going in flow or not i want to check these things so that is the reason i need a helper class to declare the annotations for all those things so first for add before class add before so it will execute and then after method add before method it will execute and after class and after suit as well so it's just because i want to know the workflow whether it is executing properly or not that is the reason we need a helper class so the next one is the test case class so actually this is the main class why because i will tell you this is the class where you will be entering all the details to select a flight to book a flight and you'll also get the flight confirmation page so simple let's see how so i'm declaring the add test that is the annotation i'm declaring first for the return ticket method so inside the driver.get i'm navigating through the website which i want to and inside the flight finder i'm specifying the details accordingly that we have specified over there that is the id is 1 zurich july 12 from frankfurt and on september 15 that is i he want a business class and the airlines is unified airlines this is for the flight finder page that i am giving all the details and next for select the flight i am giving the details for selecting the flight that is for depart airlines and return airlines as well and then it has to continue next for booking a flight I'm using the book flight page details. That is the name, first name. That is the first name, last name, the meal type. That is he is vegetarian, and the type of the card, Mastercard, the card number, card expiry year, expiry month, first name on the card, mid name on the card, and the last name on the card. Next for flight confirmation, what I want is I want to capture the screenshot for the flight confirmation. So that is the reason what I'm doing. I'm specifying the directories where I want to get my screenshot captured and saved. So this is what about it. And finally, I have to log out. So this is the first test case. And next, what I want to do, I want to validate the credentials. So again, what I will do, I'll go back to that is the new tools website. That is my flight booking website. And then for the login page, I'm giving the username and the password for login. And I'm finding the flight. based on these details yes and if there is something that matches and it assert equals to true simple else it says assert equals to false and it will catch an exception so this is all about the test case class and finally i have the capture screenshot class where i will get the screenshot and this is how i need to get the screenshot with the help of selenium i need to get the screenshot So this is how I'll be writing my code to get the screenshot, wherein I will just say take screenshot is equal to take screenshot and followed by the driver and get the screenshot. So this is a file source and this will copy the file to the new file path and then if there is any exception, it will catch. So now I want to tell you one thing: it has to save and next I want the date time stamp. So for that, this is a format I need to follow. That is, first will be the part of 5 followed by 1 2 and 3 and then if there is anything it will replace by this so this is a format i need to follow in order to get the date time stamp simple 
now is the time to execute the program so for executing i'll open my test ng xml because it's a test ng package so this is how i'll write and i'm specifying the class name because it is in the test package so this is the path for my this class that is a test case class and it has to include the name that is a return ticket and the validate credentials as well and then i'll close it with the test suit simple now I'll run the program and check the output. So I'll run the SAS test ng suit. Let's run it. Let's see what happens. So you can see here it is executing at before in method at after in method and in, in Chrome and first it is executing in return ticket. It detected the version. It navigated through the new tools website. It entered the username and password and it hit on sign in button. And now for the flight finder page, I need to enter the details. That is, it will enter the passenger number as one departing from Zurich on July 12th and arriving in what? Arriving in Frankfurt. And the returning date will be September 15th. Next, it will select the preference that is the business class. And the airline will be unified airlines and it will hit the continue button. Next, it will select the first one that is the blue skies airline and the return will be unified airlines. And again, it will hit the enter button. That is the continue button and now the time is to enter the passenger details that is book of flight details so it's entering the first name as anirut last name as as the meal type is vegetarian and the car type will be mastercard the card number expiry date and the first name middle name and last name on the card detail that is the credit card details that's anirut a and s okay so next this is a flight confirmation so you have already got the flight confirmation and it logged out so this is the second test case. So it is selling from departing from London on January 20 and arriving in New York and the returning date will be December 10. And again, the service class will be business class and the airline will be unified airlines and will hit the continue button. And again, they want a blue skies airline and everything. So I just checked about it. So you can see here first it executed at before class and at before method and in Chrome that is in Google Chrome. So it shows that it's working fine and in the return ticket. So this is the date format that I told you. This is how it will execute and in get screenshot method before screenshot and after screenshot and in add, in add before method and in validate credentials. So all these methods work perfectly fine. Now we have to find where our screenshot is being saved of the flight booking confirmation. Okay, let's see. So you can see the details from Zurich to Frankfurt. So this is the screenshot. You can just print it from here if you want to carry this and the returning will be from Frankfurt to Zurich on 15 September and the passenger details will be Anirudh AS. Correct. So this is how you can see the screenshot from where it got captured and this is all about how to automate a flight booking application with the help of Selenium. So everything was working perfectly fine. And you can see all the details entered as according to the flow and it executed everything as according to the flow. So yes, that's how it works. And this is all about a flight booking application and how do we automate it with the help of Selenium. So I hope you found this project interesting. Next. So these are some of the case studies where many industries are using to resolve and tackle their challenges. So first case study is enterprise management system. So here the client is information technology service provider that is IT industry. Let's have a look at what are the challenges faced. So the client's custom enterprise management system was a fairly complex application with many modules and the various modules of the application were used by the client and its customer organizations for corporate communication, project management, customers and sales management, human resource management, accounting, knowledge and learning management internal social networking etc and given the huge scope of the system there were a large number of test cases to check the functionality and the workflow of the application and it was becoming difficult and costly for the client to go through the manual testing for any change in the application and that's why they preferred automation testing where the effort was very less and the performance needed to be effective and efficient so what the organization did so after analyzing the client's application that is the information technology service provider application and various automation tools 
organization selected selenium which is one of the most popular open source functional and regression testing tools and very well suited for the client's needs and they found that the selenium was the best suited tool for regression testing and they went through the application understood the functionality and workflow and prepared the automation test plan and they also designed a high level hybrid framework which made the scripts to be very easy to run even for non technical users. So imagine the test scripts was very easy even for non technical users as well. And then they developed sets of scripts to be simply run whenever there was a change in the application. So if in the middle of the time that the change comes and it can be easily automated and apart from saving the time a lot of money for testing dollars the automation scripts take much time to run and simultaneously generate eminently readable and understandable HTML reports and the customizable HTML reports display information such as test pass or fail result script execution time screenshots for each of the tests and test steps separately. So these results can be automatically emailed through the test to any number of the persons as desired. So just imagine it's such an easy task right with the help of an automation testing. Yes, and that's why selenium is the best suitable tool for automation testing and now in the recent trends automation testing beats the market. Why because of all these advantages only. So this is one of the example wherein the enterprise management system has incorporated selenium for regression and functional testing. Let's have a look at the next case study. So the case study is all about automation framework for physical fitness data. So let's have a look at the challenges faced. So this is all about the training about nutrition and physical therapy programs by a team of specialists. As a part of their program, they utilize software that integrates with the workout machines to provide the user with recommended training exercises based on previous workouts, weekly workout challenges, and member goals. So, this is all about a type of a health industry, I can say. And they are looking to implement a functional test automation framework for their application in order to perform regression testing as new bills are released. So, what are the challenges faced? So the functional test automation framework must support the Google Chrome web browser and the framework must also be implemented in such a way that script maintenance should be kept at a minimal and the employees will be able to continue creating scripts when the contract comes to an end. So what is the strategy for that? Selenium web driver was used to automate business transactions and the organization took advantage of page object design pattern to help minimize the maintenance required once an application undergoes user interface changes and private training was also conducted to provide the clients employees the means to create new test scripts. So what's the solution? The implemented automation framework is 100% open source and the components that they used was Eclipse, write the scripts, Java, Selenium, Apache and JUnit etc. And once the framework was in place, the page object design pattern was utilized in which classes were created for each page in the application. And the page object classes provided an interface for the testers to interact with each page. And test scripts was then created by calling the methods from the page object classes that performed specific transactions such as login as register user create a new user create a workout etc and all work was committed to a sub version repository for version controlling not just that a selenium web driver lacks any built in logging mechanism a custom solution was used to record the logs into an xml file using the open source java api jxl and each commands and verifications performed were logged and this provided a detailed view of where the test script has failed and the steps performed that caused the failure. Just imagine it was even able to provide a detailed view of the test scripts that failed and the steps performed that caused failure as well. So it's much interesting, right? So once the framework was in place and several test scripts created, training was provided to the client's employees on the usage of Selenium. And after that, QA testers began creating test scripts while continuous support was provided for any issues that were encountered. 
and during scripting most of the issues encountered were due to Ajax usage in the application and Selenium web driver test script was executing commands faster than Ajax was updating the UI. So Selenium web driver test script was executing commands faster than Ajax was updating the UI and the expected conditions class that is part of the Selenium package was used to wait for certain conditions to be met prior to executing the next Selenium web driver command such as visibility of the element etc. And also management has also requested that a report should be generated after executing a test suit. In order to create the report Apache Ant was used to execute the J unit test and generate a J unit report and the report displayed metrics on the number of tests that failed and passed and reports also can be drilled down to display additional information about each failure and what caused the failure to occur. And lastly a local server was set up with virtual machines of different operating systems that supported different browser versions and the virtual machines will serve to provide an environment in which full regression testing will be performed on using the selenium grid. So what are the benefits of this by sticking with an open source project there was no cost in obtaining the required components to set up the framework and additional savings were made by implementing the selenium grid. Originally the client opted to utilize a third party company to execute selenium web driver test scripts with the help of selenium grid the client is now able to run the selenium web driver test scripts without any limits or fees. So this is all about the benefits and how selenium has helped in various aspects for automation framework for physical fitness data. It made use of Apache and J unit test web driver selenium grid and many more. Most importantly it required very less human effort and there were no intervention costs and also it was performing very well and the cost was very low and that's why selenium is preferred when compared to other automation tools in the market. I hope you found these case studies interesting. Now let's take a look at the similarities between selenium and RPA. Selenium and RPA both are automation tools used to automate a task. Selenium automates web applications and RPA automates business processes. Both these tools are rule based by rule based. I mean they follow a set of procedures to automate any given task. Now let's look at the parameters that will be taken into consideration for comparing the two automation giants. First I will compare them with the type of automation that takes place then the cost of these tools then move on to the programming knowledge required to run the test cases their life cycle their platform dependency the components used to automate a task the level of automation that takes place and the use case of automation. Let's get it started by comparing the type of automation. Selenium supports programmable automation whereas RPA supports flexible automation. Programmable automation can be used to change the sequence of any operation based on the user requirements. Whereas flexible automation is a hybrid of fixed and programmable automation. Now let's talk about the cost of these tools. Selenium is an open source tool used to automate web applications whereas RPA has a set of tools like UiPath automation anywhere and blue prism among these UiPath is free for community edition and the advanced versions are licensed whereas automation anywhere gives you a free trial for a month and the advanced versions are licensed as well coming to blue prism blue prism is completely licensed guys. Talking about the programming knowledge required selenium does require the knowledge of Java to run any test case whereas RPA does not require any coding knowledge as it deals with the backend processes and the database operations. What is their life cycle? How do they differ based on this parameter? Let's take a look guys. The life cycle of selenium is a little complicated compared to that of RPA. Selenium deals with test planning, generating basic test cases, enhancing the cases, running and debugging the test, and analyze and report defects. Whereas RPA deals with just four processes that is, analysis, bot development, testing, and support and maintenance. Now, let's talk about their platform dependency. Selenium can be run on different browsers and it can test only the web applications. No mobile or desktop applications can be tested using Selenium. Whereas RPA can run on any platform be it web mobile or desktop applications. 
Now let's talk about the major component used by these tools to automate a task. Selenium uses web drivers to automate any task. This is a simplified view of Selenium web driver. Test scripts written in any programming language can be invoked by the system and is automated using Selenium web driver that can run on different browsers like Chrome, Safari, Mozilla and so on. Whereas RPA makes use of robots to complete a task. Consider the situation where you need to enter data from different sources and you have a time constraint of several minutes. How would you do that? The smart answer would be by automating it guys. RPA bots help in automating the data from different sources and saves it in the form of an Excel file where you can find the data in a sequence. Now let's talk about the level of automation that takes place. Selenium does not automate any clerical processes. It automates functional regression and performance testing. Whereas RPA automates all clerical processes like data entry calculations and so on. Now let's talk about the use case of automation or where does the automation takes place. Selenium works on the front end of the process whereas RPA works on the back end. Selenium can test only the current web page whereas RPA deals with the processes that are time consuming. This is how the data is stored onto the database. The browser details are sent via the web server and is stored in a sequence onto the database. So that's it about the parameters to compare both Selenium and RPA. Now let's talk about the most commonly asked question about Selenium and RPA. What if I try to use RPA as a testing tool? Any answers? Okay, so I'll answer this for you guys. I would say both Selenium and RPA help in delivering automation solutions. Talking about using it as a testing tool, it can be used to test web applications, but it is not recommended. Let me talk about the practical aspect that resists RPA from being a test machine. RPA is not directly applied to the product, but it is applied to the processes associated with the business environment, whereas Selenium completely depends on the product for testing a case. And about Selenium as RPA, Selenium cannot be used as RPA because it does not automate business processes. What is QTP? So before we understand what is QTP, let's dig into the history of QTP. QTP is an acronym for Quick Test Professional, which is now called Unified Functional Testing, UFT. Let's see how this happened. QTP was originally written by Mercury Interactive and they called it Quick Test Professional. And this software was later acquired by the Hewlett Packard HP in the year 2006. And later, the software was combined with the HP Service Test and it was integrated to a single software package. And this version was available till 2016 until the entire division was sold to Microfocus. So, this is all about the history of QTP. Now let's understand what exactly happens in this tool. QTP is basically designed to test various software applications and environment. QTP is mainly used for UI based test case automation, which can even automate non UI test cases as well, such as file operation, database testing and so on. You might ask which programming language should I learn to work on QTP? QTP mainly uses VB script. Most of you might know what is a VB script. VB script is basically an active scripting language which helps in modeling the visual basics. So QTP supports this programming language to run the test cases. QTP also provides functional and regression test automation. By functional testing, I mean the system is tested against the functional requirements or specifications like the technical details, data manipulation and so on. Whereas regression testing refers to the process of testing the application even after modifying the source code. QTP also helps in providing quality assurance to the software under test. So that's it about QTP guys. Now let's understand what is Selenium. I think most of you guys are very familiar with this automation testing tool, but let me give you a clear definition of this tool. So before we get to the technical definition of Selenium, let's take a look at the history of Selenium and see how Selenium came into existence. 
The name Selenium comes from a joke made by Huggins while writing an email mocking the competitor called Mercury, saying that you can cure any mercury poisoning by taking selenium supplements. Selenium in general is a chemical element. So that's when he introduced the word selenium in technical terms. So the others who received the mail took the name and started digging deep into it. So that's how the name selenium came into existence. It was originally developed as an internal tool by the man Jason Huggins in the year 2004 until he was joined by another colleague called Paul Hammond and started the operation of Selenium RC. Correspondingly, in the year 2005, Dan Fabulich and Nelson Stroll made an offer to accept the series of patches that would transform Selenium RC into what it is now known for. While all this was happening, Huggins joined Google in the year 2007 and at the same time, Simon Stroll called it Selenium Web Driver. So after all this happened in the year 2009, they decided to merge the two projects and call it as Selenium Web Driver or Selenium 2.0. So this is all about the history of Selenium. Now let's understand the purpose of this tool. Selenium is an automation tool used to test web applications. The growth of software testing increased the demand in the field of Selenium as it is an open source portable framework that helps in automating web applications. This tool is run across different browsers like Chrome, Safari, Opera, Firefox, Explorer and so on. And it also supports cross browsing, which helps in executing the process across multiple platforms simultaneously. You might ask which programming language should I learn or understand to work on Selenium. OK, so the test scripts in Selenium can be written using any programming language like Java, Python, Ruby, C Sharp and so on. But the most commonly used language is Java because of its user friendly behavior. So this is all about Selenium. Now let's understand the benefits of these tools over each other. First, let's talk about the benefits of Selenium over QTP. QTP is licensed and the cost of this tool is very high. It supports only VB script programming language and the test scripts cannot be written in any other languages like Java, Python and so on. So it can run only on the Windows environment and it does not provide support across all browsers. QTP does not support functioning across different IDEs and it works only on the QTP developed IDEs and it also allows only limited add ons to the process. QTP can also execute parallel testing but only using quality center which is again a paid product of HP. So these are all the advantages of Selenium over QTP. Now let's take a look at the advantages of QTP over Selenium. QTP can test web, mobile and desktop application whereas Selenium tests only web applications. It has its own inbuilt object repository where all the information regarding the test cases are stored. The rate of automation in QTP is fast compared to that of Selenium. QTP can handle controls within the browser like accessing the favorite bar, access bar, back and forward buttons, etc. It also provides functional user support if the user faces some issues. And the test reports are generated automatically, which does not happen in Selenium. So this is all about the benefits of these tools over each other. Now let's take a look at the ultimate face off between these tools. We'll first compare them based on their cost, that is, if the tools are licensed or free of cost or if they have any community edition, then we'll compare them based on their flexibility, check if they can be run across various platforms and then we'll move on to the programming language required to run the test scripts. And after that, we'll look into their IDE basis and check if they can work on different IDE platforms. And we'll also look into the repository functionality where we get to understand which tool is more efficient and finally, we'll compare them based on their environment on which they can work on. So let's start comparing them based on their license. Selenium, as you know, is an open source tool and the user does not have to pay for any of the versions of this tool. Whereas QTP is licensed and the user has to pay to get this software on his system. So this is about the license of these tools. Now let's talk about their flexibility. Selenium is highly flexible because the test scripts can be run across different platforms like Chrome, Firefox, Opera and so on and it can test only web applications. 
Whereas QTP is not very flexible when it comes to executing the test cases across different platforms. It mainly supports Windows and executes the tests there and it can test web, mobile and desktop applications. So this is about their flexibility. Next, it's their programming language required to run the test scripts. Test scripts in Selenium can be written using different programming languages like Java, Python, C Sharp, Ruby and so on. Whereas QTP test scripts are written using VB scripts and it cannot process the system using Java or any other simple programming language. So this is about the programming language required. Now let's talk about their IDE basis. Selenium test scripts can be integrated to run across IDEs like Eclipse, NetBeans, .NET and so on. Whereas QTP test scripts work only on the QTP developed IDE. It cannot be integrated to work on Eclipse, NetBeans or any other IDE basis. So let's move on to understand their repository now. Selenium does not have an inbuilt repository as it uses the element in the user interface to test the applications. Whereas QTP has an inbuilt object repository where the test scripts are executed. So this is about the repository. Now we'll finally compare them based on the environment support. Selenium supports all additional plugins alongside the features of it. Whereas QTP supports different environments like SAP, Oracle and so on and it does not support the additional plugins to the software. So who exactly is an automation tester or who exactly is an automation test engineer? See when an application or a software is developed, it needs to be tested to see whether it gives the desired output or not. So there are different ways through which you can test your application. A person who could manually test the application by giving inputs, checking the output and reporting it or he could even automate this process by executing a simple script. An automation tester is a person who writes the script to test the correctness of the application. So test automation involves creating and applying technologies that control or monitor the production and timely delivery of software products. Automation testing helps in reducing the time consumed to perform tedious tasks. So a duty of a test automation engineer includes designing, programming, simulating and deploying effective test automation solutions. The major objective of a test automation engineer is to automate as much of the testing as possible with a minimum set of code or script. These automation testers design the test cases by creating scripts that check the functionalities automatically. An automated testing entirely relies on the pre-scripted test which runs automatically to compare the actual result with the expected result. Therefore, this role of an automation tester plays a superior role in making the application defect free. So this was about who exactly is an automation engineer or an automation tester. Now moving on, let's understand why exactly do you need to take up automation testing as a career option? What are the chances that you'll be hired and what are the best chances that you'll be paid well? Now let's take a look at the probability of it. Test automation engineers can save you from a world full of codes. This is not just a saying guys, this is the reality. Businesses all around the globe are also increasingly embracing automated chatbots to help solve customer issues or to direct customers to the right person. And automation engineers help implement that technology. Automation is also used to streamline IT help desk ticketing service management and to deliver quality products and software faster. Also, the main agenda is to reduce the number of defects. You're going to be dealing with a lot of defects, but in the end, the end results should be no defects. So that's the role of an automation tester and ultimately the goal of an automation engineer is to reduce the load on workers and to improve the efficiency and reliability by streamlining manual processes that are redundant or inconsistent. So why exactly automation testing is required? Now talking about the current market scale in the field of automation testing, the global automation testing market size is expected to grow up to 12.6 billion US dollars in 2019 to 28.8 billion dollars by the end of 2024 
at a compound annual growth rate that is TAGR of 18% during the forecast period. So this forecast is predicted from 2019 to 2024. So within that period, it is expected to grow up to 18%. It is expected to increase up to 18%. Also, BFSI and the retail verticals are expected to witness the fastest growth during the forecast period. The geographic expansion in the emerging markets and large scale implementation of model based automation testing applications are the uncharted opportunities in the market right now. And the market growth is attributed to the need to provide seamless end user experience with reduced time to market and adoption to AI ML in quality analysis and testing. Also, intelligent automation will continue to be on the software testing radar in 2020 as well. And according to a variety of reports, it is considered to be true. Applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning have been leveraged in software test automation before and artificial intelligence is definitely making software testing very smart. Also guys, test automation is undoubtedly no longer a foreign idea in quality assurance. 44% of IT organizations expect to automate 50% or more of all testing in 2019 and it is predicted that more adoption of automation testing will continue to be on the rise this year as well. So this was about the latest market trend for automation testing. Now moving ahead, let's take a look at the salary trend guys. The average annual salary of a test automation engineer is around $90,000 in US. This is according to one of the famous job portals called Indeed. And also there are n number of job roles available in the market. Some of the few famous job roles or the job titles include software test engineer, automation test specialist, developer or tester, testing engineer, quality assurance engineer, automation tester and automation engineer. So these are a few notable job roles in the market right now which are actually booming. Also the salary acquired by these people is quite mesmerizing guys. So quality assurance tester makes up to $58,757 a year. Followed by which we have software test engineer who makes up to $100,422 a year, which is actually great. Now talking about another job role that is quality assurance analyst. So these people make up to $65,235 and automation engineer makes up to $90,336 and senior tester makes up to $81,936 and quality assurance engineer makes up to $67,532 a year. So this was about the stats given across by Indeed. So I've referred Indeed to get some inputs regarding how much does an automation tester makes. So this is exactly how much an automation tester makes in US. Okay. Also some companies ask for experience in the field of testing because some companies don't hire freshers. Some company are looking for freshers and so on, right? So these are some mismatch. So you should actually try to look into the job description more and try to get in touch with people who have a background in the field of testing so that you can get proper inputs and you can start building your career in that. Okay. And also talking about the skill set that you require to become a good automation tester. We'll take a look at the skills as well guys. So the very first skill that you should possess would be the knowledge of any programming language. When I started as a beginner, I did not know much coding actually. However, I gradually started to understand the basics of Java and it became very clear to me that without some basic understanding in programming language, there's no way for me to write a logical automation test script. So I started understanding how it works, practicality of the code, how exactly you can execute it, how to work your way around the code and having a little background in programming will not really simplify those automation scripts, but also it will help you in improvising your communication with the developer guys. I figured it out when I was working on Selenium. I think this would help you guys with your quest. Not only that, you can also take part in competitions which keep coming up every now and then like the hacker thing which keeps popping up every month. I keep getting notifications related that. So yeah, these are some testing platforms or these are some coding platforms which you can go for. All I would say is programming language is going to be your basic need for automation testing. 
be thorough with any of the programming languages guys there is Java Python you can prefer any of it so I know how exactly selenium is used and how you can make use of Java and how you can work your way around this coding part also the next would be you should know how to design the framework so you're required to have the thorough understanding as well as the coding skills in C sharp Python Java Perl SQL and HTML and CSS as well. Although what language you should be proficient depends on your organization. Be thorough with all of these programming languages guys. Now the next thing you should possess or the next skill that is required to become a good automation tester would be having the knowledge to create a test script whether you should have programming knowledge or not. In this phase, it depends completely upon the automation framework. If your organization is using Cucumber, the scripts can be written in plain English and you don't have to have any technical background. Selenium does require technical background because Java is included or any prominent programming language is included. But if you're taking up Cucumber or your company is dealing with Cucumber, you don't really have to know much of coding. Only having sufficient knowledge of Selenium WebDriver is enough guys. Also, do not forget about manual testing. Manual testing is one such field which lays a proper foundation for your automation testing. You should know how your work can be done manually so that you can implement it on a machine. Automation is a machine and a machine only does what it is told to do. So complicated tests requires a lot of preparation and planning and also has certain boundaries. The script that you write then follows the protocols and test the applications accordingly. This manual testing thing also helps the tester to think and test using an out of box approach, which is difficult to program in an automation script. Only when you know how to correct your mistakes manually, you can work on it on a machine. You should be proficient in using one of the automation testing tools. So in current agile age, the industry demands speed as well as quality. So the stakeholders and clients worldwide expect an organization to deliver a good quality bug free application in a very small time. This is why automation testing is on rise and being a skilled automation tester is a boon to you as well as your organization. So talking about the major automation testing tools, we have n number of tools in the market right now. Each dealing with different domains, but I've made a list of few important tools that any of the organization would require. Okay, so the first one would be Selenium proudly supported by almost all major browsers. Selenium has become a household name in the world of automation testing and almost all major browsers ensure that Selenium is a native section of them. And with the introduction of web driver Selenium ensured flawless execution of browser based web application automation testing. And no matter if you're a fresher or an experienced profession, you should have the knowledge or the working experience in Selenium. Another important tool is UFT or QTP. It was previously called as QTP, but now it is changed as unified functional testing. And this tool is by HP. I think most of you know HP company. So this is still the best one in the industry right now that ensures smooth execution of automated functional and regression testing of an application. So these were two tools which I actually love working on. So I actually came up with that and now talking about the next skill. You should understand the business requirement. See as long as you understand what exactly you're going to be testing. It is going to be a benefit for you as well as the industry guys. Skill automation tester must know the application inside out from both front end as well as a service layer before the testing phase begins. So they must actually know the programming language used the platform or the device requirement should know about the database where backend information is being stored. You should know about the API's and use. Also, you should know about the web services. Also, the first thing you need to do if you're going to be executing a test script, you should check if it's working manually and only then you should go for automation testing because if you're going to be finishing the work manually within a given time, there is no point in getting that thing automated because your work is done without spending much time. Automation testing is mainly focused on reducing time and human errors, right? So if the work is done manually, you don't have to go for the automation testing part. Check for it. 
and check for critical bugs as well, which are unfixed and also expected delivery date by which the testing phase is needed to be completed. You should have a proper skill to troubleshoot the automation tools. Like I mentioned, there are n number of automation testing tools in the market, but you should know how to troubleshoot them. And also last but not the least, you should have certifications, which is actually an added advantage. A certification will not only make your profile stand out from others when you're applying for a new job, but it will also improve your knowledge base and eventually help you to follow an out of the box approach while testing an application. So there are a few certifications that you should take up. There is certified associate in software testing. That is ISTQB foundation level, advanced level and certified software test engineer certifications. So what are the roles and responsibilities of a Selenium tester or an automation tester? These testers are supposed to design and write the test automation scripts and also help in investigating the problems in the software. They also help in defining the process strategies for a better testing result. They must be able to process, implement and monitor the testing that takes place. These testers should ensure that they deliver timely results and generate the code that help in easy detection of bugs and resolve them. And they also must keep up to date with changing trends and also help in developing and designing the test strategies for functional, non-functional and performance testing. So these are the basic roles and responsibilities of an automation tester. So let's take a look at the job description for this role. This will give you an overview of the tasks and the duties of an automation tester. So the automation tester should develop HLD that is high level design and also define the software architecture. He or she must ensure that the customer satisfaction is met, should be involved in test case review, monitoring and tracking of tasks, status reporting and so on. Should demonstrate successful completion of analysis, technical design and programming assignments. Should develop, deploy and maintain automation at production facilities. Develop test strategy for product, write test specification with input and output requirements, Analyze the product testability and design the test strategy should be responsible for timely execution of test equipment and also the production trail. So this is all about the jobs that are to be taken care of when you are working on Selenium. Now let's move on and find out what are the important skills that an organization looks for while hiring the software testers. So I've made a list of the skills that any company would look for. Automation testing requires the base knowledge of manual testing because without understanding what happens if it is done manually, you cannot take a risk of performing the operation using automation testing. So what are the other skills that are required to become a very prominent automation tester? I've differentiated this based on the experience level guys. So we'll first check out what are the skills that are required for a fresher. So he or she should have the basic knowledge of the test architecture solid understanding of computer languages like Java, Python, C Sharp and also very familiar with the software development. Knows how to design the test frameworks, should be well versed in creating the test scripts, has the ability to troubleshoot the equipment problems and perform complex system tests. He or she should possess creative thinking skills and also has the ability to communicate well with the other members of the development team. So these are the skills that are required in the entry level. Now let's check out the skills of a person who has any years of experience. He or she should have minimum two to five years of experience working on the software development. At least three plus years on hands on testing experience. Three plus years in building, leading and managing product testing teams. Demonstrate leadership and developing and delivering the test plans. Experience working on several projects of the product life cycle. Develop innovative strategies to improve the effectiveness of testing. Excellent written and oral communication skills. Experience in using all tricks of the trade in QA for automation and regression testing. Experience in Linux, Windows based development. Experience in SQL queries. Understands the business goals and specification tasks thoroughly and ability to work collaboratively to get results. So this is all about the skill set which the user has to develop while working on Selenium. 
Now let's move on to the discussion and understand the important points which we need to keep in mind while building a resume. A resume is your first impression in front of an interviewer. It is the first and the most crucial step towards your goal. There are basically two ways in which you can build your resume. One is chronological and the other one is functional. First we'll discuss about the chronological method. This chronological method is a traditional way of building a resume where you mention your experience in a manner it took place. So this type of resume is preferred in conservative fields guys. Now what is the functional method? This is a whole new approach where you mention your most relevant experience based on the required skills. Here your recruiter does not have to go through the entire resume to find out the required skills. This is more focused and concise way of portraying yourself in front of an interviewer. Now I'm going to discuss a few key points which help in building your resume effectively. First, your resume should be consistent, concise and clear in terms of formatting and the message that you're trying to convey is direct. Always keep your resume updated guys. Building or updating your resume is really tiresome. The more time you invest in building one resume, the chances of you getting selected is also high. As you know, the recruiters receive hundreds of resume for a single job, but your resume will be the only thing which will help in clearing the first round for you. So do work on updating your resume every now and then. For someone with less than eight years of experience should have a single page resume. If the length of the resume is more than two pages, it becomes lengthy and the interviewer becomes uninterested in reading it. So try to shorten it and try to be up to the mark and also try to make functional resume. If you have two plus years of experience where you can put all the relevant experience rather than just flooding it with everything, give priorities to those skills which are required for the particular job. Try to list out the activities and mentioning your role in that activity. This is where you showcase your interpersonal skills such as leadership, team player, etc. And also you can add a list of few awards that you have achieved to prove your potential in the co-curriculum fields too. And last but not the least, your hobbies play an important role in breaking the ice with the interviewer. This section actually shows that you are an all-rounder with various skills and hobbies. So these are all the basic rules that you need to follow while writing a resume. Now let's move on to our next topic that is the Selenium job trends. With the gradual enhancement in the field of software testing, the demand has also been increasing in the recent days. Majority of the career aspirants tend to choose software testing over other development tools. Let's see why this happens. Selenium is one of the most important testing tool which one must master to build a career in the field of testing. There are many organizations that offer jobs for the roles like test engineer, test manager, test analyst, QA engineer, software tester and whatever you name it. So the vacancies are also increasing as the pay scale for this job is very high. And this graph here shows us the latest job trends in the recent years. As you can see that there is an exponential growth in the vacancies for the testing jobs. People take up permanent type and the contract type jobs according to their lifestyle. So the contract job scales is in tall with the massive 80% increase in the job vacancies and the median salary specified according to this is around 50,000 euros, which is a lot of money guys. So this answers all our questions as to what is the latest trends in the field of software testing. So if you guys want to become a successful software tester, Here's the right time to start working for it. And the first step towards it is building your proper resume. Okay, so I'll give you an idea on how to write a resume by the end of the session. So now let's talk about the stats. Any guesses as to how much a software tester or an automation tester make in a year? Okay, we'll see about this guys. Software testing offers the most promising jobs across the globe, which sums up to a total of $83,200 a year in the United States. Well, again, that's a lot of money. Selenium is globally rated as the top priority in the test automation field and is scaling up from 29% to 36% of the number of people taking up testing as their career option. 
So as a test automation engineer, one should master Selenium to get a better salary offer. And also the national average salary for a software tester in India is about 386,914. This is the average that I'm talking about guys. You can actually think of a better picture in this case. Also the average pay of a software tester is $55,815 per year. So I think you guys have got a clearer idea on how automation testing is being in the front line since a very long time. So this is about the salary tense related to an automation tester. Now let's move on to the final part of this session where we are going to write a sample resume to acquire a job as an automation tester. So I've written a sample resume so that you can analyze how to build a strong resume of your own. So to do that, the first and the foremost thing you need to concentrate on is the format. Your resume should be in a proper format. First is your introduction. In this, give a proper and clear cut introduction about yourself. Make sure you mention one of the greatest skill that you possess, which draws the attention of the recruiter. This has to be plain and to the point. Make sure you don't make any mistakes in this introduction part. Next is your education. Your qualification specify the degree and the institution and the year of pass out. So this education details is left to the user. Moving further, you need to talk about your experience. If you are a fresher, do make sure to mention about the projects that you worked on and what was your role in building that project. If you are an experienced, do mention your role in the past company and your major projects that you've worked on. So this plays a major role in catching the eye of a recruiter. Next, you need to specify the skills that you have. First, you need to specify the skills that you are comfortable when you're asked a question about it. Do mention about the programming knowledge that you have. So this is all about your skill set and also specify the tools on which you've worked on. So this actually increases the rate of your selection and you need to be very confident when you're asked a question about any of the skills that you've mentioned. After this, you need to specify your achievements and hobbies. Try not to mention too many achievements or hobbies as it could distract your interviewer and they might miss some important ones. Mention a few which is relevant and which you are very confident about. The first question I have for you guys is what is Selenium and what are its different components? They might not ask what is Selenium because you're interviewing for the profile called automation tester, which requires Selenium as a must known skill. Okay, so the answer to this would be Selenium is one of the most popular automated testing suits. It is designed in a way to automate the functional aspects of a web application and a wide range of browsers and platforms. Due to its existence in the open source community, it has become one of the most accepted testing tools among the professionals. Do make this a note guys. Selenium is not just a single tool or a utility, rather a package of several testing tools for the same reason. That's why it is referred as a suit. Selenium is a test suit, right? So each of these tools is designed in a way to cater different requirements. So the suit package consists of Selenium IDE, that is Selenium Integrated Development Environment, Selenium RC, that is Selenium Remote Control, Selenium Web Driver, and Selenium Grid. Now let's understand them in detail. Selenium IDE is a record and a playback tool. It is distributed as a Firefox plugin, so it doesn't work on Chrome or any other browser. Selenium RC. Selenium RC is a server that allows the user to create test scripts in the desired programming language. It also allows executing the test scripts within the large spectrum of browsers. But RC is deprecated guys. Majority of the companies don't use RC. So RC was replaced by Selenium WebDriver. What is Selenium WebDriver? Selenium WebDriver is a different tool altogether which has various advantages over RC. This web driver directly communicates with the browser and uses its native compatibility to automate the task. Now, what is Selenium Grid? Selenium Grid is used to distribute the test execution on multiple platforms and environment concurrently. That means it supports cross browsing. Now let's move on to the next question. What is a Selenium Framework? It is a structure for making the code maintenance simpler and the readability look better. 
This framework involves breaking the entire code into different pieces of code which tests a particular functionality. It can also be structured in a way wherein the test cases which needs to be executed are invoked from an external application. Then what are the different types of framework available in Selenium? There are basically three types of framework available in Selenium that is data driven, keyword driven and hybrid. Now let's understand them in detail. Data driven framework in Selenium is the technique of separating the data set from the actual test case. This framework completely depends on the input test data. Now let's talk about keyword driven framework. This is a technique in which all operations and instructions to be performed are written separately from the actual test case. The similarity between this and the data driven framework is that the operations to be performed is again stored in an external file like an Excel sheet and so on. Now let's move on to our next question. What are the challenges and limitations of Selenium WebDriver? As Selenium WebDriver is widely used, the interviewer would be curious to know if you know the limitations of it too. So the challenges are it is difficult to test image based application. Selenium needs outside support for report generation activity. It is dependent on TestNG or Jenkins. It cannot perform tests on web services like SOAP or REST. Now, what are the limitations of Selenium WebDriver? It cannot test web applications. Handling pop ups is a little too difficult. It cannot test mobile applications. It supports limited reporting and it cannot actually support dynamic content. Okay. Now let's move on to our next question. What are the drawbacks of Selenium RC? Like I mentioned earlier, Selenium RC is deprecated, so you cannot use RC alone. Why is it so? It is because server connection is required before executing the test script and Selenium RC's architecture is more complicated and the API's are less object oriented. So it is slow when it is used as a JavaScript program. So that's why we don't use Selenium RC. Explain how Selenium Grid works. Selenium Grid is a part of Selenium Suite that specializes in running multiple tests across different browsers operating systems. Now let's move to the next question. Mention what are the capabilities of Selenium WebDriver or Selenium 2.0? WebDriver should be used when you require improvement support for handling multiple frames, pop ups, multiple browser windows, and alerts. It also helps in page navigation, and drag and drop feature is also available. It also supports Ajax based UI elements. Multi browser testing includes improved functionality for browser which are not well supported by Selenium 1.0. Next we have list out the different test types that are supported by Selenium. For web based application testing Selenium WebDriver can be used. So the different test types that can be supported by Selenium are functional testing and regression testing. For post release validation with continuous integration Selenium could be used with Jenkins Hudson quick build and cruise cont. Another important question which the interview would ask mention why to choose Python over Java in Selenium. So it's very obvious guys. We use Java in order to write test scripts in Selenium, but why not prefer Python? So the few points that favor Python over Java to work with Selenium is Java programs tend to run slower compared to Python programs. Java uses traditional braces to start and end blocks while Python uses indentation. Java also employs a static typing while Python is dynamically typed. Python is simple and more compact compared to Java. So Python has a lot of advantages over Java. So you can choose Python over Java. Now the next question is what is Selenese and what are the different types of Selenese available? I think most of you don't know what is Selenese. Selenese is a Selenium set of command which is used for running the test cases. There are three types of Selenese available in Selenium. They are actions, assertions, and accessors. Actions are used to perform operations and it interacts with the target element. Assertions are used as a checkpoint. Accessors are used for storing the values in a particular variable. Now, how to build an object repository in Selenium? An object repository is a common storage collection for all objects. In Selenium WebDriver, objects would typically be the locators used to uniquely identify the web elements. 
But also note that Selenium WebDriver does not offer an inbuilt object repository by default. However, the object repositories can be built using the key value pair approach wherein the key refers to the name given to the object and value refers to the properties used to uniquely identify an object within the web page. Now let's talk about the different wait statements in Selenium. Exception appears when there is a loading time when you are interacting with an element on the web page. To overcome this issue, we need to use the wait commands. There are basically two types of weights. They are implicit wait and explicit wait. Implicit wait tells the web driver to wait for a certain amount of time before it throws an exception. So the example to this would be driver.manage.timeouts.implicit wait specify the time and the unit of time. And talking about explicit weights, they are confined to a particular web element. This explicit weight is a code that you define to wait for a certain condition to occur before proceeding further into the code. Even explicit weight are of two types that is web driver weight and fluent weight. The example to this would be web driver weight, create an object of it, and then instantiate it with the new web driver weight and provide the web driver reference and the time. Now, Another important question would be why do you use Selenium IDE? What is the importance of Selenium IDE? Selenium IDE is the simplest and the easiest of all the tools within the Selenium package or suite of tools. Its record and playback feature makes it exceptionally easy to learn with minimal acquaintances to any programming language. This Selenium IDE is an ideal tool for any user. What are locators in Selenium? Locators are defined as an address that identifies a web element uniquely within the web page. It is a command that tells the Selenium IDE that it has to locate the GUI elements like text box, checkboxes, and so on. And another important question would be what are the types of locators in Selenium? To identify the web elements accurately and more precisely, we have different types of locators in Selenium. So there is a diverse range of web elements like the text box, ID, radio button, etc. So it requires an effective and accurate approach to identify these elements. We have ID locator, name, link text, partial link text, CSS selector, and XPath. The most popular way to identify the web elements is to use the ID. It is the safest and the fastest locator options and should always be the first choice even when there are multiple options. Now talking about link text, you can identify the hyperlink on a web page using link text. It can be determined with the help of an anchor tag. So in order to create a hyperlink on a web page, you can use anchor text followed by the link text. And talking about partial link text, in some situation you may need to find links by the portion of the text in the link text element. In such situations, you can make use of this partial link text to locate elements. Talking about CSS selector, it is mainly used to provide style rules for the web pages and you can identify one or more elements in the web page. All you need to do when you are locating an element using CSS selector is you can locate it using the ID or class. ID just have to be located with the help of a hash and a class can be located using a dot operator. Okay, now let's talk about XPath. It is a language to query XML documents. It is an important strategy to locate an element in Selenium. XPath is an expression along with some conditions. So here you can easily write an XPath script or a query to locate an element on the web page. Now let's move on to our next question. How to use find element and find elements in Selenium? So when we have locators, how can you find that element? Find element is used to find the first element in the current web page matching to the specified locator value. Do note that the only first matching element would be fetched. So the syntax would be web element create an object of the web element driver dot find elements by specify the locator and the location. Whereas find elements is used to find all the elements in the current web page matching to the specified locator value. Do note that all the matching elements would be fetched and stored in the list of web elements. Okay, another important question here. How to select the size of the browser window? You can perform actions like maximizing the window, get the actual size, resize the window and so on. So in order to maximize, I would use the command driver.manage.window.maximize. 
and in order to get the actual size of the window browser, I would use the command window dot get size. So it gets the actual size of the window and you can also set the size of the browser window by using this command driver dot manage dot window dot set size and you can set the size according to your specification in this field. Now in order to resize the window, I would use the command JavaScript executor link it to the driver and execute script and window resize to specifying the X and the Y axis. So this is how you select the size of the browser window. Now how to work with Excel files in Selenium. Have you ever worked with Excel files when you're testing an application in Selenium? Let's take a look. So in order to work with Excel files in Selenium, you can use JXL and Apache POI. Now what is JXL? JXL is Java Excel API. So this allows the user to read, write, create and modify the sheets in an Excel workbook at the runtime. Now talking about Apache, Apache POI is a popular API that allows the programmers to create, modify and display MS Office files using Java programs. It is an open source library developed and distributed by Apache Software Foundation. So we use these two APIs in order to work with Excel files in Selenium. What is a JavaScript executor or how do you scroll in Selenium? JavaScript executor is an interface that helps to execute the JavaScript through Selenium web driver. It has two methods namely execute script and execute async script. It is also used when Selenium web driver fails to click on any element. You can also scroll down a page using this JavaScript executor. You just have to specify the axis in which you want to scroll. It can either be X axis or Y axis. Now what is a page factory? Ever heard of this guys? So the interviewer would be interested to know if you know the implementation or the internal structure of how Selenium works. So he would ask what is POM and what are its advantages? POM is a page object model which is a design pattern in test automation in order to create an object repository for web UI based elements. The advantages of this page object model are it makes automation framework friendly, more durable and comprehensive. It keeps the test and the element locators separately. The repository is independent of any automation test. It helps in reusing the page object methods. POM is best applicable for the applications which contain multiple pages. Easier to write because it uses the business domain language, okay? So this is about the page object model. Now let's talk about page factory. OK, page factory is an inbuilt page object model pattern used to initialize web elements which are defined in page objects. Now you might want to know the difference between the page object model and the page factory because both are design patterns. OK, page object model is a class which represents the web page and holds all the functionalities. Whereas page factory is a way to initialize the web elements within the page object when the instance is created. Now let's see how to handle mouse and keyboard actions in Selenium. So in order to handle mouse and keyboard actions, we use something called actions class. So this actions class has an inbuilt ability to handle various types of keyboard and mouse events. So in Selenium web driver, these events include operations such as drag and drop, clicking on multiple elements with the help of control key and many more. Now let's understand what exactly happens in this actions class. So this actions class is the user facing API for emulating complex action events. You can directly use this class rather than using input devices like keyboard and mouse. So the syntax would be actions create an object of this actions and instantiate it with the driver. And if you want to move a particular element to another location, you can just use the object of the actions class that is action dot move to element specify the element click and perform. So we'll use the perform method here in order to execute the actions using this actions API keyboard interactions can be easily handled by the web driver. So in order to use the mouse actions, I will use the current location of the web element and then perform some kind of operations like click double click drag and drop and so on. Can Selenium handle window based pop ups? If yes, how and if no, why? Selenium is an automation testing tool which supports only web application testing. Therefore, window pop ups cannot be handled using Selenium. 
Although WebDriver offers the users a very efficient way to handle these pop ups using alert interface. So there are basically four methods that we would be using along the alert interface. So that is void dismiss void accept string get text and void send keys. Now what is void dismiss? This method clicks on the cancel button as soon as the pop up window appears. And what about void accept? This method clicks on the OK button as soon as the pop up window appears. String get text. This method returns the text displayed on the alert box. Void send keys. This method enters the specified string pattern into the alert box. OK, if in case you want to close a particular window pop up, we just spoke about the alerts. Now if you just want to cancel out the window pop up, how do you do that using Selenium? We'll be using something called a robot class. Now what is this robot class and what does it do? A robot class in Selenium is used to generate native system input events for test automation, self running demos and other application where you need control over the mouse and keyboard. WebDriver cannot handle OS pop ups. So in Java 1.3 this robot class was introduced. So in simple terms, I would say this class provides control over mouse and keyboard devices. So this is almost similar to actions class, but just that robot class has a lot of importance compared to the actions class. This robot class helps in uploading a file. It can simulate the mouse and the keyboard functions and it can handle pop ups as well. So this robot class has many methods to implement the keyboard functions. That is key press key release mouse move mouse press and mouse release. OK, so we'll talk about them in detail. Key press is a method which is called when you want to press any key. Key release is a method which is used to release a pressed key on the keyboard. Now let's talk about the mouse functions. Mouse move. This method is called when you want to move the mouse pointer in the X and Y coordinates. And talking about mouse press, this is used to press the left button of the mouse. And mouse release. This method helps in releasing the pressed button of the mouse. Now next we have how to achieve synchronization in WebDriver. Synchronization is a mechanism which involves more than one component to work in parallel with each other. It can be achieved by using two types, namely conditional and non-conditional. Unconditional. In this, we just specify the timeout value. We'll make the tool to wait until certain time and then proceed further. Now, what about conditional? It specifies a condition along with the timeout value. So the tool waits in order to check for the condition and then it comes out of it if nothing happens. So this is how you achieve synchronization in WebDriver. Now let's move on to another important question. How to take a screenshot in Selenium? Selenium has an interface by the name takes screenshot which we can use in order to get a screenshot. OK, so the syntax goes something like this. It says take screenshot link it to the driver and get screenshot as and the output type would be file. So what is this get screenshot as method? So this method will help in capturing the entire screenshot in the form of a file and makes use of the file utils class using which we can copy the screenshot from one location to another. So by using this file utils class, you can just copy the source file. So you can just copy the source file and place it in a new folder and provide a name to this folder and do note that it should end with dot PNG specifying it to be an image. OK. So this is how you take a screenshot in Selenium guys. Now let's move on and understand how to handle multiple windows in Selenium. So in order to work with multiple windows, we use a window handle. What is a window handle? A window handle is a unique identifier that holds the address of all the windows. So this is basically a pointer to a window which returns a string value. This window handle function helps in getting the handles of all the windows that are present. It is also guaranteed that each browser will have a unique window handle. So we use different methods called get window handle, get window handles, set, switch to, and action. So in order to switch from one window to another window, we use the switch to command. Let's understand them in detail. So this get dot window handle function helps in getting the window handle of the current window, whereas get dot window handles helps in getting the handles of all the windows that are opened. Set this method helps in setting the window handle which is in the form of a string. OK, and uh, talking about switch to this helps in switching between the windows action. I think you guys are clear with actions now, so you might be able to answer this. 
It helps in performing certain actions on the windows like keyboard and mouse handle function. So that's how you work with multiple windows in Selenium. You can also refer our blog or video which is put up how to handle multiple windows in Selenium. Now the next question is what are listeners in Selenium WebDriver? In Selenium WebDriver, listeners listen to the particular event defined in the Selenium script and it behaves accordingly. It allows customizing of the test engine reports or logs. There are mainly two listeners that is WebDriver listener and test ng listeners. This WebDriver listener interface allows to implement methods and classes like WebDriver event listener and even firing WebDriver. Whereas talking about test ng listeners, test ng can be made to listen to what we say with the help of listeners. So this gives us the flexibility to alter the default test ng behavior. Now, what are the different types of listeners in test ng? This is also an important question, guys. There are different types, namely I test listener, I suit listener, I reporter, I method interceptor, I invoked method listener one and two, I hookable, I exception listener, I configuration listener, I configurable, I annotation transformer one and two. One of the most important listener that we'll be using in our project is I test listener. Okay, so this is about the listeners in Selenium. Now let's move on to our next question. What are the features of test ng and list some of the functionality in test ng which makes it more efficient. Test ng is a testing framework based on J unit and N unit in order to simplify a broad range of testing needs starting from unit testing to integration testing and the functionalities which makes it an efficient testing framework are its support for annotation support for data driven testing flexible test configuration and it has the ability to re-execute the failed test cases. Now, what are assert and verify commands in Selenium? Assert command checks whether the given condition is true or false. If the condition is true, then the program control will execute the next test step. But if the condition is false, the execution would stop and no further test would be executed. And what about verify? Verify command also checks whether the given condition is true or false. Irrespective of the condition being true or false, the program execution doesn't halt. That is, if any test fails during verification, it would not stop the execution and all the test cases would be executed. So this is about assert and verify commands in Selenium. So the next question I have for you guys is how can you redirect browsing from a browser through proxy? Selenium provides proxy class in order to redirect it from a proxy using this command called string proxy and specifying the proxy address. So you can also set the proxy using capability dot set capability and the type of capability that you want to specify and proxy. Okay. The next question that I have for you guys is how can you debug the tests in Selenium IDE? So in order to debug your test cases in Selenium IDE, you need to insert a breakpoint from the location where you want to execute it and then run the test case at the given breakpoint and the execution will be paused. So in order to continue with the next step, just click on a button called debug, then run the commands at the same time and click on the run button. So this is how you debug the test cases in Selenium IDE. Now let's understand how can you handle network latency in Selenium. To handle network latency, you can use the command driver.manage.pageloadingtime for network latency. So this command basically helps in providing you the time load for the page. So this also helps in handling the network latency. Moving to the next question I have explain how you can capture server side log in Selenium server. So in order to capture the server side log in Selenium web driver, you can go to the command prompt and just type Java hyphen jar dot jar and hyphen log Selenium dot log. So this command helps in capturing the server side log in Selenium server. Next we have what are regular expressions and how can you use regular expressions in Selenium? I think most of you didn't know that Selenium also uses regular expressions. So regular expression is a special text string used for describing a search pattern. In Selenium IDE regular expression can be used with the keyword regex which means it is a regular expression. So this regex is used as a prefix to the value and the patterns which needs to be included for the expected values. So this is about the regular expressions in uh, Selenium. Does Selenium support database testing? And if so, which API is required? 
Selenium does not support database testing. Still, it can be partially done using the Java database connectivity. So in order to perform database testing in Selenium WebDriver, you need Java database connectivity JDBC API. This allows you to execute SQL statements as well. So this is about database testing in Selenium WebDriver. Now another important question. Why do you need session handling while working with Selenium? While working with Selenium, you need session handling. This is because during the test execution, Selenium has to interact with browser all the time in order to execute the given commands. During execution, it is also possible that before the execution is completed, someone else tries to execute another script in the same machine and in the same type of browser. So in order to avoid such situations, there is a need for session handling in Selenium. Now let's talk about exceptions in Selenium. What is an exception? An exception is an event which occurs during the execution of the program, which is basically an issue which makes the test case stop in the course of the execution. Now, what are the types of exceptions that you've worked on in Selenium WebDriver? This is one of the important questions too, guys. So there are basically five exceptions in Selenium WebDrivers. They are WebDriver exceptions, no alert present exception, no such window exception, no such element exception, and timeout exceptions. Okay. So these are the basic exceptions that will be thrown during the execution of the program. In the course of time, you might come up with another different exception, but these are the major exceptions that Selenium throws. Now coming to the next question we have how can you prepare a customized HTML report using test ng in hybrid framework? I think most of you might not know how to customize the HTML report using test ng. So there are three ways to achieve this. You can either use JUnit with the help of an ant, test ng using an inbuilt default file to get the HTML report. Also, you can use the XST reports from the ant, Selenium, and test ng combinations. You can also use your own customized reports using XSL jar files and you can also convert the XML content to an HTML file. Next we have explain how you can switch between frames to switch between frames in WebDriver. We use the method called driver dot switch to dot frame. So this method takes one of the possible arguments that is a number which selects a number by its index a name or ID. This selects the frame by its name or ID and a previously found web element using the location of the previously located web element in order to select a frame. Another question that you might be asked would be what are the difference between Selenium and QTP? One of the major question that any interviewer would want to know why go for Selenium? Why not QTP? So the major features that I'll be comparing them based on would be the browser compatibility, the distribution, Application under test object repository the language that they support and the vendor support now Let's compare them based on the browser compatibility Selenium supports almost all popular browsers like Firefox Chrome Safari Opera and so on Whereas QTP supports Internet Explorer Firefox and Chrome it only supports Windows based operating system Talking about the distribution Selenium is distributed as an open source and freely available tool and QTP is distributed as a licensed tool and is commercialized. And the application to be tested are Selenium supports testing only web based applications, whereas QTP supports testing of both web based as well as Windows based application. Talking about their object repository, Selenium's object repository need to be created as a separate entity, whereas QTP automatically creates and maintains the object repository. The language support. Selenium supports multiple programming languages like Java, C Sharp, Ruby, Python, Perl, and so on. Whereas QTP supports only VB script. Talking about the vendor support or the community support, as Selenium is an open source tool, user would not get the vendor support in troubleshooting the issues. Whereas in QTP, users can easily get the vendor support in any case of the issue. So these are the major differences between QTP and Selenium. Moving to the next question, we have what is the difference between set speed and sleep method? Both will delay the speed of the execution, guys. So the thread.sleep command in Java would help to stop or pause the execution for a specific period of time. It takes only a single argument in the integer format, and set speed will pause the execution for a specific amount of time for every Selenium command. So this will delay the execution for a specific amount of time. So this will be in milliseconds guys whereas thread.sleep will be in nanoseconds. 
next i have how can you submit a form using selenium you can use the method submit on the element in order to submit a form that is element dot submit alternatively you can use the click method on the element which helps in form submission another most important question is what are the types of web driver apis available in selenium we have a firefox driver geeko driver internet explorer driver chrome driver html unit driver opera driver safari driver android iphone and event firing web driver among these which web driver implementation claims to be the fastest so the fastest implementation of web driver is the html unit driver this is because the HTML unit driver does not execute the test in the browser. So the next question that I have for you is can I navigate back and forth in a browser in Selenium web driver? We can use navigate interface in order to navigate back and forth in a browser. It has methods to move back and forward as well as to refresh the page. The commands are driver.navigate.forward which helps in navigating to the next web page with reference to the browser history. Next we have driver.navigate.back which takes back the previous web page with reference to the browser's history. We have navigate.refresh which helps in refreshing the current web page there by reloading all the web elements. Next we have navigate2 and specify the URL which helps in launching the new web browser window and navigates to the specified URL. Now why do you prefer Selenium automation tool? So this is a must question guys. So why do you need to prefer Selenium automation tool? It is free and open source. It has a vast user base and helping communities cross browser compatibility platform compatibility and multiple programming languages can be used such as Java Perl Python PHP C sharp and so on. So we've discussed the top 50 Selenium interview questions which are most frequently asked. So that's it from my end guys. If you want to learn more about Selenium web driver, don't forget to take a look at Edureka Selenium playlist. Thank you for watching this video. Happy learning. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.